Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the technical sessions of the, the Geo Heritage Conference 2022. This conference formally started on Sunday, and I know some of you have joined us for the opening session at the Walter Sisulu National Botanical Gardens. I must admit it was really great to be out of town for a physical event again. Even if the rain did wash out the actual walk, and caused a little bit of chaos with internet access. For those of you who missed it, we are making arrangements to have the walk videoed when the sun is shining, and then Richard Fillion will do a voiceover, and so it will all be available on YouTube in due time. I hope that many of you also would have taken the opportunity to visit one of the local museums or join in one of the organized site visits yesterday. The local organizers took the time and effort to put these together. And we know that those who went on these trips really enjoyed both the outing and the networking. Today, tomorrow and Thursday are dedicated to technical presentations, the strategy session, and also the results of the GeoHeritage photo competition. I'm really pleased at the amount of interest this conference has generated from all corners of the GeoHeritage universe. It started off as a three half day conference and rapidly grew into three full days with some 26 presentations scheduled. Today, the first day of our technical presentations, we start off with a keynote address by Professor Jasper Knight from Wits University. And this will set the scene and provide a background to many of the issues that are going to be discussed at this conference. We then move on to a number of presentations that provide various overviews of different strategies and methodologies. We're also going to look at some of the exciting advances being made by various organizations that operate in the geoheritage space. The day is then finished off by the presentation of the, the winners of the phot photography competition. Tomorrow, again, we start off with a keynote address by Professor Steve Prevec from Rhodes University on the importance of geosites. The rest of the day is dedicated to some of the details of individual projects as diverse as education, hiking trails, extinct volcanoes, and world heritage sites to mention but a few. Tomorrow concludes with a strategy session, strategy session moderated by Dr. Craig Smith, who talks to a number of guests about some of the significant issues facing the South African geoheritage community. And we'll also look at various potential future pathways. Thursday is dedicated to the good folks of the Overberg Geoscientist Group with a morning of presentations and a field visit in the afternoon for those who are fortunate enough to be down in the Overberg region. And the session is then closed off with some concluding remarks by Dr. Chris Hatton, who is the chair of the GSSA Geoheritage Division. Okay, now I realize that there are many more formal or specialized definitions of geoheritage out there and this will no doubt come out in many of the discussions today. But in its simplest form, we are looking at a term which is applied to sites or areas of geological features with significant scientific, educational, cultural, and or aesthetic values. And that definition certainly describes the presentations which are scheduled over this week. When I look through the, the list of presenters and delegates, I note that the interest in geoheritage is very far ranging. We've got numerous different stakeholders. And I note varying fields of interest from the generation of data all the way through to how to present it to the end user, which is typically the, the public or the tourist. And generally, it's all with the goal of engendering interest in the geosciences and or enhancing the tourist experience. The great diversity of stakeholders is important. 
in that it leads to a wide variety of inputs, as well as easier dissemination to all parts of the country and catering for different focus groups and pursuits. These widely disparate interests can also at times result in different agendas and objectives, which is good because we shouldn't only expect one outcome or think that we would follow only one idea or program. We've got so many routes to get to similar goals. There is the capacity for a multiplicity of activities. And each one of these can be complete, complete in its own right, but potentially drawing inspiration from other organizations. There are numerous examples of geoheritage projects happening elsewhere in Africa, as well as in the rest of the world. And we can certainly benefit from watching and learning from them, but we don't need to copy them exactly. In fact, we can't. The challenges are often very different from continent to continent and also between countries. As far as I'm aware, this is the first such multidisciplinary geoheritage conference to have been held here in South Africa. And I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge all of those who have helped to make this happen. First, thank you all to the, the speakers for your time and your expertise in introducing us to different aspects of geoheritage. Second, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for the months of input and efforts behind the scenes, and especially to the, the ladies in the office, both Lali and Marlies, for the administrative backup. Third, the organizers and leaders of the various site visits that we've already had and that are still due to happen. These field trips would never have happened if not for your enthusiasm and efforts. And finally, a very special thank you to all of you delegates for taking the time to join us for this week. It's weird enough for a speaker to spend 20 minutes talking to their computer, but knowing that there are real live people out there who are listening with rapt attention makes it all worthwhile. And no movie is really finished until the credits roll. And so with this slide, I'd like to gratefully acknowledge our sponsors for without them, everything would have been that much more difficult. So once again, welcome to the Geological Society of South Africa Geoheritage Conference 2022. Okay, so now we can move seamlessly into our program for today. And first up is our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Jasper Knight from the University of the Witwatersrand from the School of Geography, Archaeology and Environmental Studies. Jasper, if you'd like to start sharing your screen. Okay, great, lovely. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for that, uh, Tanya. And uh, hello and good morning uh, to everyone. Uh, so what I'm going to do uh, here is, I guess, start off from the, the sort of broad scale view and provide a context uh, for what we will be uh, considering uh, in this um, particular uh, conference. So uh, what I'm going to do here is to look at the landscape context uh, for issues related to geoheritage and geoconservation uh, with a particular, obviously, a geographic focus on Southern Africa. And the reason for this is that geoheritage and geoconservation uh, does not take place in isolation. It refers specifically to what we do as managers to conserve or manage a particular geographical location. And that location is, of course, set in a landscape context. So therefore, understanding the landscape context will enable us to have a better understanding of the um, characteristics and development and evolution of the sites that we are uh, conserving or valuing in terms of its geoheritage and geoconservation. So um, the reason for this, um, as Tanya mentioned, is that uh, geoheritage covers a wide variety of different things. Um, so we can consider, if you like, the, the fundamental geologic um, uh, properties of a particular site related to, for example, the rock type or the structures that are present within particular strata. We might be concerned with the content of minerals or fossils that are present within particular outcropping strata. 
And often these things are the sort of primary reasons why we might value things for its uh, geoheritage um, and uh, geodiversity. But in addition, geoheritage also corresponds to the physical nature of the landscape itself. So things such as its topography, its geomorphology, and land surface properties and processes. So here, therefore, geoheritage doesn't just refer to the inherent, uh, if you like, physical properties of the rocks themselves. It also refers to the ways in which these rocks and geological structures have an influence upon the nature um, of the land surface. So this um, provides a link, if you like, between geology and geomorphology, both of which are part of geoheritage. So geoheritage isn't just related to geology, it also relates to geomorphology and therefore the land surface. So what this means, therefore, is that it's important to consider the landscape setting of geology itself because uh, geology does not exist in isolation. So this um, refers, therefore, to, if you like, the, the um, paleo, the old content or context of original geological strata and rock types that um, give rise to their expression in the land surface in a landscape setting today. So this includes uh, physical processes that have influenced the um, post-depositional development um, of particular rock types or rock strata by processes of weathering and erosion that give rise to the development of the land surface. And these in turn then give rise to the formation and characteristic, characteristics of soils, uh, which in turn influence ecosystems and biodiversity. These things also give rise to spatial and temporal variations in the availability of different resources such as sediment, soils, and water. So these things are, of course, related to these um, physical weathering and erosion processes that uh, influence the rocks, but also in turn give rise to the distinctive characteristics of the land surface that are found in specific locations. Because it is these characteristics that are found in particular locations of the land surface that demonstrates the influence of geological setting and geological and geomorphic processes on human activity. So what we can see here is that there is a relationship between geology leading to geomorphology, leading to the development of landscapes, leading to the distinctive spatial and temporal patterns of human activity in the landscape. So here from, if you like, nose to tail, we have the relationship between geology and human activity. And conserving a part of the land surface is, of course, done by people. It's done by us. It's done in a particular social, economic, political and cultural context, which is, of course, related to human activity. So here we cannot, and indeed we should not, um, distinguish between human activity and geology. These things are seamless. They are related to each other within the context of geoheritage and geoconservation. So therefore, it's really important to, to identify and recognize the links between these two different things. So here, therefore, in summary, landscapes provide the interpretive context for understanding geological history and geological evolution, which in turn give rise to how we identify and value geoheritage and geoconservation. So uh, what this talk this morning is going to do is really I'm going to talk about four uh, separate things. First of all, I'm going to talk about the significance of landscapes as an element of geoheritage and therefore explore in a bit more detail some of these relationships between geology, geomorphology and landscape development. Then I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about uh, landscape development and evolution processes in Southern Africa, and then how these things lead to the context for considering geoconservation and landscape management. And then finally today, I'm going to identify some future issues and discussion points um, as, if you like, uh, discussion points going forward. So starting off here, we're um, going to consider, if you like, some important landscape properties. And this is a slide that I, I give my first years. 
So first year geography. So this is very basic stuff, but it illustrates the relationship between physical and human elements that exist within any landscape anywhere in the world. So here we can consider landscape properties as um, um, developing, if you like, in a hierarchical way from bottom to top, as shown in this uh, illustrative uh, triangle in this slide. So underlying all landscapes anywhere in the world, we have aspects of their geologic background and structure. So this includes rock type, rock structure, and uh, processes uh, associated with uh, long-term um, variations in uh, geology and tectonics. So this, if you like, provides the, the bones of any landscape anywhere in the world. If you like, superimposed upon this, we have the influence of geomorphological processes of weathering and erosion. And these take place upon um, and are influenced by the nature of the underlying geology, including rock type and rock structure. So it is through the development of geomorphological processes where we have, of course, the development of land surface geomorphology. So this includes things such as hills, valleys, rivers, soils, and so on. So here, geomorphological landscape, landscape elements really reflect if you like, the flesh upon the bones of the landscape. And then finally, we have aspects of the human environment. And this corresponds to how human activity over long time periods has responded to the nature of the underlying land surface through the development of, for example, distinctive spatial patterns of settlements, roads, agriculture, and so on. So here, the human um, aspect of the, la of the landscape really, in a sense, reflects the skin on the flesh of the bones of the landscape. So here in this kind of hierarchical triangle from bottom to top here, the age and scale of these different landscape elements decrease as we go upwards. So geological processes and patterns take place over regional scales, over very long time scales, 10 to the nine year time scales whereas geomorphological processes tend to be more localised and tend to take place over shorter time periods. And human activity tends to take place over even shorter time periods and over even smaller spatial scales. So here, if we can consider landscape properties and uh, processes in this kind of hierarchical relationship, this can derive a better understanding of the uh, links between geology, geomorphology and aspects of human activity in the landscape. So these aspects of um, the links between geology, geomorphology and human activity are important not only for the, if you like, the physical characteristics of the land surface, in other words, where certain things are located over space, but it also corresponds to the development of um, uh, if you like, non-physical characteristics of the landscape related to things such as uh, human culture. So here uh, within this uh, triangle diagram, we can see there is a relationship between uh, geology um, in the bottom uh, right-hand corner and how as a result of weathering and erosion processes, we get the development of distinctive patterns of topography and soils, which in turn influence distinctive patterns of drainage, agriculture and uh, ecosystems. And these things influence distinctive patterns of settlements and human activity. So over time, therefore, we get the uh, transformation of the physical landscape according to um, the ways in which human activity um, change that landscape through development of certain settlement patterns, the transformation of the land surface through uh, ecosystem development and agriculture, and in turn, the development of distinctive spatial and temporal patterns of human cultures that are found in different parts of the world. And these, um, if you like, non-material aspects of landscape properties are actually extremely important because they demonstrate not only the ways in which people interact with the physical environment, but they also demonstrate how human societies and human cultures value the physical landscape. 
And this is very important when it comes to um, not aspects of geological diversity, but it comes uh, to be important when, it, um, when we consider how and why we conserve the landscape. So we might be conserving the landscape for its geological heritage, but uh, that geology might also have influenced other subsequent ways in which um, physical processes or human societies value and uh, make sense of that landscape. So here, cultural landscapes are incredibly important because they are founded and are dependent upon the physical landscape itself, which is where geology comes in. So this idea of cultural landscapes is actually incredibly important and needs to be considered when we are considering geological heritage and geodiversity. And the reason for this is that landscapes not only contain physical landforms, often in many parts of the world and in many different human societies and cultures, these landforms are not just landforms themselves that are, have a certain shape or size or property. These landforms contain uh, or represent symbolic physical elements in the landscape. So, for example, trees or rock outcrops or cliffs or caves or rivers or waterfalls or springs and so on are physical elements of the landscape, but which may have symbolic resonance with respect to human cultures. So uh, here they may represent uh, locations in the landscape where um, uh, human societies or cultures or people in a local area go to for particular reasons related to um, spiritual worship, related to um, the ways in which they make links between uh, their beliefs and uh, the afterlife or their ancestors or gods. It's a, it, they, these landforms are commonly related or commonly linked to conduits or portals to another world. They represent um, locations of um, worship or mythology, and they um, represent often places that are related to creation myths. So here, these physical elements within the landscape are not just landforms. They are sacred objects or markers or signposts that have um, spiritual or cultural resonance or symbolism. So therefore, cultural landscapes, in other words, the relationship of the physical landscape to human culture and belief in different parts of the world, not just in Africa, are not just physical landscapes, they're also spiritual landscapes. So these elements of the physical landscape demonstrate relationships to gods or ancestors. They may be localities for worship or remembrance or memory. So what this demonstrates, therefore, is that the physical landscape and therefore the geoheritage of the physical landscape is also linked to human culture and human identity and value. So uh, broadly speaking, this corresponds to an important aspect of uh, human geography and in anthropology in many parts of the world that are called cultural landscapes. And this idea of cultural landscapes is actually incredibly important, especially in parts of the world where there are indigenous communities that have developed close relationships to the physical landscape and physical resources in the landscape, such as water or ecosystems, that demonstrate how these human societies have developed in the landscape over long periods of time. So cultural landscapes are physical landscapes where human activities have shaped their properties. So these landscapes are important because they retain evidence for human cultures and occupation in the landscape. So these human cultures may have material expression, in other words, for example, through an archaeological site, uh, through the development of certain physical structures or imprints, of human activity or human culture upon the landscape, or cultural landscapes may also correspond to non-material expressions of human culture. So things such as um, mythology or um, art or music or oral histories. So these are non-material expressions of human culture that are commonly not only founded in a geographical landscape, which are often derived from 
the properties of that geographical landscape. So what this means, therefore, is that different landscapes in different parts of the world may have meaning and significance for different groups of people that are located in those different parts of the world. So this demonstrates, therefore, a close relationship between the physicality of the landscape and aspects of our human culture. And the reason for this is that often, especially related to some of these symbolic physical elements that I mentioned in the previous slide, these landscapes or landscape elements may have specific association with particular memories or particular events in uh, the culture of that community that is related to the collective past or to the development of that particular community. So what this means, therefore, is that as the physical landscape changes and as human society changes, this means that cultural landscapes may evolve over time as different values or different events are imprinted upon it. So, of course, as geologists, we know that nothing changes. Everything changes on the land surface. So what this means, therefore, is that if we have changes to the physical land surface and changes to human society, then different ideas or different values ascribed to that physical landscape may also change over time. And this is the idea behind the development of a landscape palimpsest. In other words, the ways in which different cultural ideas or values or events are imprinted over one another over time in a particular geographical location. So the idea of a landscape palimpsest is actually very important because it, it describes the ways in which not only um, we have different um, uh, human values and cultural values changing over time, it also corresponds to the ways in which uh, landscapes themselves change over time and space as a result of weathering and erosion processes transforming the physical nature of that land surface. So now I'm going to focus in more detail on the nature of these processes. So here we're going to look at landscape physical processes with a particular reference to Southern Africa. And I'm going to do this in three stages. First of all, mentioning very briefly, because of course I'm kind of uh, talking to the converted here, um, mentioning aspects of tectonics and geological evolution in southern Africa. Then I'm going to mention uh, a period genesis and development of the African uh, surfaces and how this is an expression of a landscape palimpsest. And then I'm just going to mention geomorphic processes and landforms. So we'll start off with, of course, a tectonic and geological setting. So uh, we're all sort of familiar with this idea of uh, the African plate and the development and uh, migration and uh, changes in the characteristics of the African plate over time as a consequence of not only plate uh, migration uh, to different climate zones, which affects the nature of uh, climate and environment on the land surface, but also the ways in which uh, the margins of the African plate interacts with adjacent plates, through accretion, through the development of peripheral mountain belts, and uh, through the development um, and uh, then migration of things such as mantle swells and plumes, which reflect uh, plate migration. And the development of these mantle uh, swells or plumes are actually uh, considered to be uh, quite important in influencing the nature of processes taking place on the land surface. So, um, Mantle swells that um, have been identified um, by uh, Burke and Gunnell in, of course, their uh, GSA memoir are shown in the dark um, uh, grey areas here. And these are important with respect to interpreting the land surface, because if we have uplift of the land surface, then here um, we can have enhancement of land surface weathering and erosion processes generating sediment. Uh, that's then um, uh, moved down slope into um, epiriogenic basins that separate these locations of uh, land surface uplift. So here we can have tectonic triggers, if you like, that uh, generate land surface responses. And typically how that land surface response can be modelled is uh, illustrated here, whereby if we have uplift of the land surface generating a sloping land surface, then this tilted land surface increases 
um, weathering and erosion processes and therefore increases downslope sediment yield. What this means, therefore, is that um, pulsing uh, development or episodic phases of um, epiriogenic uplift related to um, um, mantle swells and plumes and plate migration can give rise to episodic phases of downslope sediment fluxes. In other words, periods of geomorphic change. So geomorphic change and development of the land surface is not a long and continuous process that is constant over time. It varies over time and it varies over space. And we see evidence of this, if you like, post variability of the land surface uh, systems and sediment systems being developed as a consequence of variations in forcing by both climate and by tectonic processes. So um, here on the left hand side, uh, we have various uh, forcing factors, regional forcing factors over um, the later part of the Cenozoic in southern Africa. And then in the right hand part of the slide, we have uh, various indices of land surface responses through um, sediment systems and sediment transport to, um, to marginal basins. So here we have a demonstration of forcing response systems. So what we are concerned with here is the response of the land surface to climatic and tectonic forcing. So we see evidence of the land surface responses when we consider processes and uh, the outcomes of a periogenesis of the land surface in Southern Africa and the development of the so-called African surfaces. So uh, what we can see here is that uh, where we have uplift and forcing responses, we can have sediment systems being reinvigorated. So here out, uh, outside the margins of these mantle swells, we have um, alluvial fans, we have rejuvenated fluvial systems, uh, we have a large scale sediment uh, transport systems, transporting sediments to marginal locations, such as um, around the edges of the continents. So here we have a forcing response relationship demonstrated on a regional scale across Africa. In Southern Africa, of course, this is uh, demonstrated through the development of these so-called African surfaces, which were originally identified by Dutoy almost 100 years ago. So what uh, he identified are basically three broad phases of um, epiriogenic uplift followed by long, slow land surface uh, denudation. So three African surfaces uh, are recognized here as shown in the different uh, shaded zones. So first of all, the African surface, the oldest, uh, which is believed to be late Cretaceous in age, and therefore uh, reflecting um, African plate uh, processes and the breakup of uh, Pangaea and so on. This was then followed um, in uh, the, the Miocene by the post-African surface one, and then later in the uh, Miocene and into the Pliocene by post-African surface two. So these African surfaces are identified or have been identified, broadly speaking, according to, first of all, their radiometric age. And this is where cosmogenic dating comes in useful, but also their geomorphic expression in the land surface through the correlation of accordant land surfaces. In other words, land surfaces of the same elevation. However, these, um, so these three so-called African surfaces are not clearly distinguished from each other, either according to their age or according to their elevation. So there is overlap in all of these things. Um, and the reason for this is that, um, first of all, we don't have distinct, three distinct phases of development of uh, these so-called African surfaces. And secondly, these exposed land surfaces are also affected by different phases and different rates of weathering and erosion, which contributes to their denudation over time. So this gives rise to a landscape palimpsest. In other words, where things that are very old are preserved in today's landscape. So today's landscape does not just contain elements that are of zero age. In other words, things that reflect the processes that are taking place in the landscape today. So here, any one landscape anywhere in the world contains elements that are old and contains elements that are young. So this therefore corresponds to the uh, nature 
of landscape evolution. So this arises as a result of weathering and erosion processes that affect the development of any land surface anywhere in the world. In other words, cycles of a periogenic uplift followed by denudation responses on the land surface. So in Southern Africa, this is demonstrated through um, a periogenic uplift of those relatively flat African surfaces, followed by progressive dissection and a downwearing of those surfaces, not only to develop a relatively flat penny plane, but also uh, has been used uh, traditionally by Lester King and others to describe the development of uh, upstanding areas of the land surface that have relatively steep sides and a relatively flat top that correspond to the, to the development of Inselbergs and Bourne hearts that are found throughout Southern Africa and in other cratonic areas of the world, such as in Australia, for example. So uh, typically we find uh, landforms such as this that demonstrate um, the presence of um, uplift and then denudation of the land surface. So here we have Inselbergs and Bourne hearts that, uh, and these examples are from Namibia, that are found uh, throughout uh, Southern Africa. And here, therefore, we can um, propose a landscape evolution model that describes how these landforms develop as a result of long-term uh, weathering and erosion, assuming these um, underlying bedrock bodies um, to become these, these upstanding uh, bedrock features in the landscape. So the interesting thing here is not only we have uh, the stripping away of weathered material from the land surface, exhuming these bedrock bodies, but also many different studies from across Southern Africa demonstrate that um, no matter where we are in Southern Africa, these Inselbergs and Bourne hearts have a fairly uniform long-term denudation rate of between three and five meters per million years, as derived from cosmogenic dating studies. So uh, here we see evidence and quantification of the rates of long-term landscape evolution that give rise to changes in the geomorphology of today's landscape. So landscape evolution, therefore, reflects long-term uh, processes of weathering and erosion that are influenced by tectonic processes uh, that we have previously described, also influenced by long-term uh, climate uh, changes. So um, throughout the Cenozoic, so the post-Cretaceous era, and uh, the influence of these weathering and erosion processes um, by underlying geologic control by rock type and by rock structure. So this influences, for example, the relative interplay between um, thermal and chemical weathering, both of which are very important in Southern Africa, and the rate at which sediments are stripped away from the land surface and removed into river systems. So here we have a relationship between uh, weathering and erosion and the development of the land surface and geomorphological processes related to sediment systems. So as a sedimentary geologist, I'm concerned with the workings of sedimentary systems on a regional scale. So here, land surface evolution in Southern Africa is particularly important because it describes this interplay between geologic processes, geomorphic processes and climate. So these um, elements uh, shown in these bullet points here have implications for land surface evolution through sediment supply, the development and dynamics of sediment systems, and the development of distinctive landforms that are present within these individual landscapes at a catchment scale. And the reason for this is that, of course, Southern Africa was not glaciated during the Quaternary, so this means that it has the potential to retain in the land surface elements that are very, very old elements that would otherwise, in other parts of the world, be eroded away by quaternary glaciers. So here we have a unique geomorphic setting that allows the development of the land surface over um, a million, of year, million year time scales in um, a way that is not well demonstrated in many other parts of the world. So here is an example 
of the importance of, if you like, non-glaciation. So um, here we have a two uh, schematic block diagrams of uh, a mountain sediment system evolution in a glaciated landscape at the top and in a non-glaciated landscape characterizing mountains in southern Africa in the bottom. So in the top, where we have a glaciated um, eroded land surface, here we have um, a better interconnection between sediment sources and sediment sinks because sediment has been moved around and sediment has been generated by glacial processes and by very strong uh, glacially controlled um, uh, erosion. So in the top diagram here in a glaciated landscape, we have a, a very clear source to sink sediment system working out. And this is what we see in almost all glaciated mountain landscapes anywhere in the world. In the bottom, however, in Southern Africa and in other non-glaciated landscapes in different parts of the world, we see, if you like, a disconnected sediment system. So here, we don't have glacial erosion transporting sediment from one place to another, we have long, slow rates of weathering and erosion and slope, um, slope sediment transport. So what this means, therefore, is that we have a disconnected sediment system where sediment that is being generated or released at the top of the slope is not making its way down to the bottom of the slope. So here we have, if you like, arrested landforms, slope landforms that are fossilized in the middle of that slope because they don't get to the bottom. So what this means is that in non-glaciated uh, landscape settings, we have sediment systems that are broken up, sediment systems that are essentially paleo systems. We have rivers that are underfit. We have fossilized megafans that are buried beneath colluvial sediments. So here we have evidence for past landscape processes that allow a window into past um, tectonic and climatic forcings that have given rise to past sediment dynamic systems. So this demonstrates the ways in which a non-glaciated landscape allows us this window into the past that is not available in glaciated landscapes where everything is wiped clean by glaciers. So this means, therefore, in Southern Africa in particular, we have the potential to not only look deeper into the past, but also for these much older landforms to be retained in the landscape. And this is the basis of this idea of a landscape palimpsest. So here we're now going to uh, focus in a little bit more detail on the geomorphic processes and landforms affecting the Southern African landscape. Because we have these uh, non-glaciated landscapes and we have these relict um, sediment systems, this means that across southern Africa, as a Tim Partridge uh, did here um, a few years ago, we can identify distinctive geomorphic regions. And these regions are defined according to their, not only their geomorphology, but also their topography, geology, climate, soils and ecosystems. So here, geomorphic regions are able to be relatively usefully identified in non-glaciated landscapes, because it is these landscapes that have developed over long time periods as a result of climate and tectonics in combination, and that have given rise to the distinctive landscapes found in different geographic locations. So within these different geomorphic regions, we have different depositional environments defined according to their climate and their um, tectonic or geologic settings. So here we have, of course, you know, broad things such as mountains, slopes, deserts, rivers, coasts, and so on. So within these distinctive geomorphological or geomorphic regions, we have different geomorphic process domains. In other words, in different areas, we have different processes and different landforms. And of course, the reason for this is that these different processes and landforms are geologically and climatically controlled. They take place at a catchment scale, in other words, controlled by topography. And uh, they take place, therefore, and represent long term landscape development in these specific locations. 
They also take place and represent processes and landforms that develop over different spatial and temporal scales. In other words, the longevity of different landforms that are able to be retained in any one landscape. They also have influence on sediment supply and the dynamics of sediment systems within these individual catchments. And this is done through not only weathering and erosion processes that are distinctive in these different depositional environments, but also uh, but which are influenced over longer time periods and larger spatial scales by climate and geology. In other words, are linked to Cenozoic um, and quaternary climates, or quaternary climate cycles over the Cenozoic, I should say. So what this means, therefore, is that within non-glaciated landscapes in particular, we can identify landscape palimpsests. So here we should identify the fact that in particular in southern Africa, landscape geomorphology is essentially a palimpsest. So here we have elements that are old retained in today's landscape. And the evidence for this comes from, first of all, the identification of these so-called African surfaces, the presence of relict landforms that can be identified and dated in particular by cosmogenic techniques, and indeed um, the identification and dating of open air archeological sites that demonstrate human use in that landscape over very long time periods. So hundreds of thousands of year time periods. So here, if we have evidence for old things being retained in the landscape, this means therefore that we have the potential for development of these cultural relationships between long-term patterns of human development and cultural development and long-term patterns of human, of, I'm sorry, of physical landscape development that go hand in hand with each other over long time periods. So if we have a long, um, an old landscape, we have therefore the potential for the record between uh, physical landscapes and cultural landscapes to exist and to be retained in that landscape in a, in a way that it is not retained in many other landscapes in other parts of the world. So now let's consider why these things are actually important. So let's now consider their application for geoconservation and landscape management. So uh, when we consider geoconservation, um, let's uh, consider what exactly it is that we are conserving. So, of course, as geologists, we might be con concerned with conserving a particular rock type or rock structure or a particular uh, feature that is present within that rock. However, that rock and, and those strata are not in isolation in the landscape. They form part of the landscape and they have influenced the long term development of the landscape um, within its uh, landscape uh, setting. So uh, when we are conserving the landscape, we are um, conserving the evidence of past events or processes, because we might be concerned with conserving a fossil locality, and those fossils are, of course, you know, millions of years old. But the thing that we are conserving might be millions of years old, but the thing that we are conserving it uh, within is the landscape that may be much younger. So when we are conserving an element of geology, we are not just conserving evidence for past events, we need to be aware of events that have subsequently shaped the nature of that locality. So a geoconservation as a management process protects not just a geological site, but also its context and its present day geoservices. So we need to be aware of this wider context when we are both identifying sites, when we are valuing sites, when we are inscribing or protecting sites, and when we are coming up with a management plan or a plan for public uh, communication about that site. So it's all very well saying, OK, in this site, we have these uh, fossils and these are X million year years old and these are these particular fauna. You know, that's all fine. But so what? How does that relate to the landscape? How does that um, provide something that uh, visitors or politicians or managers can um, identify with or can value in different ways? 
So here it's really important to um, identify the context for geoconservation. So uh, here we need to identify and recognize the intersection between geoheritage and cultural heritage, because this not only provides added value, if you like, for a site, in other words, where a site is conserved for multiple uh, reasons, that makes it much more important than a site that is just conserved for one reason. And secondly, making links between different elements of the physical landscape and the cultural landscape makes it much more accessible by wider communities, by tourists, by the general public, by uh, local people, and by politicians and planners. So uh, here we need to um, identify and recognize the wider landscape context of sites that are conserved. And this is because conservation is a social and political act. It is a political strategy. OK, it's not done by scientists. It's done by politicians. It's done by managers. So uh, here it's done for a particular reason. And that reason may not necessarily, hopefully it is, but may not necessarily be solely down to its scientific value. And as scientists, we need to recognize the multiplicity of values that might be ascribed or attributed to certain sites. We also need to therefore recognize the potential for disjunction between what is conserved and what is valued. OK, so we might say as scientists, these fossils are incredibly important. Therefore, we need to conserve them. But you know, a member of the general public or whoever might say, OK, it's a bone of whatever. So what? How is that relevant? What does that mean to me? So we need to deal and identify um, and to come up with, you know, this this more integrated viewpoint between uh, the geology, the geomorphology and the um, physical landscape and cultural landscape context of geoconservation. And this leads us then to how we might, um, at an um, international and a, a more regional scale, deal with aspects of uh, conserving and protecting the nature of the land surface. So World Heritage Sites, and as part of their, their criteria, say that um, these sites need to be outstanding examples of stages of Earth's history, including ongoing geological processes in the development of landforms or significant geomorphic features. So note the words that I've just put in italics here. I've highlighted, if you like, the bits that are relevant to geology. So not only Earth's history, so things millions of years ago, but importantly, things that relate to the present day land surface ongoing geological processes, significant geomorphic features, so landforms that are present in today's landscape. So we need to identify, recognise and celebrate those particular things and not just be concerned with, you know, an, an old fossil or just concerned with a particular mineral or whatever. So um, World Heritage Sites are, of course, uh, categorised into uh, three uh, types of categories. So we have different types of World Heritage Sites, of course, in different parts of the world. But there are problems with managing these and there are many threats. So when we are dealing with identifying sites and um, dealing with identifying their scientific values, we need to link these into the wider narrative of not only their wider context, but how we can engage with different stakeholders, uh, such as local communities and managers, and in order to identify potential threats. We can also um, identify and uh, protect uh, geoheritage in different uh, protected area contexts as well. And it's really, really important that as geologists, we also recognise these things. So certainly in Southern Africa, of course, we have many areas that are protected for their ecosystem um, biodiversity. So national parks, reserves, wilderness areas, wildlife sanctuaries are present locally and in many areas of the world. So we as geologists need to consider which landscapes are protected within these ecological protected areas and why and how can geoheritage be discussed. So if we as geologists can make links to the ecological community 
and to identify, you know, we need to protect this landscape, we need to protect these rocks, because this provides the unique edaphic conditions in which these ecosystems can thrive, then, you know, this is a win-win situation. So instead of seeing, if you like, geology in isolation and separated from wider protected landscape status, um, if we make these links, then this will actually um, bolster our arguments. In addition, of course, we may also have zoos, botanic gardens, arboretums, urban parks. These may also be sites of geoheritage value. So we need to um, identify and uh, look at these sites in more detail. So, um, of course, we mentioned earlier on the uh, Water Susulu um, Park. You know, it's a great place where geoheritage has been brought forward. So why don't we do that in lots of other places as well? You know, this is a sitting target that we could be working with. Two minutes, so with respect to uh, World Heritage Sites, um, I just want to say something very briefly here about certain issues that are important in an African context. So there are just over 1,100 World Heritage Sites inscribed worldwide, of which are just over a 9%, so 106, are located in Africa. So just over 9% in Africa. Um, there are globally um, uh, transboundary sites as well, of which uh, Africa has a greater proportion of transboundary sites than are present globally. And sites um, are also identified by UNESCO of, of being in danger. And this is the phrase that they use, sites in danger. So Africa has round about three times as many sites that are in danger as are in danger globally. Okay, so this highlights the fact that Africa or African world heritage sites have certain issues that are more common here compared to other places of the world. So their transboundary status and the fact that many of them are in danger. So particular problems um, involved in the conservation of world heritage sites focus on um, the requirements of UNESCO for world heritage site inscription, uh, which um, requires them to have a sustainable development plan and a site management plan that involves local communities. And very often this is absent. Um, so some sites in Africa literally have no management plan at all. Some have no management structure. Uh, some have a disengagement with the local communities and you know, it's a complete disaster. So those, uh, those aspects pose certain issues in an African context in particular. There are also problems in reconciling the need for regional or national scale economic development versus international scale world heritage site intactness. So basically, if um, we have uh, development um, issues in a certain area, what comes first? Does its scientific or ecological um, international status come first? Or does the national government prioritise national scale or regional scale um, socio-economic development. And this is a pati of particular relevance with respect to mining um, in many African countries. We also have the effects of war, the effects of climate change, and the effects of different pathways towards economic development in those regions. This includes things such as mining and drilling, but also tourism and pollution. So often tourism is argued to be the saviour of world heritage sites. In other words, we want to inscribe this area as a world heritage site, and here's our tourism management plan. So often this management plan is entirely one dimensional, um, focusing on tourism, and it's seen as the panacea for everything, which of course is a vast generalisation Often there's a complete disconnect between tourism and local communities. And, you know, it's seen as this kind of saviour for the region and is often not. And in particular in Africa, we may have a transboundary and jurisdiction issues. So how do you reconcile management plans or management strategies or priorities when you're dealing with different stakeholders in different countries with different um, legislative setups? So these are particular issues. In South Africa, of course, we can conserve nature, and this is both biotic and abiotic nature, and geodiversity falls into the latter. 
under a number of um, uh, statutory legislative instruments. Most are, uh, you know, well, well known, of course, and most important is the, the various NEMA acts. So here, these are to protect and conserve ecologically viable areas and to establish a register of national, provincial and local protected areas. So um, the uh, geoconservation and geoheritage is often set within this, uh, this NEMA Act, which does not always, OK, there are exceptions. I'm not saying that this does not apply, but it doesn't always uh, describe the importance that geologists might um, attribute to certain um, places in the land surface within South Africa and the frameworks that are available to protect those areas. Okay, we also have uh, sand parks as well. So I mentioned earlier on the role of uh, um, making links with uh, ecological uh, conservation strategists and management plans, and this is important. And then finally, what is the role of abiotic nature here? So do we treat it differently? Do we treat it the same as um, the ways in which we approach management of um, biotic nature? So here we might consider world heritage sites and national parks. And what is the role of geoparks? So there are 169 geoparks internationally, but only two in Africa. So are we missing a trick here? OK, and I know uh, later on uh, we'll talk about um, uh, Vrida Fort, perhaps as a potential here. So when we are conserving nature in South Africa, and I will go through this uh, very briefly, there are a number of issues we need to consider. So balancing biotic versus abiotic nature, what is the role of local communities? How do we consider ecotourism or geotourism as a development strategy? And we, of course, will consider this here. What is the role of state, state versus private actors? How do we deal with transboundary issues? How do we deal with climate change? And how do we deal with land pressure? And finally, what are the limitations of existing legislation? So what are some future discussion points? We need to consider the landscape context of geoheritage and geodiversity, and this provides the framework for identifying how and why we might conserve areas specifically for their geology, but in a wider context. We need to consider issues with evaluating geoheritage from different perspectives, such as uh, from a cultural landscape perspective, and balancing things such as geological resource exploitation with geoheritage conservation. So um, how do we balance these different conflicting things when it comes to landscape management? And what are the implications of these strategies for long-term sustainable development? So how do we make links between um, abiotic nature and things such as the sustainable development goals and a CPD and the HE targets? So uh, just to summarise here, geoheritage should consider different landscape biotic and abiotic properties. We need to identify and value geoheritage and georesources using different approaches and in a landscape context. And conservation and management uh, should be integrated with other conservation priorities. OK, thank you very much for that. Thank you. I would like to talk about geoheritage as it pertains to geotourism. I recognize the comments made previously, but this is certainly the framework that we would like to discuss and put forward is firmly based on geotourism, which we see as the, the engine for driving uh, interest and support for geoheritage throughout the country, but also that provides us with a framework within which we can actually develop geoheritage, similar to the way that it's been done in many other countries. So I would like to start with geo geotourism. It's, it's, it's a fairly new concept. I mean, it's been around for, for years and years and decades, but as a formal concept, it was first actually defined only 25 years ago by Thomas Hose, a person in Bristol University, I believe, who's written a couple of books on it. The, the first dedicated geotourism conference was only held in Ireland a little more than um, 20 years ago, 24 years ago. I international conference was held uh, in Beijing, who, who China has taken the lead in many respects in uh, geotourism. And a global geotourism conference was held in 2011. 
Interestingly, geoparks, which was mentioned by the previous speaker, were first were established only in 2000. And uh, I'm going to focus on geoparks, not World Heritage Sites or other um, aspects of uh, organizations or physical uh, geographic units that can be identified as uh, geological heritage sites. They, I, I think I have, I've got a slightly different number to, to Jasper, but I think I have about 185 um, UNESCO Global Geoparks, of which 41 in China, and then there are many, many, many national geoparks. I suppose the comment there that there aren't any in South Africa at the moment, the comments have been made by many authors and <clears throat> in many papers that geoparks have done more than any other initiative to promote geotourism. From what I've read and from what I've looked at and from the people that I've spoken to, I agree with that comment, and that is one of the reasons why Alex and I are, will be promoting the development of geoparks as part of our initiative uh, with, with Fagasa. So with our, I think it's, as I said, unmistakable that we've got geoheritage um, in, in spades in South Africa. I don't think that's in question. We have an incredible national park system. We have a very, very well-developed field guide association, including training, we believe that we have the opportunity not only to take a national, but also a global lead in geotourism. And we will sketch out how we believe that this can be done in South Africa. So where, where are we in South Africa? Let's just turn to that a little bit and look at some of the issues and problems. Tanya in the beginning certainly did hit the nail on the head that we are, we are initiative rich and yet probably overall organization wise, um, we probably are lagging other countries in the world uh, in terms of how do we organize ourselves? Do we have a national register of geosites? Um, do we have a national register of geoheritage um, initiatives? What's on the go? One of the frustrations that, that I and many other people have is that we have no central register to go to to find out who's doing what and where and how and who's interacting with other people and other organizations, not only in the geological world, but outside the geological world as well. Um, that, that, I believe, is, is the ticket to the game, that we actually need to get a certain amount of organization in place in that particular area, which I don't believe is lacking as, as there at the moment. This conference, I think, goes a long way towards addressing that issue in terms of educating uh, the, the general geological and scientific community on what's actually what those initiatives are. Mm -hmm. However, where we want to turn to in, in terms of the initiatives is how are we interacting with non-scientific and non-geological communities and uh, organizations to develop a broad-based approach to geological and geoheritage in South Africa. One way to do this, as we'll sketch out, is to integrate the field guide specialist training, geological training, linked to the development of UNESCO geoparks within our existing park system. So let's have a look at the national park system. Let's have a look at what it looks like. Our first step was actually to understand what national parks we have in South Africa. I think we have, and, and I may not be 100% right, 147 national parks in South Africa, which you can see in green overlaying on the one in a million geological map of South Africa. What we've done is um, integrated it in a GIS system so that you have every single of those national parks which, as you can imagine, being in GIS, we can zoom in and zoom out on those particular uh, areas right down to the level of detail that we might have in the park itself or in, um, in individual areas of the park. And this uh, forms the basis for what we're describing as a, a geologic, an app which will be able to be used in each of the South African parks bar field guides and by tourists describing the geology. As you can imagine, being GIS-based, this is ideal to be integrated with other layers, such as, as Jasper was pointing out, 
the biomes, for example, the uh, use of uh, the area for, for for animals and for people and for various other geomorphic features. It can also be integrated, as I'll show you, with individual geosites within each of the national parks. And it is also scalable, or it's planned to be scalable, to be able to um, add information as we go along, such as trails, such as photographs, such as individual tourist um, experiences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The advantage of using uh, geoparks is that they have an, a well-organized infrastructure, they have uh, management, um, they have defined boundaries, and we can then uh, integrate what we would like to do, not only with the geoparks, with the parks themselves, but with the infrastructure that has been developed around them, such as, the, in particular, the training infrastructure. Alex, do you want to, do you want to add anything to that one? Alex, being my co-presenter, just remember to take off mute. I think you covered it all, Matt. Okay, so let's turn to a little bit of a, a detail. So we've been busy on a proof of concept study in the Eastern Cape, and we focused on one particular game park called the Kariha Game Reserve. And you can see it on the right there with strong support from the game reserve itself from Fagasa and now Forge, who we're talking to about developing the app at the, as we've discussed. This app will be similar to the British Geological Survey R Geology app, which has been going for a number of years and it's really good where you can focus in from, from a large scale down, zoom into building scale with a very nice uh, overlay of, of actual infrastructure in terms of buildings and roads and other infrastructure. We're not too worried about that aspect because we're focusing on the game parks. So it's really just uh, the geology, uh, the roads and the topography that we're focusing on right now. We're also integrating geosites. So tapping on the screen will give you a short description of the geology. Uh, as I said earlier, we'll be able to overlay uh, layers and we, we're busy hopefully uh, finishing off this within the next couple of months and hopefully be able to present it as a as almost a final product by just after mid-year. And just again, thanks to the IGC who have provided some funds to uh, develop this project and the app itself. However, most of the funding has, has come from private donors to date. This is what um, the park itself looks like. These are the geosites that we've identified. What we did was we um, identified more than we needed. So I think we had something like 40. On the right-hand side, you have see one spectacular geosite of the Bushman's River traversing through the Witterberg sediments, which are almost vertical and overturned, uh, not overturned, but folded, as you can see in the far distance over there. Um, each geosite is uh, integrated with the app so that when you tap on it, you can get a, a description of the geosite on your um, smartphone or whatever you might be looking at it. In addition, we've developed a park-specific supplement as a, a specialist geological field guide. This is quite a comprehensive document of a couple of hundred pages. We went overboard because we were trying to cover uh, everything that we could uh, from the geomorphology to the integration with biomes, the integration with the animals, and the integration with the uh, with the land use, both historic and current. And we also brought in a number of geological descriptions of the, the area around the park, such as, for example, the, the magnificent rock formations at Kenton on Sea, for example. Um, that, that is available to anyone if they'd like to, to go through it and have a look at it. What we've done is taken this and then converted it into, into training material for a specialist field guard uh, training in geology. And we're in the process of doing that, uh, certainly to get it in place by, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, not only for the Eastern Cape, but hopefully for a number of other areas as well. That will depend on how well we can mobilize the kind of structure that we're talking to you about today. So let's turn directly to that structure. Um, when we looked at 
what parallels we had in terms of uh, industry collaborations, because that's what we're looking at. That's a cross-discipline industry collaboration that needs to have longevity. The one that we looked at is the, the SAMREC and SAMVAL, uh, which is now incorporated in the overall SAM codes, which Tanya chaired for very successfully for a while. And that was an, a broad-based industry collaboration with two sponsors being the SAIMM, the Southern African Institute of Mining Metallurgy and the Geological Society of South Africa. Where it was broad-based is that it included everyone from the Department of Mineral Resources to the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the JSC, to SACNAS, SICA, the oil and gas, etc. This was started in 1994, the first SAMRIC code was issued in 2001, and it has gone through three iterations since then, and now incorporates codes for valuation, oil and gas, and environmental, social, and governance uh, reporting. I see a similarity in, in the potential to develop a collaboration with the Field Guards Association of South Africa to develop geological field guards for the game parks, maybe broad-based, not particularly for individual parks, but maybe area-based to develop um, uh, training for specialist field guard accreditation. And to talk about that, we'll, we'll have a look under, under Fagasa itself, but also to use and choose some of those geoparks or some of those parks that we have to select some of them to as candidates for geopark uh, registration. So where does the, the Fogasa fits in? It creates managers, specialist field guard training and accreditation. And that's the important part of it. So on behalf of CATSETA, I know there are some developments in this respect and Michelle, I think we'll be talking about it um, in her talk later on today. So a number of, besides the initial basic, basic training that you do in field guard, accreditation, you also have specialist field guides such as birding, hunting, biomes, um, astronomy. Uh, and although basic geological training is incorporated in the, in the early stage uh, training of, of a field guide, there is currently no specialist field guide in geology. This is a huge gap which we plan and hope to address. So the proposed framework for a, how we can implement, uh, implement this system is that firstly an opportunity exists to partner between the, the Geological Society of South Africa, who as representative of geologists in South Africa is the ideal choice to do this, and the Field Guards Association of South Africa. The GSSA has a reasonably well-developed uh, regional structure where they have uh, branches in covering most parts of the country. And I would see this has been a way to develop the uh, regional field-based approach to the uh, geological guards and accreditation and, um, and training. Um, it doesn't have to be through the geological branches, but I think the regional approach is important. So as long as we can have regional representatives who in turn could form committees that are broad-based in terms of uh, bringing in uh, other parts, other people who, who are involved and who have an interest in geoheritage for the sake of geotourism. I'm talking in particular in uh, geoparks, uh, the guarding association, uh, hiking associations and others. And then, as I said, we would use this structure to advance selected parks to UNESCO geopark status. Although this proposal has been mentioned and proposed to a number of uh, people in, in both organizations, it just still has, has to receive um, approval. And I want to just mention that, that it's still under discussion and what might emerge might look very different to this. So this particular proposal is there to generate discussion on how a um, broad-based geotourism framework could work. How do we fund it? Um, field guards pay for their training. Much of that is, is paid for by the parks um, that who, with whom they're employed. And so a park, as they 
bring on junior field guides will often pay for their training. I've, I've heard a number of different uh, statistics on how many field guides are paid for by the parks themselves and how many are uh, they pay for themselves or how many are paid for through other means. And, and it varies. Um, but paid for by the parks would, and Michelle could, could help me here, but probably no more than about 30, 40% maximum of the of the field guards out there. Uh, she could also help me with how many trained field, guard, field guards we have, but it is significant. I gave a talk to the uh, Department of Tourism um, late last year, specifically geared towards field guard and field guard training. And I think there were about 500, four to 500 registrations at that particular uh, conference. However, seed money has to come to get this off the ground, uh, to get us to the point where we actually are self-sustainable, will have to still come from private donors and through funds like, like the IGC. Ongoing funding I see has been through training subscriptions, through high-level donors. Once we have something in place, we can then approach donors with a product that we can actually discuss with them. And the second thing is that the, uh, the training itself could be provided through existing structures, through the Geological Society of South Africa, and through FAGAS's uh, training systems themselves. Um, with that, conclusions. Sorry, um, Alex, I haven't given you much chance to talk, but I'll, I'll hand over to you when I finish this. We don't need to talk about the South Africa's geoheritage. Um, anyone who's traveled and seen geoheritage in other parts of the world know this, knows that South Africa has as much, if not more, to offer from various aspects at many other countries. We tend to focus more on geology for geologists or science for scientists. What we're proposing here is an initiative that will make geology more accessible to the general public and in particular more appealing to tourists. And we're suggesting that the partnership between, possible partnership between the Geological Society and FGASA will help to achieve this and lead to uh, opportunities for employment, hopefully lead to community involvement and in particular greater enjoyment and appreciation of our overall geoheritage. We believe that we need to embrace this opportunity and we believe the timing is right, both nationally and internationally. And we'd like to ask for support of geologists in South Africa, especially of the Geological Society. We have a couple of minutes left for uh, questions and discussion. Alex, you've been intimately involved in the uh, Kariha Park project, Do you want, and also in developing the Forge app. Do you want to make any comments at this stage? Yes, yeah, sure. I'll just keep it brief. Thank you, Matt. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very, very happy and honoured to be a part of the conference and to be involved in geoheritage, in the geoheritage community in South Africa. I think it's really great work and I see a lot of potential and opportunity, especially for young um, aspiring geologists and natural scientists alike. Um, so yeah, just to give a brief background, honours graduate from Rhodes University, my undergraduate degree, my majors were geology and environmental science, after which I obtained my honours in enviros. Um, so I started working for Tacoma in August 2021 as an environmental scientist and assisting geologists to the geography student that Matt was funding at the time to kickstart the development of the app, the interactive geological app based on the geology of the Kariche Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape. It's a beautiful, beautiful reserve. Got to drive around and look at the geo sites and did some descriptions and took some pictures. And there are really some outstanding um, geo sites. I mean, just in that one area. Um, so yeah, in October, Matt assigned me as project manager, and since then I've been managing the developments of the app, as well as the progressions of the Specialist Geology Guide course, which Michelle will talk us through later today, as Matt mentioned. Um, at the moment, we are closely working with Forge, the app developers, and hope to have a prototype running by mid-year in the hopes of developing a countrywide interactive geological app 
mostly for the benefit of the public as a way to foster pub public interest and understanding of South Africa's incredible geological history, which I'm sure um, will be emphasized throughout these talks and throughout the conference. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much where my involvement is. Um, very, I've been very hands-on and, and I hope that we can keep the momentum going and gain more interest from, I guess, more young scientists in, in the geoheritage community. Um, yeah, that's sort of all that I really wanted to say. I, I think that the game parks are very, very important because they often fit the criteria of geoparks already. And so what a great way to tap into existing infrastructure and management structures and yeah, to have, to have trained guides uh, promoting geoheritage in South Africa. I think it's a really wonderful project. So thank you, Matt. And yeah, that's me. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just finish with a comment. I was at a game park in the Eastern Cape a month ago, and the young guards who took us around were super interesting, very, very enthusiastic, and could describe, as, as per their training, uh, pretty much everything that we were looking at. But they did it in a very chatty way and a very, very non scientific way, uh, very much a, a storytelling. What was telling to me, though, was that there was nothing on geology and, and there was no integration of geology with the overall storytelling in terms of the geomorphology, in terms of the soil types and in terms of the, um, the animals and the vegetation. And I just felt that there was something missing there that if we could not only be able to tell the story of geology in a chatty, uh, chatty way, but also to integrate it with the other magnificent heritage that we have in South Africa, particularly in our, our game parks, we would really develop a win for geology in terms of getting people not only in the country involved in talking about geology, but also in being able to sell our geoheritage to tourists with, with benefits that I can obviously see. Hi, good morning. I just very interested in this app because I think it's absolutely brilliant. I was just wondering if your geoheritage sites would include places like museums and galleries. We do have rather a few museums that are geoheritage museums in the country. And quite often people forget that museums are an integral part in representing the geoheritage culture in this country. Because, like I said, there aren't that very many of us. So I'm hoping that the app will include us as museums and galleries because we'd very much like to be part of it. That's an, that's an excellent question and excellent comment. We are very aware that because we get excited about your heritage, that we do have a tendency in this field to try and boil the ocean. So we're trying to just start off as much as we can choose to start off with this year. I have been approached by a number of museum and people who are involved in museums and, and those sort of um, structures following my talk to the Department of Tourism field guides last year. And yes, I think we need to put it into the into the mix. And I think a very, very good suggestion. So as we develop the project plan, we'll, we'll certainly consider that. Please send us your, your contact details as well, and we can perhaps talk offline as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Fantastic to be on the GSSA Geoheritage Conference. And I very much come at this from a tourism background because I'm, that's what I've been doing for more than 40 years and 30, more than 40 years actually consulting to the tourism industry. So, it, you know, it's very interesting to see some of the spec perspectives and some of the prior speakers have said. But um, I'm going to talk through our geoheritage tourism potential, but it's a sort of very broad level at this point. So what I'm starting with is some geoheritage tourism definitions. And just to first say that actually, when we look at it in the literature and how people describe, they usually talk about geotourism. They don't usually say geoheritage tourism. But I think for now, we could use those interchangeably. I was asked to talk on geoheritage tourism, but geotourism, geoheritage tourism are probably basically the same thing. So I've got some early definitions first to come up, a few. Um, so I'll just go through these briefly. A form of natural area tourism that specifically focuses on geology and landscape promotes tourism to geosites and the conservation of geodiversity, understanding of earth sciences, 
through appreciation and learning. And this is done through visits to geological features, use of geotales and viewpoints and so, so on and so forth. And these are some of the more earlier definitions. And there's, there's so many around, it's actually scary. And, and they all sort of overlap and have slightly different emphases. This one is uh, other academics, the provision of interpretive and service facilities for geosites and geomorphic sites. And they're encompassing topography together with their associated in-situ and ex-situ artifacts to constituency build for conservations and learning and research. So there's a lot of emphasis on conservation, learning and research, which I don't think is in inc incorrect. This one is an, an emphasis on, on the interpretive and service facilities related to the sites. This one is just saying it focuses on this. The next one, pretty much the same, providing culturally authentic travel experiences that protect, preserve the ecological and cultural environment. This is interesting because we're talking about authentic and cultural as a key element. Ecological is coming in as well. And then it talks about a range of niche forms of tourism, such as cultural tourism, eco-tourism that sustains or enhances the geographic character of a place, its environment, culture, aesthetics, heritage, and the well-being of its residents. So the first time people are bringing residents in here, which I think is an important component. Um, I think if I was to say the difference between this one is it doesn't talk about geosites and geomorph sites and um, specifically focuses on geology and landscape. So for me, and I'll, you'll see this later on, you can have geotourism in a city. Think of the mining heritage of Johannesburg. It's a city. You don't have to be in the natural environment necessarily to, to, to be involved or looking at geotourism. Another one, it should be defined as tourism which sustains and enhances the identity of a territory, territory taking into consideration its geology, environment, culture, aesthetics, heritage, and well-being. So a very similar one, actually. Oh, that's the UNESCO Declaration of 2011. This is one I found that's a little bit younger, 2016, that I like best. Geotourism today is essentially a cultural response to the physical landscape. More specifically, combines geology-based tourism in suitable locations with interpretation, education, awareness, awareness raising to foster geoconservation and sustainable economic benefits for local communities based on their geo heritage. So I think it's important that we bring in the local communities. And then what I like about this is the next phrase, notwithstanding the different definitions proposed, geotourism may be considered to span a spectrum of interests and opportunities appealing to a range of visitors from dedicated geotourists to casual visitors. The former are actively seeking to learn about geology and geomorphology as their prime motive, the latter are there to appreciate the scenery, enhance their experience of natural wonders in the landscape through cultural and aesthetic interests and enjoy outdoor recreation, or simply to be there. So what I think this one brings in for the first time of all the definitions is some thinking around tourists and what type of tourists actually go to geo heritage elements to enjoy something that is based on the geo heritage of the site that they're at. Um, and I think everything before is, is, if anything, a little bit lacking in tourism thinking, and it's very much on geology and geoheritage and definition around geosites and geomorphology. So moving on from that, I just want to mention, but everybody's been talking about them, you're all aware of them, the Geo UNESCO Geoparks, single unified geographical area where sites and landscapes of significant are man significance are managed with a holistic concept. So we all know what a geoheritage park is. I, go, I was on the site, what, three, four days ago when I was finishing this presentation, and that said currently 169. I think we've all got a different number for that, but that's what it said on the UNESCO site. And many are well developed for tourism. And this has happened in barely 20 years since geoparks were first considered in 2001. So the first thing I want to point out is this is amazing. Huh? As, a, as an underpinning element for tourism, this has gone from non to 169 global geoparks in 44 countries. So there's something really strong in the potential for geotourism out there. Um, not all the geoparks are particularly well developed for tourism, but a lot are. Um, so what I've done is I've also then started to look at some of the benefits, some of the values that are coming through. And this is just a handful of elements from different studies. So in the UK, they estimated that global geoparks network in the UK had contributed 18.8 million to the economy in 2013. In China, which I think it was Matt rightly said is the leader in geoparks and geotourism, um, that they saw a huge increase in geotourism revenue, um, it's tripled. Um, from in the four-year period from before to after their creation. So revenue tripled in just four years when they opened eight geoparks. So it was the same type of phenomenal growth over four years in eight different geoparks. And then specifically in this geopark tourism reason, it was used to transform the economy of the Jiaozu city region. I'm not great at pronouncing Chinese. With geotourism-related income increasing nearly 50 times over a 12-year period. 
and I can't, you know, $1.189 million to uh, $5 billion. So this is massive, massive. Another example is in Ireland where they looked at um, the geo-paying, geotourism revenue in the entire country. They looked at free sites and how, how much people spend not on the entrance but on what they do or in, in the free site, the hiking and cross-country walking, and they said the total income from geoparks was 167. Oh no, sorry, geotourism was 167.9 million euro, rising to 370. So more than doubling in that five-year period as well. So all this really says is there's something powerful here about geotourism and or geoparks in driving beneficial tourism. And I have to say we assume it's all beneficial, but I think most of the geoparks look very carefully at sustaining and the environment about education and also about the local residents. So quickly, just to show you a couple of pictures, this is the um, Northern Pennines Geopark. And this is some of what they talk about. They've, they've restored this amount of wetlands. They've got 273 hectares of grasslands. They've got 3,400 people came to events. Now think about that, events and festivals, stargazing festivals, for instance. So it's not necessarily what we think of as geotourism at first thought. And I, I've got a feeling a lot of people in geoheritage um, think more about specifically going to learn about the geoheritage. But there are so many ways you can use festival events to attract tourists to a destination. 49,000 people came to their visitor center. They've got 73 walking, cycling and riding trails available. And they've got pack horse tra tra trails to, to choose from. So guess what I'm showing you here? Here is a geo park. But you don't just go for in-depth geotourism, geosite experiences. You go to go riding on horseback, you go to walk, you go to cycle. Along the lines of what um, that latter definition said, where people are going to these geoparks for multiple reasons, not just the immersive geology or geoheritage experiences. Um, this is just what they list as, as um, activities in that geopark, Northern Pines, birdwatching, climbing, cycling, fishing, horse riding, walking, water sports and winter sports. So as again... Actually, it doesn't say geoheritage site visiting and interpretation here, although they do have that. They have a lot of it, but it doesn't actually say it. So this is perhaps something that's going to be um, a tension factor in all of this. And I've worked on um, world heritage sites in South Africa. I've worked on museums. And there's always a tension between the, let's call it the experts and, and the academics related to the subject matter of whatever is a tourism attraction and the actual tourism people who are driving, let's call it the commercialization and maximizing income from tourist attractions. And how do you do that? You do all of these things. And if tourists think they want to go horse riding, you don't try and attract them by telling them it's a geo, necessarily telling them it's a geo heritage experience. You say it's an adventure experience. This is one of the best ones in Africa for tourism. It's in, it's in Morocco, Makuan. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correct. It, uh, you can actually get this translated into English. But they've got a lot of dinosaur sites and other, uh, other geoheritage sites, about 24 in total. The main thing they do is um, hiking. Hiking is a major thing in this park. But obviously, they've taken the dinosaurs and they've made it very appealing to young children with the type of interpretation and everything they have. So this is probably slightly more specialized, but it still has a variety of activities that you can do. This is the Eco Hiker Guide um, in that park. And then finally, just, you know, there are so many, but this is Tumblr Global Geopark in Northern Can uh, in Canada, in British Columbia. And again, this is very much about doing all sorts of things. There's the paleological sites, there's going to see waterfalls, there's driving tours, there's hiking sites. So it's very much a mixed experience that is in offer on a, in a geopark. Obviously, they are the top 10 geo sites and what you will learn about the geo heritage when you go to those sites. So now I'm going to put all of that in a, a context about tourism in South Africa. So uh, I, think, I think understanding the greater context of where geo tourism might fit in the South African tourism industry is good to understand our tourism landscape. So first of all, we're going to look at our foreign tourism to South Africa. And maybe I should drop back um, one, and I sometimes say it's Tourism 101. But tourism is the definition of a person who travels away from home for more than one night and less than 365 days for any purpose. Okay, So they can be traveling from next door to go to hospital in South Africa. That's a tourist. They can be traveling to watch a soccer match or a concert. That's a tourist. They can be traveling to visit their friends and relatives. That's also a tourist. Or they can be traveling for leisure purposes and holiday. So tourism is a very much all-encompassing related to people traveling and staying away from home. So just to understand that context when I show you the stats. So we often, government likes to boast in South Africa that we have um, this about 10.4 million arrivals, total tourist arrivals, which we do, and it's absolutely correct. 
I'm using 2018 data because unfortunately, for some reason, we never got 2019 detailed motivation data out of South African tourism. Um, and then 2020 and 2021, of course, are a bit of a tourism disaster, but we won't go there for now. Just to say, maybe as an aside, we all expect tourism to come back and it's resilient. It is already bouncing back. So our 10.4 million arrivals in 2018, 68% are Africans who came across our borders, about 7.1 million. I've actually got them broken down here, but we'll come to that soon. So uh, these are the mainly shopping. The, ma the biggest motivation for these tourists to come to South Africa is shopping. There are a few who come on holiday or to come to events or conferences. Um, but Africans who are more likely to be coming on holiday or to events and conferences arrive by air, not at our road borders, which is about just under 700,000 African air tourists. And then the other 25%, 2.6, 2.7 million tourists are from overseas, as in beyond the African continent. This 2.6 million are 54% on holiday. So this is where we get our biggest component of our holiday makers. There are business travelers, business tourists, um, and then other tourists from other categories. I think this category is visiting friends and relatives. Sorry, I've lost the, seem to have lost the uh, description here. On the other hand, our African air tourists, most are coming for other purposes. A lot of still shopping. Holiday is only 19%. Business tourists, though, is a much higher percentage, nearly a quarter of business tourists. And business tourists, by the way, are people who come to, to attend an exhibition or a conference or an, a business-related event. Whereas business travelers down here, the 13% are people traveling for specific business related to their own business or a business they're visiting. The African land ones, just for information, 46% of VFR, that stands for visiting friends and relatives, a big component of our tourism industry. Um, the 29% of shopping, 37% other, 12% on holiday. And just as the same breakdown percentage wise is in 2019 numbers, we've got the basic breakdown, there's a slight difference, 25% less the prior year and 5%. Uh, sorry, 7%. Uh, but we did have less tourists, 10.2 million compared to 10.4 million. This is overseas tourists. This is what the top 50 things they visited were in the country. Okay, And this is so it goes down to top 50. And I've used three years average of visitation from South African tourism data. And I would say that Euro Heritage underpins many of our top foreign tourist attractions, about 26 out of 50, all the ones I've highlighted in light brown. So some of these are actually very much let's say the Kango Caves, very much geoheritage. Of course, Lamba, very much geoheritage. Um, others have got elements of geoheritage to them, whether it comes to beaches, well watching, there's elements of geoheritage in all of those things. There's elements of geoheritage in all safaris because safaris and what animals live where and what the biomes look like that you are going through on safari are determined by geoheritage. Just a quick for the detail on foreign tourists, uh, you know, this is to say, where's the value in our foreign tourism? So our African land tourists spend on average 4,000 rand. Our African air tourists and our African overseas tourists are very similar in spending, 20,000, 19,000, 19,000, 18,000. This is holiday tourists. Very important, though, is prepaid expenditure before you leave your country is very high for the overseas tourists, of which a lot comes through for internal ground arrangements, internal accommodation that they buy before they leave their source country. So if you take this in together, the 20,000 spent here, the 27,000 spent before they come here, this is where our high value tourists are. But that doesn't mean to say that we negate all of these. These are high spenders as well, pretty high spenders. And some of these people are also decent spending leisure tourists. Then domestic tourism. In South Africa, unfortunately, we have two, area, two entities that do a research study on domestic tourism and they quantify it they come up with very different answers. This is South Africa in 2019. They said we had 58 million adults traveled for domestic purposes, whereas South African tourism said 28 million. So it's a bit of a conundrum. We don't have a decent real measure of this. But if we boil it down to holiday tourists, it's a similar number, uh, 7.1 million, 7.4 million. So we're sort of comfortable. We have seven to 8 million holiday tourists in this country. Um, and the spending is much lower than foreign tourists. This is the per trip spend, not too dissimilar from the two surveys. So that's what our domestic tourists are spending on average. What do the domestic tourists spend per purpose of visits? So this is our visiting friends and relatives. To understand domestic tourism, a huge volume is visiting friends and relatives, and they have one of the lowest spends. Leisure is a small volume, 16.8%, but the highest spend. So our leisure tourists are the highest spenders, and we're up here to now going on for 3,000 3, rand per trip, more than double the average. The next high spend categories are business, but a small percentage, sports, small percentage, and shopping, small percentage. So the rest, study educational, medical and health, religion, funeral. By the way, funeral travel in South Africa is a very big thing as well. But the spending levels are a little bit lower. 
So that's a little snapshot of domestic trips by purpose. So we can see that, you know, leisure travel is this many, but we shouldn't ever forget the visitor to friends and relatives. The reason being many of those people also undertake visits to activities when they're at a destination. So you would, for instance, go to Cape Town to visit your family. You might go up Table Mountain or do other things in the Table Mountain Park. It doesn't mean we should ignore you as a market for geotourism. This is what people actually do, domestic tourists. So remember, this is across the 28 million on South African tourism um, surveys. And I've just put a, the red lines around the ones that potentially we would say adventure, geotourism, wildlife, geotourism, cultural and heritage, beach, depending on what sort of activities they did on the beach and visiting natural attractions. Shopping is, I think, there's not a tourist who goes anywhere and doesn't shop. It's fairly unusual. So I sort of ignore shopping. So if you then start to look, these are fairly small percentages down the bottom, but of a very big number when we're talking about 20 million or 28 million to maybe nearly 50 million. This is sand parks. And, and, and sand parks, as I say at the top there, and I can't even see because it's kidding. They're in tourism more than, I, I mean, they're in geo heritage or geo tourism much, much more than I think they realize. And I've highlighted the parks that have very definitely got a geo heritage element to a lot of the experiences that you can get in them. But in fact, I think every single park has got geo heritage um, underpinning it in some way or other. But some of them are particularly more geo heritage in, in the experience. And people might understand that if they went to, um, elements of Table Mountain, the Richtersfeld and the Makwa, that they're having a heritage-based experience. The next thing I just want to say about tourism, tourism is actually all about branding and marketing. If you can't get your tourists to your destination, whether it's a geopark, whether it's a geo-heritage feature of some sort, um, there's, then you're not going to make your money, you're not going to make your revenue. So I thought I'd just put the context around South African tourism's branding of our country, how they sell us overseas, and locally to South Africans. We have six key elements of our brand. We say safari, scenic beauty, coastal beach, active adventure, city lifestyle, and cultural. So I would say that safari, scenic beauty, coastal beach, active adventure, and cultural have a huge amount of geo heritage underpinning them. And actually, so does city lifestyle. So if you think, I kept, so when, when foreigners come to South Africa, they actually have two things the main drivers, the safari, and then Cape Town. Cape Town is a global iconic city. Why is Cape Town a global iconic city? Because of its geo heritage, because it has a table mountain, it has a Cape Point, um, and it has all the things that, that that has created. So, you know, the geo heritage is sitting there everywhere, even in some of our city experiences. And uh, as I said, Johannesburg is a mine, has mining experiences as a city, but um, city lifestyle and what's going on in the city can still be geo heritage. I'm not going to go, this is just unpacking a little bit some of the elements under each of those. We won't go through it in detail. Um, the Three on Bravels, God's Window, phenomenal geo heritage experiences, coastal beaches, um, uh, co coral reefs, fish life. This is all part of your geo heritage, which what, what marine animals you get is part of geo heritage. Active adventure. A lot of adventure is, is related to that landscape and geo heritage. And we saw that from those geo parks that I took us through briefly. The city lifestyle, as I've mentioned, they don't have a place of gold. The place of gold is geo heritage. And what did that do? It created this economic hub that we have in Joburg and cultural roots. And this is, again, SA's Amazing Treasures, summarized in a South African tourism presentation from a couple of years ago, the 10 UNESCO World Heritage Sites, National Parks, Marine Protected Areas. Everything in red is sort of basically geo heritage related. Um, the highest commercial natural bungee jump in the world, adventure because of the geo heritage of the area. Tourists and tourism. I, I think like that other definition, you've got, you've got niche deep specialists who are really, really interested in the geo heritage and you know, geo sites in an area, really deep interest. Then you've got a person like me, I call this me, a deep generalist. I do enjoy an immersive and highly educational visit. I find, for instance, Maripeng's interpretation center incredibly boring. Um, you need to actually, for me, not a, not a specialist, I want to go on the, the um, curated tours of the, of the dig sites, of the archaeological uh, or paleontological sites. And then you've got general tourists, but just enjoying the scenery, maybe enjoying a, um, an adventure experience or a, a soft adventure experience. And all of, so all of the above may combine with other experiences, soft and hard adventure, events, festivals, sporting events, functions, weddings, conferences, general interest holiday, scenic, safari, beach, city culture. If you look at this like this, I think a lot of what we talk about is maybe this level, niche deep specialists and deep generalists in terms of geo-heritage tourism, but there's a whole level of geo-heritage tourism is much bigger than that. And 
you know, I, this is me, I'm the layperson here, just saying what we encompass in the geoheritage, geography, geology, paleontology, archaeology, anthropology, history, culture, flora and fauna, ecosystems which underlay and defined by geology and geomorphology, human and mining history and interaction and pin by geology, agriculture, history and current, and just scenery. So it's, it, it, what that says to me is, in a way, pretty much all tourism in South Africa is underpinned by the geoheritage of this country, and we have amazing geoheritage. And as one quote, and it's been alluded to by previous speakers, it's apparent that South Africa is a world leader in geodiversity, but not in geotourism. So what pertained in 2008, I would say, still applies today. South Africa has some of the richest geoheritage assets on Earth, but neither for domestic or foreign tourists are these leveraged in tourism marketing or tourism experiences. South Africa could be the leading global, heritage, global geoheritage travel education and conservation destination. It could be a global leader in sustainable, inclusive, community-based geoheritage. And if I could say there's one thing we need to do better in this country is bringing our communities into our tourism industry. It's, it's, it's imperative. And a lot of the trends post-COVID are saying that communities are no longer um, sidelined observers of tourism and, and you almost need a local uh, license to operate from your resident community or whoever they are. And we can tell the story of the development of Earth and life on Earth to the people in South Africa, Africa, and the world over. So that's a very overall, fairly aspiring, high level aspiring way to look at it and to say, how would that look? A big, hairy, audacious goal might be the geoheritage underpins the brand and destination marketing much of destination South Africa. We have a national geoheritage conservation initiative, stroke entity. We have within SA Tourism or separately a geoheritage destination marketing organization. So I think your tourism development and your tourism marketing is, a, you know, it's a specialization that you need to bring tourism people into to really get that going. Um, and it would be if, if South African Tourism is our, is our national destination marketing entity, if they were to take it up, which would be a big thing to ask and it's not going to happen overnight. And it would be phenomenal. Then we have geoheritage destinations, which are well known as such, well preserved and presented, skilled guides, range of tourism experiences, well integrated with communities who benefit from the geotourism value set, probably aspiring geoparks. From the little bit that we've looked at, a few of us have looked at the geoparks requirements, it's a fairly onerous process and a fairly bureaucratic process to go through. And maybe we go into aspirational geoparks first. But that's the sort of this is not going to happen overnight. This has to start with this happening through from the industry, the tourism industry and the geoheritage um, community. And eventually we will get to this type of um, national promotion of geoheritage tourism. And we're known worldwide as a leading geoheritage destination. It, I, there's no reason why we shouldn't. People would associate the rich history of earth and life with us, with South Africa. Or we we remain, or we are at least a niche geoheritage tourism destination. We may have a national entity which umbrella markets geoheritage tours and experiences for the deep generalists and the specialists. A geoheritage heritage brand is a sub-brand of some key geo destinations. Even to, so, so if we could get some parks to say a Table Mountain National Park and then have a slogan or a tagline under it, say a geotourism experience, that's how we start to get it, get it out there. So I don't think we can do um, geoparks very quickly and easily. But we can take some of our existing parks that have a, a very particular geoheritage element and start saying, let's make this geoheritage related. I, I love numbers. I'm not sure if the, the presentation that's going to come, which is going to talk about the potential and I think perhaps how we work out what the potential is. It's hard to say what the potential of this is, but just as a one statistic I found is that around 2003, this was a Dowling and Newsom um, paper on geotourism definitions. Something, they quoted a, a, a statement that 55.1 million, million Americans were geotourists or had the potential to be geotourists. That's about a sixth of the population of America. So if we even, this is not a proper way of doing it at all, but if we just made a, a vague assumption that we maybe have uh, about 3.4 million international tourists, that's the African air tourists and the overseas tourists, and maybe we have about, including the elements of friends and relative visitors in the domestic market, we have maybe 15 or 16 million tourists, and maybe say one sixth of them would do geoheritage tourism as an experience. That's about three to four million geoheritage tourists sitting around in South Africa waiting to be attracted to geoheritage destinations. So um, it's a very big thumbs up, but it's a type of way of looking at it. And if I actually think of how much of what we have in South Africa has a geoheritage element to it, it's probably actually 
easily down to attract that many people. It's about telling them that what they're seeing and understanding and enjoying has a geoheritage, um, uh, what's okay, that is sustained or created by the geoheritage of our, of our country. That's, um, I don't know if people have got any questions, Tanya, but that's my presentation completed. So thank you very much, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kodani. I'm affiliated with UNISA. Uh, I'm giving a presentation on a proposed evidence-based field methodology approach for assessing the potential for geotourism. Uh, this was a case study uh, from the Kruger National Park. All right, I'll, I, I just want to introduce uh, a general definitions of what is geotourism and geoheritage. Uh, geotourism, the way I define it, is the utilization of geoheritage sites for tourism activities to benefit local communities. When you talk of geoheritage sites, we're talking of aspects of earth geology that we in. Here, I want to underline this issue that um, uh, geoheritage sites are not cultural sites. Here, what you're looking at, we have these are sandstone caves in the Kruger National Park, and then here you're looking from the inside of the park. So here we have a geo-heritage site that is linked to culture and also wildlife. As I go in with my presentation, I will give more emphasis on the interlinkage between geo-heritage or geo-tourism and wildlife, as my presentation is based in the Kruger National Park. All right, uh, what is geo-tourism? European Geoparks Network defines geotourism as a tourism that sustains and enhances the identity of the territory by taking into consideration the territory of geology, environment, culture, aesthetic, heritage, and the well being of its local surrounding residents. Here, what is important is the inclusion of local residents so that they are also participants in geotourism and they also benefit from um, the geotourism. And geotourism is gaining momentum because it fosters sustainable tourism development and also enables the local guardians or the local communities to be the main uh, guardian of this geoheritage site. And the locals are also benefiting from this geotourism. However, when we look at South Africa, we don't have the standardized methodology uh, to collect data on the potential for geotourism. And this study is the first of its kind to develop such a methodology in South Africa and also in Africa, but with a focus on the Kruger National Park. All right, here um, I'm just showing uh, the history of the, uh, the linkage between the movement of people before the Kruger National Park was established. We all know that it was established when it was first called in 1902, the Sutabi Reserve, and then 1926, that's when it was declared a Kruger National Park. But here what you're looking at, you're looking at the migration of, of the, same, the settlement of the Senda people from the Central African and then moving down to Tanzania and then moving down to, to Zambia and then passing through the Metabolic land south in Zimbabwe and now Zimbabwe. And then they come now to the, now what we call the Zimbabwe province uh, along the Bay Bridge. And then you have where they settled at Chema which is also a national park and the World Heritage Site. And then you also have the Kruger National Park where we have the Tulamela where the Zenda King uh, was staying as well. I'll talk more on this site as we go along the presentation. And so here we're looking at that the, the migration of the Zenda people is linking to the Kruger National Park and the how the, now the Zenda people should also form part of the geotourism. All right, again, as, as I proceed with the historical background, here we're looking at the map of Southern Africa, mid 1880s. Again, this is before the formation of the Kruger National Park. Here you have the colonizers moving from the Cape Colony up, moving up to the Lois Richard, and then again uh, moving down to the Limpopo province, now Limpopo province, and then settling, and then moving up as well to the Limpopo. So here, we, what is important is the linkage between the historical uh, movement of people with heritage or geo-heritage, especially in the Kruger National Park, which is uh, one of our richest uh, park in terms of geo-heritage. So here we're looking at the map showing the Kruger National Park, which is, we all know that it's the biggest national park in South Africa. And uh, it's also the biggest in terms of the tourism numbers and also revenue. We all know that we have a large number of national parks about 
2021 and National Park in South Africa. And then this study, we have only focused on the northern part of the Kruger National Park, mainly because of the uh, size of the Kruger National Park. And that area also is uh, very poor in terms of uh, um, employment. We've got very few people employed in the northern part of the Kruger. And then also the population size, you can see that it's mainly young people. Um, but if we are to develop geotourism in that area, it can have many benefits, such as the, the creation of local jobs, economic opportunities, provide alleviation, job conservation as well, and also position the KNP as a job park. All right, these are some of the opportunities that are presented by geotourism, including the local economic development, job creation, poverty alleviation. These are themes that if one was to go into detail, then I, I will not finish my presentation today, but I'm just highlighting that these opportunities like protection of geographic sites and culture uh, can be realized if we are to introduce geotourism. Also enhancing the well-being of local residents, improve local knowledge and awareness about geotourism and their heritage as well. Uh, tourism market diversification, I think the last speaker also talked about this. Um, geotourism is on the right worldwide, um, mainly because of the interest on geological heritage, geoconservation, culture, education, sustainability, indigenous knowledge and community. And we found that there is various definitions of, of geotourism, uh, which include different concepts like geoconservation, geodiversity, geoheritage, geosite, and so forth. Um, geotourism and geotourism, as I said, have been widely uh, argued and defined in academic literature. Here we have a definition by Dowling and Newsom, 2010, who divide geotourism into two components, which is geo, which is meaning geology and geomorphology. While tourism is, re they are referring to researching, learning, appreciating, and engaging with geosites. But this definition uh, seems to leave out the well-being of residents or who are the historic guardians of this geohelitic site. And then we have another, another definition by Esam Natal in 2013, who defined geotourism as a tool for sustainable development of geohelitic. Again, this definition is susceptible to misinterpretation due to different opinions of uh, sustainable development. And then we have uh, the definition by Nussam and Dolan 2018, who defines geohelitic as an element of Earth that we live. Again, emphasis is that Geoheritage is not necessarily cultural sites, but geoheritage sites does have an interlinkage with culture as well. And then we also have Lima Italian 2010 who defines a geoheritage site of paramount world importance due to their natural uh, characteristics. And then Hosea in 2010 emphasized that no studies have covered the breadth and of geotourism and the nature and geographical coverage and theoretical underpinning. UNESCO 1972 uh, gives us a, a starting point in terms of how then do we define geotourism. They have uh, uh, divided the definition in terms of cultural into three components, which are monuments, group of buildings, and sites as well. And research is showing that uh, there are tourists seeking, are seeking authentic experiences, as Gillian uh, uh, presented in the previous slide, showing that South Africa we do have these authentic experiences if we can use them then uh, our geotourism can then proceed very well. Now I'm moving on to global overview in terms of research. Uh, here what you're looking at is the map of published article on geotourism from 2012 to 2014. Again, you can see that where it's highlighted in red, you can see that uh, during that period, we only had three published articles on geotourism, which is very little compared to Europe or, and Asia as well. So in general, we're still lagging behind in terms of research. Again, this is a slide showing you how we are still behind in terms of research on geotourism in South Africa. Because in 2018, we only have one study, while other countries in Europe and China and Australia, Brazil, are progressing very well. Um, and then here we have published uh, research that is the country uh, from 2007 to 2018. You can see that Brazil is leading, and then followed by Australia and then countries in Europe and the United States. We don't have any African countries in that list of the most uh, uh, research studies in, in, on geotourism. I think Kevin Page will 
present more well more on this uh, from the geo heritage agenda uh, to give more details on this. I'm just giving an overview, I'm not going to detail. Again, this are research studies from 2008 to 2018. You can see how there is a gradual growth in terms of number of studies being conducted. Uh, but still, we need to, as South Africa, we need, we need to increase our research output so that we, we are also recognized in terms of our uh, geotourism research. All right, these are the research topics that we uh, are finding in terms of research. Most of the uh, researchers are focusing on geo-heritage or geotourism potential of the area. It's 46% of all the studies that were conducted between 2008, 2002 and 2018. What is concerning here is uh, most studies are not focusing on local communities, which is a concern. And I think we, as researchers, we need to focus more on how does geotourism link with local communities. Uh, so this time, just highlighting what is uh, the topic that are covered in, in geotourism currently. Again, these are the major areas of focus. Uh, researchers, you can see again that people are focusing or researchers are focusing on cave, koji, uh, volcanic, geoheritage, urban geotourism is also coming up. So these are the major areas which are, uh, researchers are focusing on as well. So I'm just giving a background or uh, uh, overview of the global research uh, before I come into my methodology. All right, global research is more focusing on focusing on primary data and secondary data. If you look, look here, uh, we think that 188 studies were both primary and secondary uh, data related. And then in terms of uh, the methodology, it's both the combining qualitative and quantitative methodology, which is mixed methods. And then um, we find that the data collection methods mostly use this field survey and sampling and and uh, literature review uh, with some case studies, survey, uh, analysis of cartographic materials, interviews. Again, this may be also linked to uh, the lack of focus on local communities. And then this slide shows who are the researchers on geotourism. So here we're looking at the top 10 researchers in the world in terms of geotourism. We find that this was the who has been most in geotourism research and then Muslim Dowling. Again, we are finding that most of these are not in Africa. Most of them are in Europe. Uh, most of these authors were existing there. So we need to uh, up our game as African researchers as well in terms of uh, researching geotourism, which we are trying to do at the moment at UNIFA and other uh, academic institutions in South Africa. Um, these are the global or the national, we have international and also national uh, programs on geotourism. Here we have the UNESCO World Heritage Convention and also at the UNESCO Global Geopark Network. We only have one in Africa, I think one speaker talked about this. The KNP has got attributes that it can become a geopark. You don't need to be recognized as a geopark to practice geotourism or to develop geotourism. Even if we're not recognize as the KNP as a global geopark, we can still practice and develop geotourism. It doesn't stop us because the recognition of geopark doesn't necessarily give you a legal state. It's just a recognition by UNESCO and there is no legal protection around it. So we also need to um, pay more focus on biosphere reserves as well, which are also sites where there are geotourism sites which we can uh, use as for geotourism. In terms of South Africa, we have very few organizations or programs that are focusing on geotourism. This includes the GSSA Geo Heritage Division, the Council for Geoscience and some Microsoft well on Geotourism, and then the Overbeck Geoscientist Group, which are doing some work on geotourism as well. And then when it comes to geotourism, it, it, as I said earlier, it's rapidly growing in Europe and in China. However, Africa and South Africa. That we are still behind. All right, I want to give a, a brief a, a legal perspective in terms of geo heritage in South Africa. The geo heritage sites in South Africa are governed or uh, legislated through the National Heritage Resources Act, who, which de uh, describes them into or uh, categorizes them into three categories. The first category is heritage resources with qualities so exceptional that they are of special national significance. 
great tool is heritage resources, which although for many part of the national resources can be considered to have special quality, which make them significant within the context of the project or the region. And then grade three is other heritage resources with the conservation. What you're looking at here is the, the National Heritage Resources Act does not give a criteria or a definition of what exceptional or special means. So our legislation needs to be a, a specific also talk of when it talks of heritage, what, what is exceptional, what is special, which this methodology which I'm going to present will give us some guide on how we can make the process from there. And then the South African Heritage Resources Agency is responsible for the identification management of grade one heritage resources. But that's what the problem is, is that SARA does not have a methodology for assessing these two heritage sites. Then how then do you manage or how then do you identify this site? And then in terms of provincial heritage resources, they are responsible for grade two heritage resources, while local heritage resources authorities are responsible for grade three heritage. Um, also then National Health Environmental Management Act, or normally known as the NEMA, which mandates organizations like farm parks to create nature-based tourism and other things include cultural institution act, World Heritage Conservation Act, Minerals and Petroleum Resources Development Act, South African Strategy for Paleo Science of 2012, National Tourism Strategy, which is on its vision it states that really we need to rapidly and inclusively grow tourism economy and leverage South African competitive edge in terms of nature, culture, and heritage underpinned by Ubuntu and supported by innovation and service excellence. Again, here we recognize national tourism is putting nature, culture, and heritage the bedrock of our tourism strategy. And we, we may have this legislation and strategy, but we're finding that they are not achieving the desired level of heritage management. Reasons for this are explained in our uh, published paper. You, you can look at it later. All right. Uh, so that they have, we have not achieved the desired level for this. Again, as I said, we have, we have heritage resources in South Africa, especially within protected areas. Uh, but as Sarah in 27 recognized that the current knowledge of heritage resources within protected areas is extremely limited. And here we're looking at UNESCO heritage sites in South Africa with only few uh, of them being uh, of geology of, or of, of geo heritage sites. Uh, so we need more sites of geo heritage or geology significance to be also one of heritage sites. Again, this also comes back to the issue of geoconservation, whereby these sites are recognized, but they are also in danger. Uh, so we need to sell sites like the critical dome, which are being neglected and not actually being used for or geotourism as well. Um, this slide shows that at the Kuku National Park, we do have exceptional geology. Here we're looking at the Livogo River Gorge in the northeast of the park, with some exceptional geology known as the Valley of the Giants, given its name, it, it, its many obac trees. Again, here we have the link of geoheritage with culture. When we look in Venda, the boba tree for the food, which is used to, and it is normally used by the vendor people as a food as well, and also animals to eat this boba tree. So there is a linkage of geology, culture as well. And then we need to link this also with the, the wildlife, as I'm going to present in the next slide. And we also have on your right there the Libaba Falcalic Valley of the Olifant River. Okay, as you can see here, we're having a linkage between geology and wildlife. Here we're looking at the red rocks, whereby you have got animals who will come drink water. And so we can link geotourism as well as uh, other tourism activities like bird viewing, uh, wildlife. So these things are also interlinked. And here at the bottom, you have the neglected, I'm saying neglected because it's not protected, the dinosaur remains of both. And here we have got some significant sedimentary structures like lamination and bearing. And we have the fruit litter one, which are great important in terms of the geological history. All right, I will now move on to the methodology. The methodology uh, comprised of three phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three. And this phase one was inventory of fields 
instrument concept legislation, which was basically between the in, uh, developed through the engagement with different stakeholders, with, uh, including the Department of Tourism, the uh, local tourism, traditional authorities, local communities, tour operators, high schools, and South African National Parks. And here I will not need to appreciate uh, Prof. Lena, Dr. Thomas, Dr. David, and Prof. Morris Bellion. The phase one uh, of the methodology we started is the inventory field instrument conceptualization, which involved the review of previous methodologies, draft field assessment, consultation with stakeholders, and then field assessment instrument. Okay, so this is the final uh, methodology that we developed. Uh, you can see that we've got six, six steps or six criteria, which are geo heritage, as the geo tourism value, the site as cultural value, the site as ecological sensitivity, uh, accessibility to the site, the site requires development and available literature. And then we score them between a value of one to five. And then the value, the site with more value, uh, with more uh, with a higher score, will then be having more of geotourism. They will test the, will then be of high geotourism potential. All right, we can we can pass this slide in just an explanation, a detailed explanation of what each category means. As I said, uh, you have geotourism, geoheritage in terms of geotourism value, cultural value, political sensitivity, accessibility. Uh, require uh, that requires development and available. You can you can one of our publications to get more information on this. All right, in the phase three of the research involved the trial of this geoheritage methodology. Uh, we looked at uh, two sites, uh, Tulamela and the, and the Crooks Corner at the Crook National Park. Here we're looking at the Tulamela heritage site, which is in terms of field observation, we found that it's geology, landscape, and history of significant and at the end, it got high geotourism value and also cultural value with a total score of 25. So here you can look at the different uh, aspects of the site, the cultural value, the geological value as well. Again, cultural value as well can also uplift the geotourism value of the site in terms of uh, its significance. If you link the two, then it, it takes more, it has, it has more weight than when it's just that maybe a cultural value or geotourism value only. And then again, this is the, the Crooks Corner as well. It's got the total ranking score of 21, and mainly because of its cultural value, but with very little the geotourism value. But again, it's again that balancing act of how then the site needs to have different aspects about it so that it can be developed and then attract more tourists, more tourists as well. All right, I would like to conclude uh, the presentation and say that this study has assisted in understanding and recognition of geotourism. And we have developed a first of its kind of methodology that can be used to assess the potential of geotourism. And we, this study provides a guideline for geotourism in South Africa and Africa and globally. And it assists in the development of national database of geotourism sites and also in geoconservation because. If we don't know where these sites are and we don't know how to assess them, then how, how then are we going to conserve or protect them? The outcomes of this study are assisting academic, government, industry, and other agencies in policy development. For example, the Sun has already advertised um, the surveys or attendance on the survey and assessment of cultural heritage sites at the KP, Ardo National Park, and other areas where they are planning to do so. And also identified new tourism market segment in terms of geotourism. Okay, the research on geotourism is led by a university research councils like the Council for Geoscience, companies and associations like the DSSA, the Overbeck Geoscientist Groups, but to a lesser extent the government and protected areas. But Africa is still behind in terms of geotourism research. Actually, Africa is still behind compared to other countries. We need a greater development of geotourism at all governments. Uh, geotourism research and geotourism site in the case of Africa needs a champion it must involve the young generation. There is a need to continue to develop legislation and strategies specifically on geotourism and geotourism sites. Again, a few articles on geotourism in South Africa are observed, which indicate that we should take more action, nor is the development of geotourism as a driver to sustainable development. 
This could be because of the lack of communication in terms of this research. All right, I would like to acknowledge Prof. Leonard and Thomas and uh, Dr. John Christoph for his advice and the GSSA for the invitation and also Sanford for granting access when I was conducting the study. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Kadani. That was a, a, a very interesting uh, presentation. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so let me introduce Kevin Page. Uh, scientific publishing as another tool to promote geological heritage for a sustainable future. So Kevin, uh, jump in. I, I'm going to sort of talk uh, primarily about geoheritage, which I, I edit as, as an example. But of course, there are other journals uh, out there in the field now which is quite interesting, but geoheritage has a very specific niche. It's, it's much more uh, like one of the traditional learned society journals, uh, as it's very much this or the journal Progeo, the Association for the Conservation of Geological Heritage. So geoheritage was established in 2009 as a partnership between Progeo, which is a non-governmental organisation, uh, the Association for the Conservation of the Geological Heritage and the publisher Springer. Progeo envisaged the journal as a way of promoting geological heritage through the publication of high quality, scientifically informed works on all aspects of the subject, including its selection, protection and related educational and touristic activities. The scope of the journal is very broad and that's very much the way it's evolved. And it covers not only the policy and practice of managing in situ geological heritage, but also crucially, and this reflects what a lot of speakers have been talking about, geological heritage in a cultural context, such as museum collections, the built environment, and in the context of sustainable development. It took about four years uh, for the initial target of seven papers per issue, four issues a year. But by the end of 2021, uh, nearly 650 papers of international scientific importance have now been published. So that's an interesting resource to look at. So now in its 13th year, years, this resource can, can really help us to understand how things, aspects of the development of policy and practice of this new discipline, and actually see whether the original aims of Progeo have been met, even exceeded. Now, impact factor is, is, is uh, I'm afraid, a game which people in the academic community uh, play because governments use it to assess what people do. But it's just one measure of the journal quality. Perhaps one of the greatest successes of, of, uh, of GeoHeritage is climbing from about 0.7 as uh, a citation index to, uh, the, for 2000, and 21, a five-year average of 3.089, which is not too bad on the scale of things, especially as I'm a paleontologist and most paleontological stuff is much, much lower than that. But there are other ways of looking at so the, 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 the success and the figure at the bottom here of getting on for 100,000 downloads in 2021 certainly uh, indicates there's a lot of people out there interested in the, in the subject. And it's quite interesting to look at what people are actually sort of reading, what they're looking at uh, amongst the top, top 10 articles for downloads, which is, uh, I think the figure there is 3,798, was a paper on the dark geocultural heritage of volcanoes, combining cultural and geoheritage perspectives for mutual benefit. So one can understand it's, it's one of those sort of, the, 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 that, as they say, the dark tourism aspect of things, but it's related to geotourism. Also, citations, and not surprisingly, one of the highest cited uh, uh, papers uh, is one on methodologies, geomorphosite assessment method, uh, method which is a, a, a nice sort of uh, international or mainly sort of uh, South America's European collaboration. Uh, and, and papers like that are one thing which, which GeoHeritage uh, has been very useful for reviewing methodologies. There's a lot of methodologies out there. Uh, previous speakers talked about aspects of different concepts of geotourism, etc. Uh, but it's very, very useful to have a review which puts these in context for perhaps people new to the subject. Social media is, is another way in which, which the organisations can measure the success of things. The, the problem with social media when it comes to scientific literature, it's only picked up if the DOI, 
that massive long code for the paper is actually actually included and not many blogs or tweets are gonna uh, someone is going to be take the time to put in the doi so perhaps the social impact is not the the not best sort of expressed through this this current outmetric formula but it's interesting uh through this this particular formula uh, and, and I have to say, all these, these tables come from publishers' reports. These are very, very interesting documents. Every year, a publisher will go through each journal and effectively dismantle it to look at what has been most popular, what has been the impact of things. It's a very, very good way of understanding what the audience out there is doing, what people and colleagues are, are interested in. So not surprisingly, the the top the top paper in uh, from the social impact uh, uh, metrics is the dark cultural heritage of volcanoes. Just a title like that will, will get it noticed, and that's something very very interesting for tweeting. Also, it's very important to remember that this, as in anything in social uh, uh, media, this can be completely manipulated by the author. So if the author sends things out there and gets things spread around with the DOI, then that will increase the rating. This is not necessarily just measuring a response of a public to, to the paper. It also will, will also represent, to a certain extent, the marketing of the paper. Interestingly, the second one, in, in this list here is about uh, geoethics and pantological heritage, which is a, a, a sort of an international group again there. It's a very, getting a very, very important issue these days with things like Burmese amber and things like that. People begin to, to realise and we've had, there's a whole vast history of, of colonialism and other things where Pantological heritage and other aspects of geological heritage has been exported to other countries and unfortunately that still continues so this is a really a, a, a statement about the significance and why we need to be more responsible and inclusive when we're actually studying what we study now one thing which is which is uh, very interesting about geoheritage is 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 the coverage and this really demonstrates how much of the plant is actually, actually interested these days. So I have two charts here, one for 2019 and one to 2021. And there are areas of, of the, the darker the color basically means the, the, the more papers. You see the massive production is, is in Spain and Italy. So, it, so that's the interesting thing. But also Brazil is very high. Uh, th as you will notice here, one one area which 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 is perhaps a concern, but but a concern, but also a challenge for the future is there's not a high level of representation in in Africa, and that's perhaps something we need to to think about promoting more because the Africa's geological heritage is, is absolutely incre in, in, incredible, uh, and there's no reason that this this these maps do not represent where the rocks are most interesting. They certainly do not. They do represent where people are, are are writing papers. So there are areas of the planet where we've not really got much description yet. It's also interesting. I mean, I've got a list here of of uh, sort of different contributors in different countries. 68 authors from 68 countries have now now sort of published in geoheritage but there is 73 countries covered that basically means because sometimes people are writing about countries which they're not actually based in although i have to say uh this is not the 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 the, the worrying prospect of the helicopter research people come in take the results go somewhere else a number of the colleagues writing the papers in the 68 countries might are likely to have originated in some of the other remaining five countries. It's just that now they're working somewhere else. The visits to the to to uh, to the sites as well are also quite revealing. Uh, Europe, high concentration, Asia Pacific, very much developing. That's China, basically, a lot of that's in China. The Americas are beginning to develop, but again, Africa is 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 quite low on that scale. So it's very clear that sort of people haven't really, uh, in many places, uh, are, have not really gra grasped the sort of the potential of of geological heritage for uh, as as a context for things like promoting tourism. This is a breakdown. I apologise; it's not updated to to uh, to twenty twenty one. I. Uh, or 2022 even I, I don't have all, all the information to hand at the moment but uh, 
these are the sort of topics which are included. The highest topics in there, the 47 and 55 at the beginning, are basically regional geology descriptive of particular sites. The 35 is also that. That's specifically to do with 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 fossils so those are the main descriptive of particular localities and features interestingly uh papers related to geotourism 45 there uh, in the period and um, sustainability in communities 39 so those really represent a, quite a significant proportion of the papers and then the other others you look at education geoparks urban geodiversity and integration with biodiversity so these are all important themes within the journal and some of this is not necessarily uh, within Progea's vision for the journal to start off with it's the way it has actually evolved the scope is very broad and it evolves so it is all aspects of geological heritage in all contexts and all the things you could possibly do with it and use it for but the one thing which is crucial in the world we live in today beyond science and geography can we actually uh, uh, as geologists and uh, uh, have a role in social and economic development. The tourism aspects say absolutely. Uh, but we can actually look at a journal like GeoHeritage uh, as an example. Uh, as of course, I say there are other journals out there, which I have, don't have all the information to analyze. So essentially, what is sustainability? Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. You'll see lots of definitions of sustainable development, but this is the fundamental one. It meets the needs of the present without prejudicing the future. That's fundamental. The whole concept has three pillars, economic, environmental and social. And you can see from the bubbles here how they overlap and where everything comes together, it's sustainable. United Nations have, have come up with 17 sustainable development goals. You think, why 17? Isn't that a strange number? But when you actually look at them, analyse them, and think about other aspects which might be beneficial for societies, everything fits into these. It's actually really quite interesting how it focuses down into about 17 boxes and not any further. So things like no poverty, zero hunger, responsible consumption, uh, life on land, life in the water, climate action, etc. So one can actually take a journal like Geological Heritage and things in the field and actually look at in what way do, do these publications, can they potentially support this sort of activity? So here is a general uh, paper here, looking up to, to uh, 2019. 55 papers in, 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 in uh, that period uh, related to geotourism, 27 to education, 18 to geoparks. Now I'll say a little bit more about what a geopark is in a minute because there's some important confusions there often. 39 on sustainability in communities. This is even before sustainability in, and communities became the big goal of UN, for instance, through these the, the sustainable development goals. Urban geodiversity strongly represented and also integration with biodiversity. So all these tick the boxes within the UN's goals. So the distribution of these papers, the studies and the impacts on the ground are actually materially sort of helping to improve the planet, at least I'd like to argue that. And 45% of the geoheritage papers up to this point, and I'm sure it's similar for other journals in the field, can potentially contribute to the goals. And occasionally Springer, uh, the commercial publisher we, we went with, uh, actually sort of makes sort of announcements about this as well, because obviously as a commercial company, it's very important to, to, to be seen and demonstrate that you are actually working towards broader societal goals. Now, one thing which is also crucial is supporting all types of geopark. And I do mean all types of geopark. The essential definition of a geopark or the principles of a geopark is an area of geological significance, rarity of beauty in which geological features play a significant part and where the geological heritage is protected and developed at the same time. Now, basically, the, the underlying theme is these shall foster socio-economic development that is culturally and environmentally sustainable. Like this, a geopark can have a considerable potential for economic development in rural and less developed areas. And papers published in GeoHeritage can provide 
a confirmation of the international scientific importance, which is now a, a, a key criteria for UNESCO for approval for uh, a global geopark. Geoheritage has got a broader scope of this. If you look at the maps here, uh, and I think this is a figure, I looked at the UNESCO website yesterday, so it said yesterday 169 geoparks in 44 countries. That was a 2021 figure. Geoheritage, of course, represents uh, 70, has 73 countries represented, so geoheritage has a broader perspective. Now, one thing which, which, which should not be confused is, uh, well, the UNESCO, they are UNESCO Global Geoparks. This is a, a, an international uh, movement promoting uh, sort of uh, quality, etc. There's a lot of tourism involved, but it's a very high level uh, uh, grouping. Many countries have national geoparks. There's absolutely no reason why one shouldn't have a national geopark and cause a, a, a geopark if it embraces these basic principles of socioeconomic development. You don't have to wait for UNESCO to approve it. You can get on and set up a geopark here and now. It can be of any size, from literally a bit of parkland with a few rocks to an in entire province, for instance. So long as the basic aims of the management are towards sustainable development uh, and, and working with communities and education, et cetera. It doesn't have to have UNESCO approval so one can start straight away and establish a national network in countries like Korea and Germany and, and sort of unofficially in, in Britain, there are nas national networks. It's interesting to have a few within the UNESCO network to, to provide exchange of ideas, but there's absolutely no reason why you can't have a functioning geopark uh, independent of the UNESCO network. But also beyond the UNESCO network, there's an, a lot of other things going on in geological heritage. There are various international groups and commissions now. So the, uh, the, the whole of the subject is developing the credit, some credibility and recognition. The most important uh, of the official organizations is the Geodiversity Specialist Group of the World Commission on Protected Areas, which is part of our UCN. And this is very much leading the way globally in promoting the inclusion of geological heritage in national and international conservation strategies. Most uh, countries who have any nature conservation system at all are affiliated with our UCN. Traditionally, these have been focused on nature, but through a series of motions, which I've, I've, I've listed some here, IUCN are now requiring countries to actually promote the geological aspects as well. So we have things like the uh, motion 89 from Marseille, uh, promoting key geodiversity areas as a complement to key biodiversity areas. So these are like effectively like geosites or combinations of, of, of geosites. Geological heritage sites which are protected and representing uh, some of the best aspects of geological heritage on the planet. Some of the more fundamental ones are, for instance, from 2008, which is just the, on the principles of conservation of geodiversity and geological heritage to get it written alongside everything else. The one from 2012, 5.048, they always have complicated numberings, is actually about establishing geological heritage within the IC, IUCN programs. And 6.083 from 2016 is also a very, very important aspect these days, which goes back to the whole aspects of, of movable heritage, uh, ethics. UNESCO has a, com a convention effectively in this field is about movable geological heritage, which is one of the most emotive and problematic of all, because unfortunately fossils and minerals uh, are commercially valuable and, uh, and there are international networks smuggling them around, it's, it's sad to say. Another organisation, uh, the International Commission on Geoheritage, is, is Commission of the International Union of Geological Sciences. Uh, it's now promoting the first 100 IUGS geological heritage sites or geosites. So these, this is a, essentially, essentially exactly the same thing as IUCN's key geodiversity areas and it's actually uh, picking up on some work by IUGS in the early 90s on global geosites which has dropped in preference for geoparks. 
So hopefully the IUGS and the IUCN will come together and they'll produce an integrated approach because IUCN has the power and the influence in the nature conservation world. IUGS has uh, the reservoir of geological expertise to actually inform that process. So basically the two organisations have to collaborate. Pro-Geo, uh, of which Geo Heritage is, is its, its uh, sort of publication, is very, very important uh, in all of this. Its origins go back to 1988, so it was one of the originators of the whole concept of geological heritage and geological heritage uh, conservation and, and promoting it internationally. It's independent of government. IUCN and IEGS are not completely independent of governments. Pro-G areas, so it is, it is the global leader and it is in a position to campaign in the way other organisations uh, can't. And uh, I have to do this, I have to promote Progeo. It's for, I think the membership is 25 euros uh, a year and you get Geo Heritage as part of your membership. Uh, it's a very important organization. It's now developing a, a, a worldwide uh, sort of uh, uh, representation and be really, really good to have sort of a, a group developing in South Africa to, uh, and Africa in general to, to promote the, the, the aims and perspectives and needs of the continent and also hopefully with collaboration and support. So, conclusions so far, because of course the things will go on. Geoheritage is now established as the most successful and influential journal in the field. Okay, it was the first. And its success has certainly stimulated the establishment of several other journals in the field in recent years. And many other journals, more conventional geological journals, are also accepting publications in the discipline. These represent developments, uh, sort of global trends, and the transition from uh, a subject historically strongly associated with exploitation of the planet. And in Britain, apparently, less students are applying for geology because they don't want to be seen to destroying, be destroying things, oil, coal, etc. A transition from something from exploitation, so something more fundamental to the sustainable future of all societies. And crucially, in academics and institutions they work for are increasingly becoming required by national research funding organisations to demonstrate that they are aware or developing these things. Crucially, as GeoHeritage is managed through ProGeo, uh, the world's leading NGO in the field, its primary aim remains to promote the policy and practice of the discipline, independent of purely commercial ambitions or, or governmental influence. In fact, the, the copyright of all papers published in GeoHeritage belongs to, to ProGeo, it's not being passed to any commercial company. So it, it's very important. ProGeo remains in the position to actually sort of control and manage uh, the journal beyond what other constraints may be sort of directed. The cumulative wisdom and experience now packed within 12 years GeoHeritage means it has many functions. For instance, as a methodological reference source, a manual of good practice, a showcase for new developments and a vehicle through which to influence government decision makers, including helping meet the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And as such, you can actually argue that GeoHeritage and other journals in the field and scientific publishing in geological heritage and conservation have now become a key tool for promoting the conservation and sustainable management of the Earth's geological resources for the benefit of all societies. And I think this is where, where things have changed in, in the past, I know, probably five, six years. Rather than being an appendix, the geological publishing is now promoting the subject. And we see this with the proliferation of new journals and, and publishing. So I would argue, going back to uh, my title slide, that scientific publishing is at all for geological heritage conservation and sustainable development. Thanks very much indeed. Okay. How many pro-geo members in South Africa? Uh, thanks, John, for putting me on the spot. Uh, uh, <laughs> I haven't been gone for a long time. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't actually know, uh, actually. We are, are the secretary uh, of, of, of pro-geo uh, always provides us breakdowns, but we don't 
I don't think we have a very clear breakdown of, of members uh, outside of Europe because there are various national groups within Europe. Uh, but we don't, I don't think we have those figures. I need to ask that question. So I will investigate. I, Kevin. I, Hi, John. Uh, Hi, <laughs> welcome. Thanks for your talk. That was really, really interesting. Look, I think the, the answer is zero. Um, mm -hmm. th there are members in India, in Australia, in China, all the way across Europe, of course, in South America, North America, Southern Africa, zero. Uh, there are members in Morocco mm -hmm. and some other countries up, up in the north, I believe, but mm. there's no one in South Africa, as far as I know. Yeah, but the, I think there are probably at least, uh, I haven't got my figures in front of me, how many authors have we got from South Africa? So we've got uh, a number of papers in GeoHeritage, but not actual members. Um, and it'd be, be really nice if, if people could actually consider that and help or build this this global movement, which we, which we have now, be really great. Thanks so much, Kevin. I think we'll um, leave it leave it there okay. and move on to um, our next speaker, Cameron Penn Clark. So good morning, and thank you, Nolene, for all your organising, and especially to Matt Mullins for inviting me to take part in in the conference. Um, it's an absolute privilege, and I'm thrilled to be here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about FAGASA, um, which is the Field Guides Association of Southern Africa, and a little exciting, well, not so little, an exciting project that we're working with, um, with Tacoma Strategies for a Geology Guide scoping that FAGASA is um, assisting to develop. Okay, so just a brief overview of, of what we're all about and how we came into being. Guides got together 30 years ago. Um, and decided that it would be a good idea to set standards for field guides. Um, and we're talking specifically about the safari sector. So that's where Fagasa originated um, in about 1990. A small group of guides got together. There was no standard. There was no scoping. There were no qualifications for guides. And so they started the process. Um, and so we've been going for all these years, um, and we've now expanded into various qualifications. Um, so basically, we run as an association. So for any guide to be able to do one of our qualifications, you join the association. It's our way of keeping the community together. And obviously, from a funding perspective, um, that's how we fund it. They pay an annual fee, a small sub fee, to, for us to be able to do admin on their qualifications. Um, so we basically set the, the standard for guides in the industry and also a high level of professionalism. And FAGASA focuses on promoting um, a very high standard of guiding um, to make sure that guides are qualified out in the field and have the necessary skills for the tourism industry. We're well known, highly regarded and respected all over the world. We operate mainly in Southern Africa, um, mainly in South Africa. The hub of guides is in the, in the Lofelt region, the, the Limpopo and Pumalanga region around the Kruger area, but we expand into all provinces, into Namibia, Botswana, Tanzania, um, and we're making our way slowly up into Africa. Um, so that's quite exciting from a Fagasa perspective. Um, we, we are made up with, of various members and um, stakeholders that form part of the organization. It's our guides. It's anyone that's in a nature enthusiast that wants to do one of our courses but not guide. Um, tourism industry establishments, lodges, reserves, tourism products, um, and then our training providers and assessors. So training providers and assessors are endorsed by us to deliver the training on our behalf. We registered with CATSITA um, as a non-profit company. This is just to give you an overview of the FAGASA training providers, just to show you the extent of where we are. Um, and we basically situated all over Southern Africa. And uh, if you're a FAGASA endorsed training provider, you basically train our qualifications using our materials, et cetera, our assessors. So that's how we operate. We've got three sort of categories. We've got guiding courses, non-guiding courses, 
and junior Vagasa courses. Our non-guiding courses are for anyone that's a nature enthusiast, so anyone that loves to go into nature, that wants to learn more, that needs to gain knowledge, um, we offer those courses to those individuals. Our junior Fagasa, which we recently relaunched, we have a pangolin course and a nature ambassador course. The pangolin course is for the junior school ages and the nature ambassador are for senior school. And the idea here is to just ignite that passion for nature in school going learners at an early age, expose them to what Fagasa is about or expose them to the knowledge of what the bush is about. And when they get to matric, and they need to go into the world, we hope that they go into the world um, living sustainably and making a difference in conservation and tourism. And then looking at our guiding qualifications, we've got three categories. We've got nature guides, culture guides, and national tourist guides. Looking at our nature guides, this is our bread and butter of Fagasa, and this is where we have the most membership. We are operating in areas where we've got reserves, natural areas, lodges, and we're mainly talking about the safari industry here, where we have apprentice field guides. These are your vehicle-based guides. So these are the guides that are taking local and international tourists um, on experiences in reserves, where you have your guide, they're staying at a lodge, and they're exposed to those experiences. And those qualifications work from an apprentice level right up to an SKS level, and that stands for Special Knowledge and Skills. And to just give you an indication of the timeline here, when you're doing these qualifications, you move from apprentice field guide to professional field guide, you're talking at about sort of a 10, 15 year career here to get to that high level. And then guides also have the choice to go and be walking guides, which is becoming increasingly popular. Um, guests are looking for a wildlife primitive trail, they're looking for those experiences in nature where um, you're on foot. And so we have a whole series of qualifications that um, appeal to this market. And there again, you've got trails guides, professional trails guides, and special knowledge skills, dangerous game. And these are the guides that are walking on foot in dangerous game areas um, where you're sleeping out on a trail, or you may not be sleeping out, you might even just be on foot for a day or a few hours. So those are those qualifications. And then we also take, um, uh, uh, we've got a big sector in the marine guide market, um, a lot in uh, KwaZulu-Natal, Western Cape, um, where we've got marine guide qualifications and we've got um, a lot of providers in those areas as well. Um, we're also doing a lot of development on marine guide to also look at possibly incorporating the water activities because at the moment we're dealing with shoreline only. Then we go to specialist qualifications. So once you get to the highest level of Fagasa at an SKS level, um, we've got specialist qualifications, for example, wildflowers, birding, we've got local, local birding guides, we've got national birding guides, we've got national biomes, we've got astronomy, we're also looking at uh, currently developing in the higher education sector. Um, currently, Fagasa is scoped with CATSITA, so that is at a skills level. We're also developing um, a higher diploma in education um, for field guiding. So that's very exciting for us. And the reason for that is that a lot of guides um, are wanting to, to, to have a, a more substantial qualification. So this would be the first of its kind, and uh, so we're busy with that. We're hoping that in the next two years, it is a long process, that we'll be able to offer that for guides as well. We also have tracker qualifications that we are developing. In the industry, uh, we have a lot of uh, trackers that are very highly qualified, um, and we're hoping to, to bring in another qualification where we can have a bridging qualification to field guide status where we can give them the skills necessary that if they wanted to, they could move from a tracker into a field guide um, qualification. And this will help us to address um, transformation more, um, to prioritize transformation, um, which Fogas is working very hard on. So we're also busy with um, developing um, tracker qualifications at a higher level. And then the most exciting, which uh, 
is of the interest of the audience today is the geology specialist. A couple of years ago, um, I was approached by Matt uh, Mullins from Tacoma Strategies um, to look at possibly uh, bringing a geology qualification into the mix. Um, and so we embarked on a journey of, of, of looking at what our options were. Um, and uh, the first option was to look at a specialist qualification as a start. So that means for any current Fogasa guide, giving them the option to specialize in geology. So that is the first option. And the second option is to look at a long-term project where we actually scope as a standalone geology guide. So we're busy pursuing both options. So we started with a pilot project in the Eastern Cape, um, the Geo Heritage Pilot Project. And uh, because Matt is from the Eastern Cape um, and he's got his roots there and Rhodes University came on board and all the wonderful professors and geology specialists down there got together, Matt coordinated it um, and put together a pilot project with the Kariha Game Reserve. And uh, the idea there was to start small with Kariha to develop the geology guide at that point. And the bigger idea here is to then take every region and duplicate the project. So we're hoping then to move forward now to the next region, which, be, which would be the Kruger region, and so on, tackle the rest of, of South Africa. Uh, Matt's already, well, the project has now already produced a comprehensive geological field guide to Kariha. Um, that was done um, in 2020, um, and that comprises a full a geology manual, Fogasa manual, with the assessments that go with it, with the workbooks. Um, and so that's where we are on, the, on that project. So our next challenge now is to, to go one step further to, to create um, a, a group of assessors um, because every Fogasa qualification that we have has a Fogasa training provider and it has assessors that, are, that can assess that qualification. So that's the next step is to develop that part of, of the project and to upskill and identify assessors in the Eastern Cape that can assist with this. And then, as I said before, move it on to, to the next provinces. Um, at the same time that we're doing all of this, um, there's also an app that is in the process of being developed. And uh, Cameron, thank you for your in-depth um, presentation of what you are doing. Um, I'm not too sure of the details of our app, but it might be appropriate to, to get chatting to see if there's any synergies there. But I do know that we already have um, funding to develop an app for the guide that's going to go out. And a lot of work has been done in the Eastern Cape already. The geologists have gone out into Kariha. They've, they've, they've marked all the geological sites on Kariha and they've put together all the information that goes into this app. So it would be a great tool for guides. And someone mentioned earlier, you know, how do we, how do we make it simple and how do we make it um, easy for guests to understand? And that's definitely the focus of this geology project is how do you give the, geolo the geology guide the tools to explain the geological processes and, and all the sites and what can be seen um, um, whilst they're out in the field. And I think there's, it's, it's, it's super exciting for, for, for the app development to be able to give us that tool. So just to sum that up, um, the long-term um, goal of, of Fugasa and with, um, with the Tacoma strategies is to actually scope for a geology guide. So that would be a national accredited qualification um, that we would scope for and it would be a standalone qualification. As far as I know, it's never been done before. So this is groundbreaking for us. And um, currently, all the skills programs are being rescoped with CATSITA and with the QCTO and with SACWA. Um, and so we are in the perfect position right now to submit this scoping in the next couple of years. Um, and then we would fall in the um, occupational sector. So geology guide, we hope to see in that occupational sector.
Obviously, the impact is going to be massive, you know, looking at um, how do we bring guides in or prospective guides in to, to become geology guides, um, um, looking at geotourism, looking at communities on borders of where there are significant geological sites, looking at geotourism, how do we blend all of this together to make it effective? to train the guides on the ground, to be able to take internationals, locals on these geology um, experiences. Um, we need to target the youth that live on, in these areas. We need to train them. We need to upskill them. We need to educate them and with a long-term goal of, of, of job creation. Um, so we're very, very excited about this. And I'm sure you can all see the impact of this is massive. I know geotourism is massive in the rest of the world. Um, I don't know too much that it's uh, massive in South Africa. Uh, we could create geoparks, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Fagas is very excited to be part of this project. And going a step further, you know, once we've got the guides in place, we obviously have the assessors in place. It then creates other business opportunities for training providers. We could then have geology schools where we could train these geology guides um, with our own training providers and our own assessors. Fogasa works very much on a mentorship basis. So anybody that we train has a mentor out in the field. Um, so it's, it's, it's a massive project, but uh, very, very exciting. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for listening to me. And uh, I hope more people become involved. If you're interested, let us know. And uh, we would be very excited to show you the final product when we do put it out there. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Michelle. Um, we've got a, quite a bit of time for questions, so we can open the floor to questions right now. And okay, Michelle, John Rogers here. I gave, I gave a talk on a book that I've written, which I'll show you now. Um, but I had to wait for a talk on fires followed by a talk on bees. So you're very diverse. Michelle, it's Craig here. Um, can you or Matt uh, put kind of a financial number on what it, what it costs to, to do uh, to to get to a couple of field guides in a, in a, working in a park uh, like the one you've done? Are we talking a couple hundred thousand rands here for the for the putting um, the program together? Yes, Craig. So in terms of what is needed, it's 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 basically funding to to develop the the materials. Um, to, uh, that's where we kind of are at at the moment. It's because Fogasa, the strength of Fogasa is that we develop all our own manuals um, and workbooks. Um, so that has been a big chunk of this project. Um, the next chunk of the project is, is the app side. Um, and then it's the delivery. Um, we need funding to be able to get the geology specialists together to get the trainers together so that we can then impart that knowledge onto the trainers. Um, I can't give you the exact numbers. I think that um, we would be very happy to put a, a, a presentation together for you on that um, in terms of, the, of what funding is required. But for the, for the end user, for the guide that's wanting to become a guide, the costs are very low from a Fogasa perspective. It's basically, um, as a nonprofit company, we basically you know, make the books available um, and you can study that way. Um, but the long-term goal is to have a training academy to train geology guides. And obviously that's another, another um, you know, level of, of funding. I hope I answered your question. Hi, thank you. Uh, more a comment than a question. Uh, due to the politics of numbers, um, some universities are churning out third-year geologists in large numbers, and they're not cracking the nod to honours. So they, they don't have a professional qualification, but they've got the basic degree. And they, they're they unemployed. They really, really battle to find jobs. So there are dozens, if not hundreds, of unemployed third-year geologists out there that would probably grab any opportunity like this, and they've really got the fundamentals of the geology behind them. So just an untapped market there. Yeah, Debbie, thank you. That's a valid point. Um, that would be a perfect pool to, to sort of propose to them that they come into this project to, to actually train as guides, so to train as guides as a start, but to get to that assessment 
level where they could help us ass assess and also train. I mean, it's a perfect opportunity. So thank you for that information. Um, yeah, I just want to um, continue the, the, the discussion from the, the previous um, questioner's uh, point of view. Um, I was just thinking of the Eastern Cape and uh, places like uh, Fort Hare, where, um, as was mentioned, the, there are a lot of uh, third-year graduates who are not necessarily going to find jobs or, or get into honours. And uh, there is a huge uh, potential market out there of, of geology graduates. So um, instead of trying to train um, existing guides in geology, what about training geology graduates in, in, uh, in, guiding, uh, in, in becoming guides? Um, and that's, you know, I think yeah, having uh, given some lectures at uh, places like... Uh, like um, Fort Hare, I know that there are a lot of the student population there are, are locally, uh, come from local communities and are from very poor communities and they all need jobs, but uh, there are very few jobs in the mining industry in the Eastern Cape. So uh, geotourism might be a, a good venue for, for them to, to get into. Yes, thank you, Sharad. That's a good point. And that's exactly the, the impact we do want to have is to create jobs. Um, and it does make sense to take the geologists who already have the, the, the knowledge um, yeah. and give them the guiding skills. Yeah. Um, and the idea is to really look at the local points of where the geology exists. And as I said, you know, we did a pilot project in the Eastern Cape. Um, but it's, it's, you know, the long-term vision would be out of the reserves. Let's even see what are out of the reserves, the traditional, um, I'm talking safari reserves um, in this context. Um, but look at other reserves and other nature points um, in, in specific areas where you've got unemployed geologists. Let's see how we can train them up. Absolutely, it's, it's this, it's, it, there, has, there is massive potential for this. Um, and the ideal um, scenario, the end goal would be to have a, 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 a training academy that we can, you know, that we can um, assist and get these, these guides through there or a facility, it doesn't even have to be an academy, we could make use of existing infrastructure. So thank you, I'm definitely going to pursue all of these suggestions. All right, so I'm speaking on geoheritage, <clears throat> and at the age of 77, I'm talking about geolegacy as well, and I'm reading Morris Fulhune's book on the Kruger Park area, which is a good legacy for Morris. So this will be in the Western Cape, <clears throat> with a focus on uh, what's called Robin Island uh, Museum. So this is a book that I've written, <laughs> published by the Council for Geoscience. It came out in 2018, and uh, just 400 copies were printed at the end of the year. Another 400 were printed, and it's almost sold out. So I'm very interested to ask Cameron afterwards whether I can put my book onto Geo Odyssey. Um, so <clears throat> uh, so there, there's the title of it there. And it's basically a very thorough book, which I described in the detail in the abstract, uh, including a very good glossary, GPS positions for 300 photographs. I think this could be a training manual uh, for, for Gaza. Uh, George Smith, uh, who was for so an exploration manager for Sukho, he and I were commissioned to write around the Tank Wukuru National Park. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, took a while to come out, but uh, it has sold very, very well. A thousand were printed and another thousand have been reprinted. And lots of people tell me I should read my book because they find it in the Karoo National Park. So focusing on uh, where we are now, I'll, I'll start with Chapman's Big Drive, which Cameron's also touched on. And then I'll talk about uh, Robin Island. And you can see the oldest rocks of the Tigerberg Formation of the Malmesbury Group at 560 million years old. The Cape Granite intruded it, mainly seen at the sea point contact about 540 million years old, and then the Table Mountain Group on top, the base of which is 520. So it's quite a nice thing to remember, 560, 540, 520. I always like to use a timeline with a five meter tape, and I use one millimeter per million years, and I tell my audiences they're all in the last millimeter. So there's the um, Geological Society's uh, geological map, it's a bit finer detail, uh, but you're more quite familiar with that, I think, by now. We'll start at Chapman's Big Drive, down in the south there. So <laughs> this is Fiona behind the oblique aerial shot of uh, Table Mountain Group, as Cameron also showed. So what you can see here is the Cape Granite overlain by the Table Mountain Group, intruded by early Cretaceous uh, Dolerite Dyke. <clears throat> and the plaque that I'll talk about is just above the D 
of Dolorite. And you can also see the whole block is tilted slightly downhill. The road is built by the civil engineers in, 19, in 2022, exactly 100 years ago. And they, they ran it along the nonconformity because the granite is very hard. The peninsula formation is a very tough sandstone, but the combination <coughs> of the graphite formations, mudstones and sandstones, was much easier to work with. If you look at the, uh, the website for Chapman's Peak Drive, which you can see on your screen, <coughs> this, they're gearing up for the centenary on the 6th of May, which happens to be my birthday. And they put out two new videos. One is just a drone footage for two minutes going from south to north with a bit of music in the background. The six minute one includes four interviews. So it's their geotechnical engineer, their manager, their environmental person, and myself. And I end up talking about the new plot that we erected before COVID struck everybody down. Uh, uh, just above that D of Dollarite dike. So these are pictures that uh, Michael McCutcheon of the Council of Geoscience uh, provided to me. <coughs> the left-hand Dollarite dike is on the northern side, which you've already seen. There's another one down to the south. Uh, but his claim to fame uh, with his colleagues is that Wilhelm von Sale did an MSC uh, on the area from Hart Bay to uh, Greenpoint. Mike did his MSC on the Hart Bay area. Haley did her PhD off Mossel Bay, and they're all supervised by John Compton to a very high standard. <clears throat> this is what Mike was doing amongst other things. So he was doing marine geology, he's a marine geologist like myself, and with magnetometry, you take advantage of the magnetite and dolerite, and you can map the dolerites in what's called the False Bay Dolerite Dike Swarm, which I will also show you at um, Robin Island. So here we are on our more our geo heritage thing. This is Len Gardner on the right. There's a Nurtuk just around the corner of the Chapman's Peak Drive with the contractors putting in our new uh, Geological Society plaque. We originally had it further down, actually on the road, but the, 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 when the road was closed for years because of rock falls uh, and, the, and catch nets were put in, and gabions, then the whole, the, they, actually, they actually lost our plaque. So we put a new plaque up and uh, <coughs> the Afrikaners voted for English I voted for bilingual and, uh, and uh, I lost the Afrikaners one. Now it's only in English. Uh, but you can see it gives a little bit more room for a text. Um, I provided a photograph to Hayley Cawthor, who you saw just now, and then she did this very nice um, line drawing. And then as Cameron's has shown you, uh, Wendy Taylor and Cameron have worked on this website of ours, uh, GSSAWC Western Cape, and you can see finer detail, lots and lots of photographs and more text. Then what I'm now moving on to is a different uh, line. This is the Calypso uh, Ferry, and uh, I, it's owned by a man called uh, Ken Evans, who I was in the Navy with uh, in the 1960s before you were all born. And there it is ready for going out to sea. And there's Ken Evans uh, on, the, on the bridge. He goes out every day. He claims uh, in, in a good year before COVID, they got up to 300,000 passengers a year. And he has been trained by me to uh, explain the geology with his staff every single day, uh, whether they're listening or not. But he, he, he's doing his thing. He's done this for several decades. So he is passing on to the people the geology of that area. On a, on a little adventure, they're going off to Chapman's Big Drive first and the Seal Island, the Doka Island afterwards. <clears throat> then moving to uh, Robin Island, I, I gave a geological walking tour of Robin Island. Uh, just for a morning uh, during 35 IGC. And then they had this lovely idea, again, this word legacy, that they would use the money instead of having a, an, ex an adventure for a day for people who've gone, have something that will stand the test of time. And mine came out the following year, 2017, because it was the shortest one. So mine's already out. And as I told you, I'm now currently reading Morris Fulluins, which came out in 20. So what I've done here. I've actually asked the people at Robert Island, I've been visiting for many years, as I'll explain to just now, uh, I would like to train the, um, the tour guides that they have. And I've started that process and, and I, I persuaded them to buy one of these walking guides, walking tour guides for each one of about 20 um, tour guides on the island. Because they're already doing, they're already explaining everything except geology. And they're actually also now initiating walking tours, which I, I pioneered. 
and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really getting going on that right now. First doing a lecture, and then I give a, I'm going to give a field trip on the island. This is, this is, a, this is one of the tour guides, my best one, called Ken Tsupe. And Ken Tsupe and I get on very, very well, and we often have done tours together. I do the geology of the, the, the fundamental history of the island, <clears throat> and then he does the uh, historical stuff in the village and, and, and the quarries. And it, it works very, very well. So encouraged by this nice experience with Ken Tsupe, I want to do it to the whole group. Uh, this is a little map showing the, the geology between Cape Town and Robben Island. It's mainly done by Mike Woodpool, my first honor student in 1982. And there you can see the, the geology on shore you've seen already. And uh, <clears throat> there's a basically a north-northwest trend of the Malmesbury group under Table Bay leading down to the sea point contact, which of course is world famous and was visited by Charles Darwin in 1836. Always like to tell people. So back to my good friends of the Council of Geoscience, who are basically marine geologists like myself, but they are diving geologists as well. Very, very au fait with the state of the art equipment they've got. And this is their version of the same thing that Mike, <coughs> Mike Woodward did all those uh, years ago. So there, down at the bottom left, you can see Banji Bay, the pink for the granite, and the rest to the north of that is the Mount Rico. You can also see <coughs> the Ridge Bay there, there's a, a valley, uh, of, uh, a little paleo valley of a river that was going out to the coast because every time there was a sea level lowering during a hypothermal and glacial, uh, the coastline moved well to the west of Robben Island and, and Table Bay was a dune field. So it's quite a lot of water, uh, sediment between Robben Island and Dubuque Strand because it's wave sheltered from the southwesterly um, swells. And this is from John Compton's book, who supervised those three people I mentioned. Very famous book, The Rocks and Mountains of Cape Town, came out in 2004. He's saying, well, when sea level was higher in the late tertiary, you could, you could go through from, from what is now False Bay, the three round, past Rondebosch and Newlands, where I live, to, to Table Bay. So in other words, there was, a, there was a higher sea level. But most of the time <clears throat> during the quaternary of the last two and a half million years or so, the sea level was really low and False Bay and Table Bay were dune fields. So thing, things, things change all the time. And then the most recent um, interglacial was about 120,000 years ago. You see bottom right there. And then it went down, down, down to 20,000 years ago, the last glacial maximum the big hypothermal instead of the hyperthermal, and then rapidly came up about 10,000 years ago to the Holocene. <clears throat> and it, it's quite a thought, which I tell public talks all the time. I gave about 25 public talks about my, my book before COVID. Uh, the whole of human history is in that last little bit, the last 10,000 years, which gives us a bit of, makes us a bit humble, I think. Okay, so here we are looking at uh, a bleak photograph by Mark Skinner, a postcard man in Cape Town, a very good photographer. And you can see on the bottom right, ferry going out, ferry coming back. They're going backwards and forwards all the time. So possibly <coughs> they've estimated about, uh, in a good year, about 200,000 tourists go backwards and forwards to Robben Island. Uh, but they're not covering the geology, and I've, I've been trying to counter that for, for several years now. So there's the Greenpoint headland. You can also see that time of a higher sea level. It's a wave cut platform with the soccer stadium on it now and a swell coming in from the southwest, uh, very high energy coastline. Fog orthogonals being perpendicular to the swell front. So a nice aerial shot of the whole um, <clears throat> bay. You come out to Murray's Harbour, tacked to the groins, a little beach to the south of it because the sand gets, gets driven by the swell. Uh, from south to north on the sheltered, the waves, the swell sheltered uh, eastern coast. And as, and as you can see, there's much more surf on the, on the west coast there, with swell coming in from the southwest, from the southern ocean. I always talk about the roaring 40s, the furious 50s, and the, and the screaming 60s all over the horizon, but sending their swells through. And this is, this is a Gerald Hoberman, very famous uh, man, photographer, which shows you that at a, at a low tide, <coughs> the Malmesbury group's Tigerberg formation is intensely folded uh, along axes to the north, 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 northwest. In practice, when, what we do, <coughs> we, we go out 
um, I'll show you, I'll go out with the friends of the Zico Museum. We, we go out in the afternoon and then we um, do a little bit of exploring. Then we spend the night in a convict prison south of the harbour. And then I walk them around the next morning after breakfast, in the, only in the southern part. And that's as much as you can really do. Uh, and the northern part is much more, they're much more protective because of seabirds uh, nesting. So here you have the swell, which I've touched on before. You can see the Table Bay Harbour is very swell sheltered because of refraction and diffraction of the swells. And the same goes for the swell sheltered east coast of uh, Robin Island. So here's the ferry going out day after day, and uh, they really work hard. And uh, it's uh, they've had ups and downs, but this is now the current set of set up. And so 300 people every single voyage. Now, I used to work on the university's research vessel, and we could take about 20 people on board. And I've done a lot of sea time in my life, but I didn't go to sea with 300. Uh, this is a 2004 photograph uh, where we took uh, three students to do honours project on Robin Island. So I took Albertina Nakasholi, a bamboo lady from northern Namibia. Uh, Hartwig Frimmel took a Dawadapo Mongula, a Damara lady from Namibia. And uh, my, other one, my other one was from Zilium Kizi, uh, a Zulu lady who's now working at Middleburg Coal Mine. And they, they really had a good we, we went out for free on the workers' ferry. Uh, here's my grandson showing you how windy it can be uh, and the soil very powerful in between the soil sheltered Robin Island and the soil sheltered um, harbour. And you can see now how sheltered it is between the East Coast and Bloberg with the uh, oyster catcher and the, and the ferry for scale there. Oyster catchers are very protected there. This is the best book on the island given to me by my son, by the journalist Charlene Smith, and I really thoroughly recommend it uh, for the historical part, and, and I, I recommend my book for the geological part. Uh, and this is, this is an ancient airline, but it gives a very nice uh, depiction of the island from a particular angle. Um, <clears throat> the lime quarry, which has got quaternary material, and the Fenrivia quarry, which has got the late Proterozoic siltstones of the Tigerberg formation of the, of the Malmesbury group. So that's mainly where we focus our attention. A little map showing the beach and the harbour where we start. <clears throat> the, air, the, the airfield where Nelson Mandela was flown in and the quarry at the bottom. And there's a little road across the island in the south there, past the lighthouse. So we don't, we only touch about um, less than a quarter of the island. The whole island itself, by the way, has been mapped by my colleague at GCT, Christy Rowe, who's now a, kind of, a Californian lady who lives in Toronto. So she and her postgrad students did a very nice paper in the the South African Journal of Geology. Uh, now, this is the main thing I want to focus on, is that I, I was asked um, to take a group of friends of Ezekiel Museum uh, to the island. These people pay about a thousand rand, and they come overnight to stay overnight in the convict prison. So we go to jail for the night, and I do a little bit in the afternoon, and then I, I focus the uh, next morning. And they all absolutely love it, and I did it. So I did before COVID. I did it t seven times in July each year. So there you can see it's quite a happy bunch. So it's men and women, young and old, sometimes children, and the, the lady in the blue and white is my wife. So here's a, an update now. We we in the in the um, geohistory subcommittee tried to get her. Actually, we were commissioned to do a, a geosite for Robin Island by the head of the Council of Geosites. So we put a lot of work into it when Jody Miller of Selenbosch was in charge. And the, and the, and the, the Council of Geosites CEO, CEO said, mm, didn't like it. So the whole thing stalled. This is before we had a website. So this is put together by um, Michael McCutcheon, who did his MSc on, on, on Hart Bay. You can see a nice little wreck on the bottom right-hand corner. A lot of detail. Every now and again at low tide, they scraped the bottom of the ferry. So Mike McCutcheon and his team did a very, very detailed side scan sonar map of the whole harbour, particularly of the troublesome entrance. Close up, you can see is, is the modern uh, multi-beam side scan, bathymetry and side scan can give you very, very fine detail of the Tiger Book Formation. Siltstone, 
all the strata there, there's that north-northwest trend, and then the swell comes around, it's refracted and diffracted around Robben Island to the north, moving to the south, and those are what we call mega ripples. Though you can't see tiny ripples, but you can see mega ripples with a wavelength of about uh, one meter. So it's really beautiful material, and I'm so glad I've lived long enough to see the quality. Once you get off the ferry, then you go into the, uh, walking along beside the harbor wall, and here you can see some of the best outcrops of the Tigerberg Formation, uh, out of, uh, not in situ, obviously, but the, as you can see it's a, it's a laminated siltstone, and it's, a, it's got all sorts of sedimentary structures, uh, which are very interesting, but out of context here. But it's, it's a nice thing to have the geology in your face as you arrive. If you go to the political prison, however, right outside the political prison, they've got these most unusual signs. So these signs are made of the siltstone, and they, they will never rust. They are just perfect. So they actually use geology for their signs. In this particular case, it shows you uh, the darker claystone and the lighter siltstone, um, sometimes sandstone, and there's a, a lot of <coughs> loading, sediment loading, and you can see my arrow points down, so, that, so you can see that, that this thing, because the gravity brings the turbidites down, uh, then this, this, whole, this whole sign geologically is the right way up, which of course we're very fussy about, it doesn't, they don't care, but we care. So there's deep sea salt stones on the right way up, right outside the political prison. I've never seen signs like this, and I, they, they, didn't, they, they just did it, and it was a brilliant move. Uh, this is Nelson Mandela's cell on the right-hand side here, and you can see lots of more Tiger Book formation siltstone. Uh, this is my favorite tour guide, Mr. Ndondo Bata. I'm worried about them because now, as time goes on, I've been going many, many years, you see they, 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 they're, they're starting to retire or die. But he is very, very good. Uh, <coughs> the, 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 the problem geologically for the Tigerberg Formation is it's late Proterozoic, it's just before body fossils came in. And this is a very, very rare outcrop of what I'm interpreting as, as worm burrows. Um, so there was, there was life, but no skeletons. Then to stand back a little bit, uh, every, every day except Sunday, the noon gun is, is fired on the top of Signal Hill, the red flag for danger. And, it's, and, the, and the sound travels all the way from Signal Hill to, to Robin Island. So here we are having a bit of fun with the Ezeko uh, people, seeing that the puff of smoke can be seen instantly because light travels at 300 million meters a second. But it takes the, the man, the, the third man from the right there is a local Cape Talk uh, producer, uh, Bruce Hong, and he, he's timing on his smartphone how long it took. And with a velocity of sound of only 340 meters per second, it takes 35 seconds for the sound to come across 12 kilometers of Table Bay. And they, 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 they like that. They, where we're standing is beside the Front Reef Quarry, <coughs> south of the lighthouse on the southern shore of the island. And here you can see our best outcrop, <coughs> which is of a, 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 a sand ripple, you know, but it's a turbidite sand ripple, and uh, it's in deep water, showing that the water was moving from, from southeast. Uh, to northwest. This was taken by a lady on my 35 RTC trip in 2016. There I am <clears throat> doing my thing, photograph taken by Bruce Hong and his brother with a funny hat on there, and they were right in the quarry. So the quarry is actually the best outcrop. The coastal outcrops are not as good. They're wet, they're full of kelp, and uh, they just don't show the detail that you can see in the quarry. So they did us a favor. Then there's this strange uh, thing here, a, a rippled siltstone, and, uh, and there's actually a very, very gentle anticline, a very, very gentle silk syncline. And there's a bigger one in Signal Hill, there's smaller ones in Bloberg Strand. So they, there's a little bit of folding in the, in the Tigerberg Formation. So there's this, but in finer detail, that's what it looks like. The close up <coughs> worked out, it's actually a turbidite from a very, very dense sediment rich um, suspension at the bottom of the deep sea. The turbidity current. So you can, I've got references for that. In, in my book, by the way, besides a very detailed uh, glossary, I've also got a very, very uh, detailed bibliography uh, so that anybody wants to 
run field trips, they can do it and there's GPS positions for the photographs so they can find the out. Hey, John, I'll give yes. you a five-minute five warning, please. You might, I need that. I'm nearly finished. Okay, that's another picture of the current trip, okay. but more less bleak. Um, so you can see this. It's a, but, uh, what I need to tell you is that the outcrops of the Tigerberg Formation on the in, on Robben Island are far superior to anything on land. There's nothing like it on the Cape Peninsula. The quality is very good. I included about a dozen uh, photomicrographs. So here's a the quartz silstone showing you how fine the uh, Tigerberg Formation is. And then later, you get secondary uh, pyrite cubes sitting down at the bottom of a stagnant uh, Adamastor Ocean, the ocean that preceded the very young current uh, South Atlantic Ocean, which is only 130 million years old. And then here you have the um, dolerite dikes that you, same sort of thing you saw at Hart Bay, the same team from the Council of Geoscience across the whole of um, Table Bay going into Clifton Dikes. And then in the top left there is one coming into what we call Lung Bay. Uh, there it is there in finer detail. And that's what Lung Bay looks like um, today. We have our lunch there with the museum people. So it's a differential weathering. And the younger one, 30 million year old dolerite, but it's more easily the tough quartz rich siltstones of the 560 million year old tiger boat formation. And then one of the museum people actually showed me this. It's very difficult to see in a marine environment what's going on. And here's tiny little dikelets intruding into the siltstones. And then finishing off with some limestones uh, on top of the, of the tiger boat formation siltstone, this is a cow creek capped Shelley Beach in the Van Riebeek uh, quarry. So there's a very big time gap between the 560 million year old Tigerberg formation and then the, uh, the Cow Creek capped Shelley Beach, which is less than a million years old. In fact, it's probably about uh, 200,000 years old. And then and, uh, here, uh, just around the corner, closer to the lighthouse, there's a, a Shelley Beach uh, with, a, with a Cow Creek capped uh, top to the soil, and that's very important for the quarry. Uh, nearby, closer to the sea at a lower level, are uncemented pebbles of a lower, younger uh, beach from the last interglacial, about 100,000 years old. They're, they're painfully not moving now because they've got vegetation all around. This is just inside the perimeter road, inland from the perimeter road. Lots of blades and discs and things and rollers that we've studied. In the famous uh, lime quarry, to finish off with, <clears throat> there's the dune rock at the bottom, which is not calcretized. Then there's this, the calcrete above is a, is a soil, but I think there's two calcretes. One is, this, is a calcrete of the dune rock, and on top is a calcrete of the beach. Because if you, you can see my student, Zillian, are pointing to a cobble, a beach cobble. You can't have a beach cobble in a, in a, in a dune. So I think there was a, that's a siltstone beach cobble in a beach calcrete. Uh, a, a journalist came with us on one of the museum trips and she took this lovely pic picture from inside the tool shed of the quarry where Nelson Mandela kept his tools uh, when he was a political prisoner there. And then rounding off, this is the geological history of Roman Island, revamped by Michael McCutcheon of the Council of Geoscience, which we're going to put onto our website relatively soon. Uh, we always have a braai, go and look at the lights from the lighthouse. So I'm calling this prison rations. You can see how old and young the people are, a nice age range. Uh, this is where you sleep. The men are separated from the women. Uh, this is where the, 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 convict, the convict prisoners used to live. In fact, I also, a man who fixed my gate the other day, have you ever been to Robin Island? He says, yes. We used to visit my uncles. They were in the prison for fraud. And uh, my wife and I always get special uh, treatment because uh, I'm the leader and she's my wife. And then to finish off with is Robin Island. But in this case, the sign is upside down geologically. And uh, just to finish off, there's the 35th IDC morning trip on the 27th of August, 2016. Okay, that's my, my, that's my talk. I really enjoyed this trip. I enjoyed talking to you. Thanks very much, John. So we have time for a few questions. Um, yes, um, John, nice talk. Um, I did, you've published this guidebook, uh, uh, this walking guide for Robben Island. Does that mean that uh, people can buy this guidebook and go off on their own, or do they still require to hire a guide uh, to take them around on the island? 
uh, Sarah, the, the, um, I could talk for hours about how the Robin Island Museum people and staff are either very helpful or very unhelpful. So basically, you have to go through them, and the rule is you go around with one of their guides. But if I have my way, the guy that you go around with will not only know about the human history of the island, which is very interesting, but he'll have a bit of geology. But if you've got the guidebook, which he will also have, then you can do it. But you have to go around with the guidebook. The, the story I won't, I'll just quickly tell you. A guide was going to be assigned to me. He saw me on a Friday. On the Saturday morning, he hadn't pitched. So I went walking with the group and I got chased by this lady. She said, what are you doing running around without a guide? I said, well, your guide didn't arrive. So I'm going on my own. So you have to be quite flexible. All right. Thank you. John, there's a couple comments in the chat. Um, Cameron Penn Clark says, very nice, John. Interesting to hear that there's a lot going on around geologically and oceanographically. And then also from Michelle Kilborn, um, I've never been to Robben Island and I had no idea how interesting the geology is. Thanks for the tour. My pleasure. It's better on Robben Island than on the peninsula. <laughs> So thanks so much for um, having the great opportunity to be here and to talk a little bit about some of the initiatives um, that I'm involved in. And I'm so pleased to be a part of the conference. So thank you. My talk today is about celebrating the connections um, that we all um, bring to the table, the expertise, and to celebrate um, this uh, enthusiastic, dedicated, and absolutely inspired group of people um, who are doing geoheritage and and heritage in general here in South Africa, because I feel very privileged to work with these people. Um, and it just never ceases to amaze me, um, their energy and commitment. And here's just, just looking at their relentless enthusiasm uh, throughout the course of a pan two-year pandemic and still going on, but these people got together. These are just some Zoom screens of um, just these uh, meetings that we had that just kept going and going. And throughout all the changes, it's fair to say that a lot of the initiatives that I've been involved in, uh, without their support, these initiatives would have fallen completely silent. And we had uh, great participation and great interaction amongst um, each other. So hats off to this community as a whole. And it's not just the landscapes, it's the people, because they are the real precious commodities here, I think. And what I wanted to do with my talk is quickly just touch on uh, sort of the, the full side, I will say, of action, um, some of the projects that I've been involved with, and how these have pulled in, uh, pulled in so many wonderful geologists and, and heritage specialists um, from the museum environment, university environment, um, and from the, the professional um, environment. And so I just wanted to kind of touch on these various um, bits through my talk, and then hopefully there'll be time for some questions. But the first area that I'll mention, of course, it's the one that's nearest and dearest to all our hearts as geologists, and that is the field experiences. And these are so powerful. And it's through these field experiences that the general public can really get a feel of what it's like to be a geologist, what we do, um, how do we study uh, the past, and it's also a great way to really um, train teachers and our teachers here in South Africa really could use this uh, support. It helps them understand deep time, earth history that they can then convey to their learners. I've had the great privilege of being a part of the Ezeko Friends of the Museum. This is a, a trip um, that we took with John Rogers and Claire Browning and others a few years ago. And we went to look at the, the fossils in the Buckelveld. And this was an amazing experience. Um, and people were so, so into it. And it was through citizen science, um, the discovery, the exploration that they were able to do in the field that we came away with, as we always do with these trips, pretty much um, some incredible discoveries. And here's one on the right, this amazing uh, spiny asteroid starfish um, that was found by one of the one of the members, and I think Claire Browning, one of our leaders, found another second specimen. So it's it's wonderful how the the people that go on these trips, the enthusiasts and the professionals, meet and exchange experience, and we come away with great discoveries. It's people like John Rogers and Claire and so many others that give uh, so generously of their time 
to inspire and motivate uh, people that come on these trips. And so it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience, not just for enthusiasts, but we've had teachers and even museum people that go on some of these trips to increase their skills and to learn about the natural environment. So, um, and I'd like to see more retired scientists get involved with some of our programs. So that's really a, they have so much to share and so much they can give. The next part I'll talk a little bit about are um, utilizing the digital world to extend our reach um, in, in a field sense. See, looking at field um, environments, we can pull them in to the virtual realm and develop things called virtual field trips, which I'm sure everybody's heard of, or VFTs. Um, this is an area where I've spent a lot of time, about 10 years working um, through Arizona State University's virtual field trip team. And we've basically traveled all over the world and collected media, worked with researchers in the field to develop these 360 degree virtual environments that are used in online courses, they're used in museum kiosks, they have a lot of different applications. Um, and they can even be used in mobile apps, which we're, which we're planning to, to add to um, Geodesy. But virtual field trips and, um, really extend, um, make those, extend our reach and they make those remote field sites accessible. And many people actually have heard this argument from uh, some geologists that, no, I don't support uh, VFT development because it discourages people from going into the, the field sites. But I, I actually disagree with that, having worked in the field for a while. Um, I actually think that it really encourages people to go in the field. And it, you know, there's nothing quite like that experience of being there in, in, in person. But it also, having the virtual VFTs um, can be used in, in classrooms and reach out to school groups, museums, and groups that, that just wouldn't otherwise be able to get to these sites. Some sites are also very um, fragile and, and are hard to access. So they're re really great um, to have VFTs. Um, and we've been doing them for 10 years as part of our courses. Um, but we've also been experimenting with taking these virtual environments, the field sites, and reconstructing ancient environments and looking more towards uh, almost uh, making them, like gamifying them. And so here's an example of a, a reconstructed environment. This is based on South African deposits. This is for a game that we developed uh, two years ago for um, children, older children, like high school and early college. And, <laughs> pardon me. And this game um, was used to, to follow um, the evolution of mammals and reptiles. And so we took our... So inside the game, you have there's a sort of a mixture of um, real sites and these reconstructed sites. But the reconstructed sites are a perfect lead-in to mobile app development. And we've used these in creating this game that I mentioned. It's called Surviving Extinction. And it actually takes our VFTs, gamifies them. And it also features lots of scientists from um, all over the world, not just South Africa, but we have scientists from uh, Spain, Italy, Croatia, um, all around the world that that feed into um, these these experiences. And they're made for children and made for learners, but they're actually very rich and have a lot of embedded media, which I'll talk a little bit more in a bit. Um, here's another screen from the game. You can see um, we've tried to make it sort of fun. So we take these 360 degree environments that the, the learner can explore and there's kind of challenges built in and they sort of step into the the, the pause, if you will, of the, whatever animal they're looking at, and they follow them through time and make decisions um, about their evolution and their traits, their adaptations. So it's really kind of a fun game for um, older kids, like high school, middle school, um, that age. Um, and we hope to be taking um, the VFTs and funnel these into um, our Geodesy app. So one thing we've talked about is layering in, putting these other ed more educational layers in for, um, we can put fossils, information on some of the geosites that relate to the fossils that are there, and then also some of the, the virtual field trips. Um, and here's one example. This is from the Permian-Triassic boundary um, site of Apodsburg Pass, and that's uh, Pia Viguetti, a, a paleontologist. And if you notice very carefully, there is a burrow with a little Thrinaxodon, cynodont skull um, at the end of it. So, um, 
our goal with the app development is to integrate more educational information, VFTs, um, and things like fossils, and more about Earth history, maybe do an interactive timeline as well. So that's a little bit about um, our virtual and real objects are the next topic that I wanted to mention that kind of feeds into the mobile app um, development and some of the e-learning projects that we're doing online. Here, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of my experience. This is, um, some, uh, this is a scan from a, a paper um, myself and a student did a few years ago. This is um, very read. We studied um, Devonian Bakkeveld starfish and found this amazing layer um, in the lower Bakkeveld with beautifully well-preserved um, starfish. And so we did all these scans. This is about 50 blocks, small blocks that were scanned in a CT scanner and then stitched together. And so the neat thing that came out of this was this virtual uh, burial bed. And in there, you could see the individual um, starfish. And so we've been using that in some of our education um, videos and, and some of the things that we're creating. And out of this virtual paleontology, which is very popular right now, we've been uh, just trying to funnel that into museum exhibits and also into um, our educational materials. And it's, it's nice because the scanning gives you these digital assets that you can use in video already. So it's, it's really compelling and it, it, it very exciting for the future. And it even made the cover of the magazines or the journal. So we're pretty happy about that. And I'm also doing a little bit of work on um, over the past five years, looking at fossils in the um, early fossils of early um, life. These are first complex animals, um, organisms um, called Ediacarans. And this is um, some beautiful, a beautiful painting that we've worked with Maggie Newman to get created for, um, I think it's for an exhibit uh, through Vitz um, that Ian McKay is working on. And so she was commissioned to do these paintings, as you probably know, and we worked with her to um, take our fossils and create this, these beautiful artwork that we're using in um, education and exhibits. And here are a couple of the fossils um, that were newly discovered a few years ago. Um, these are body fossils of Ediacarans, the lower one, Swartpuntia, top is uh, Pteridinium, most likely. So again, working with um, scientists, uh, the general public, Maggie Newman, and artists, uh, just, just such a, such a great, a great um, way to interact and create more things. Here's, oh, I forgot to put this in. This is a scan of one of, so out of this project, we've been scanning a lot of the fossils and we've even been able to scan an Ediacaran fossil. And I don't know if you can see um, this too well on the screen, but here, we are actually getting um, a view inside the fossil so we can, whoops, so we can see the um, beautiful internal structures. And this is a triradial organism that the paper will be coming out this year. Um, so lots of neat things that we can um, use in education um, with the scanning. So the virtual objects are one thing, but where are the real objects? We've got them in fantastic collections at museums. And so the other point I wanted to make here is just how critically important it is to interact um, with museum professionals and find ways to build programs that support um, our museum system, uh, the heritage uh, practitioners that are there and to promote the collections. Because the public actually has a poor understanding of the role of museums um, in South Africa. And we've they've been around for a long time and it's, something that we really want to do is work more closely with the museums and find ways to interact uh, to design our programs that integrate as much of the as much of the uh, collections and staff that as we can use in and presenting the, uh, the the programs and we've been working with uh here's just a little um graphic showing you the the tech we're working with technicians and collections uh, fossil preparation education um and it's just been wonderful. So we're able to build into our uh, programs this cycle of research and, and, and preservation. And so there's this heritage component that we can um, showcase for students and, and younger learners, but there's also the research pipeline. Like how do these people get careers? What are they studying? How do they study? Why have collections? And so we're able to, by having this close relationship, build this into our programs, which is very exciting, I think. We've been working super closely with um, the Ezekiel Museum's Karoo paleontology team, 
And that's led by Claire Browning and Roger Smith. And here are some of her technicians. This is Ituna Skosin in the middle and some of the fossil preparation people um, who are working with the develop uh, the programs um, that we're doing. These are education programs um, for mostly for young learners, but also for um, high school and um, interns. As we work as a team together, the, the whole idea is to build in uh, hands-on uh, interactions using authentic objects and we fossil cast, 3D printed models, um, real rocks and minerals, um, that sort of thing. And so we're trying to find ways um, to make these workshops really hands-on, inquiry-based, and also um, integrating them with the arts, which I'll talk a little bit more in a few minutes. So here's just some examples of some of the types of objects that we've been using in our programs. And some of these actually were able to uh, scan and photograph and make 3D movies of, of the objects that we can use in um, our online classes and things. So that's one thing that's quite, quite interesting. Out of the virtual objects and the VFTs and the field trips come all these digital assets and all these um, things that we can use to develop teaching materials, not to mention the expertise of the people involved. And so just to give you some example of what some of these products are like, um, here's um, one type of um, educational product that we're trying to develop our paired VFT digital um, interactives with teaching kits. And so it's not just rocks and minerals, and which is fantastic. We, we really uh, love to see more of that and fossil models, but we're trying to pair, uh, make kits that are custom designed to work online with some of either um, apps or online and, and the, you know, things you can have on the computer, little um, games and little uh, courses that we can build and just even just a VFT. So we're trying to find ways to, to um, use the materials in ways that, that, that are kind of dynamic. So we'll have an online uh, lab that maybe a learner can, can use along with um, a kit that a teacher could borrow or, and take into their class and use. So we're kind of experimenting with this. It's a work in progress, but we want to do more with this um, in the future. And we're working with people like um, Mad and Elizaveta and Roger, hopefully with the with the Rita Fort Crater um, in the future on this. And Matt's even developed this really cool little um, 3D model here. It's just holding it in his hand, which is pretty pretty amazing. Other things that we're doing uh, online, I'll give you just just a just a quick little uh, screenshot of some of our online courses. And so we were using. Um, learning management systems like Moodle, uh, Smart Sparrow, uh, Canvas to develop um, these online courses. And right now we've um, put most of them into Moodle. So we have a whole series of uh, modules for teacher professional development in the Earth and Beyond uh, strand for the CAPS. But we also um, have some of these shorter courses that we want to use in a museum environment. So um, we're going to try to, as we go forward with some of the programs this year, um, hone some of these a little bit more and get them to work with uh, our workshops that we're going to be offering at Ezekiel Museum. But this is an area we've been developing courses online for the last couple of years and, and experimenting mostly with Moodle and it's Moodle Cloud. So it's a cloud-based um, LMS. And along with this experimenting, um, the last part of my talk is about arts integration. And so, um, and that is focusing on young learners and this would be ages, oh gosh, say foundation and intermediate phase in schools. This is like age six to about 12. And working with developing materials for young learners that and using pathways through the arts to teach science. And so I've kind of gotten really into this the last couple of years. And here's some, some of the materials that we're developing. We just did our first pilot program with the Ezekiel Museum this past week. And it's a holiday program, learning about Lystrosaurus. And we did, I'll talk a little bit about that program in a minute, but we um, are wanting to do more of the arts integration into all of our programs. And that's kind of the centerpiece um, that I'll talk about right now. So arts integration has been around for um, a few years, but it's starting to be used more and more in teaching science. And many school districts are actually in, in Europe and the United States are actually pull, pushing out arts integration across their whole entire um, science curriculum. So um, it's just building in activities of um, arts, music, dance um, that really uh, kind of make it more exciting to teach science. 
And so on in that area, I founded um, about a year and a half ago, um, a new program, children's program called Puppet Planet. And this is an arts integrated program that focuses on using um, puppetry to do science storytelling. And we have, have had our first uh, bit of seed funding. We use that funding to develop a TV show, 30 minute TV show around the main characters, which is a little young girl and her dog. And they go back and forth in time and explore South Africa's um, ancient environments. And so we partnered with a local youth theater called Jungle Theater Company. And this is an NPO that's been around for about 20 years. And Puppet Planet was just established at as, as an NPO um, about, oh gosh, the end of this December. So we're very new, but we're, we're getting started. We have had our first TV show. And the goal is to make more puppets and do more shows um, for TV, live performances, and museum workshops. Here um, is just a, some example of, this is our Lustrosaurus puppet. Um, we're working with Sean and Angela McPherson. Uh, they're uh, pretty well-known Cape Town uh, puppet, puppet designers and artists. And um, here they've created the Mr. Lystrosaurus character in our, in our puppetry show. And this is the baby, uh, <laughs> baby Lystrosaurus that we've just um, used last week. So it's brand new. And so it's really a great interaction between um, local designers and artists and trying to get them involved in the creation of new programs um, for teaching science. And here's just some shots that we took last week um, at the Ezekiel Museum. And we had two groups come in from Kailicha and we had a great time spent. Uh, these are immersive programs. They're three hours long. So the students come in the morning and they spend almost the whole day with us. And um, we take them through the first part of the program is activities in the exhibits with fossils, um, working with the scientists. And then we do, we spend the second part of uh, that work doing, they actually, we do a puppet show with them. And here's just some shots from that in the new education center that they've just, just renovated a few years ago. And they'll spend a 30 minute uh, puppet show and then they will go right into a workshop, a hands-on workshop where they're doing some kind of craft. They'll either make a shadow theater, puppetry theater, or they'll make, in this case, they're making Lystrosaurus masks um, that they color and cut out. And then they'll spend about 15, 20 minutes doing uh, activities and dances and storytelling with um, our puppeteers. And you can see here, the lower right is um, puppeteers from Jungle Theater. And it's really a wonderful way of showing them the, the science, doing the, the art and the performance, and then letting them kind of let go and explore on their own. Um, and I should say we did a little bit of exploration in the discovery um, room as well that Aziko has. It's kind of free exploration to give them a break. Other shows that we're actively developing are uh, themed with uh, ocean, marine science, ocean conservation, and the history of life. We have a, a new show that we're sculpting and honing called Empire of the Ammonites and taking our um, lessons from the octopus teacher and coming up with new characters to look at ancient oceans and the organisms that have come and gone and how climate changes affect, affected the evolution of the oceans over time. So we've got lots of puppetry and stuff going on there that we're looking for. We're actually looking for funding for some of it, but we have a lot of ideas. And the last thing I'll mention is our partnership. Um, we're embarking on a new partnership with um, the South African Radio Astronomy um, Observatory and the SKA and the Ezekiel Planetarium. So we're developing some new characters to explore astronomy, um, planetary science and we have this meerkat character puppet that we're that we're in development um, with right now and so we'll, hopefully we'll get that puppet done and then start <laughs> developing the shows um, and the workshops to go with it and our idea here is to pair um, visualization and planetarium shows with um, the puppetry and the, the crafts and the exploration um, so it's kind of a real mixed bag um, but I just wanted to end there and just thank all the people that have helped these programs uh, get off the ground and especially those at um, the Ezekiel Museum and the funding that we received from the Center of Excellence and the Paleo Society. And last but not least, all the, the people of, in our partner organizations at Jungle Theater, um, Angela and Sean and, and others. And uh, so we're very grateful for the opportunity to work with all these amazing people. So I guess I'll leave it there.
Great. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, sure. That was fascinating. Are there any questions or comments? <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a question, John Rogers, again. Um, oh, John. I've just recently discovered that Table Mountain has a thing called Class in the Clouds mm. for the last 10 years. And it's a, it, all the grades are different, different courses for different grades. And they deal with about 13,000 school children oh, wow. a year. Wow. And I'm trying to add a bit of geology there as well. <laughs> um, I just, I'm dying to know how many school children go through the museum in a good year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah. amazing. I didn't know that. That, was, that's, that sounds very do interesting. You, up to do, do you know how many people go through your museum? No, I, do, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I know that they have they have uh, a lot of school groups, but it's hard to say with the pandemic the last few years because it's been uh, pretty closed down in a lot of respects. But no, I, I can find mean, out. No, yeah, before, yeah. Before, just, give me your uh, bet, uh, the best pre-COVID. <laughs> give me your best guess. Yeah, best, I will, I'll, best, find, best, I'll find that out. It must be before you know. COVID. Before COVID. Mm -hmm. I know they have... Uh, quite a lot of student groups that come through and, and now with the they have the planetarium that's been renovated and now they're really focusing on planetarium shows and those groups are quite large um wow. so i can i'll find out get some numbers for you thank you very much sure thanks uh kudani all right thank you thank you very much uh a great presentation Wendy. yeah i just want to know the the cost of your city gaming and 3d printing stuff and just a general comment uh, I think we need some of these initiatives in the rural area. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm not sure where you are located, but I think we really need things uh, for poor kids out there who don't really have uh, information about geology and earth surface and all that. Thank you very much. Um, I can leave my email and um, definitely uh, get, get in contact. Thanks okay, so much. No, for the the okay, sure. <laughs> Thanks so much for the comment. <laughs> My name is Catherine James Clenance. I'm the curator of the Geology Museum, Museum Africa in Johannesburg. I just wanted to talk to you guys about the history of Johannesburg. My talk is it's actually a follow-up talk on a talk I did not too long ago for the OGG. And what I'm talking about is the wrong side of the gold reef. Johannesburg is incredibly interesting as a historical perspective. And just how the the city developed a couple of other fairly important points. And these points have been made a couple of times in this conference, but I think they need to be reiterated and reiterated quite strongly. Geheritage and cultural history are very much part and parcel of the same narrative. The importance of an item is linked to its cultural value. If an item has cultural value, it has value. And this makes geological history part of our cultural history. Gold wouldn't be important if we didn't have the assigned value of, oh, it's gold, it's pretty. Diamonds wouldn't have the importance unless we assigned them that value. Using that value to create the narrative is quite important as well. Also, for the general public, and I'm not talking about the guys sitting in, in this chat, and I'm not talking about the guys who have a basic interest in geology, I'm talking about the guys who are the general public, so the guys who might not know very much about geology, the average man in the street. The, the narrative is more engaging when they can relate to the story. So during the course of the research for this paper and the previous one, I've had to reiterate the point that a place is only interesting because of the people who've been there before, because of the history of the area. An area is only history only interesting because of the history that has been assigned to it. So those are fairly important points going forward, especially in relation to this talk, because this is very much as a, a lighter, lighter side of geoheritage. Everyone's been focusing very strongly on what geoheritage is, how we can do it. This is a focus on sort of a different side of geoheritage, where we're focusing more on the actual geoheritage rather than what we can do for geoheritage. So I do actually have to say a big thank you to my husband for the photographs that we've seen in the background of these two slides. These are actually photographs taken of the night sky in the Drakensberg, so they're not related to the rest of the talk. All right. The history of Johannesburg is, is, is interesting and varied, but it doesn't have a very long history. And this, this photograph is just a Google Maps photograph of Johannesburg, and it's quite an important photo because it shows very clearly the lineation between the north of Joburg and the south of Joburg. 
at the beginning of last year, well, not the beginning of last year, but the beginning of this year and the end of last year, I was asked to do a talk by the OGG about the history of Johannesburg. And Johannesburg's history tends to be fairly straightforward. We found gold, this happened, this happened. But there are parts of Joburg where our history isn't very well representative. And when I say our history, I mean the people living in, in Johannesburg, I mean the people who created Johannesburg. And you can see part of this delineation here, and you can actually see, I'm going to use my mouse as a pointer, merely because it's easy. There's this line across here of mine dumps. And that line very much created a, a, a barrier between the northern suburbs of Johannesburg and the southern suburbs of Johannesburg. So what I want to talk mainly about is the southern suburbs of Johannesburg. And the reason why is because the southern suburbs have this varied history. So early Johannesburg, these are just a couple of photographs of what early Johannesburg was like. And you can see it's very frontier town. It was very much what we think of a Western frontier town. It wasn't particularly amazing. There were no big shops. People lived in tented camps. The, the, the town was small, dirty, and grubby. And this one, I love this picture. This is a very early Johannesburg picture. This is a picture in 1888. The hotel on the right, on the left-hand side, is the Olympic Hotel. It was a hotel and drinking establishment. And that small black building on the right-hand side, surrounding by the men in the white hats, was the very first police station. The men in the white hats were obviously the first police. And you can so show, see just how rough and ready the town was. You see the white streets, the horse carriages, everything was either tin shanty or just starting to be built of stone. You can see it was a rough, ready sort of town. It wasn't particularly fantastic. These are the kind of houses that would have been part of that town. The one on the, the left-hand side is a typical house of the time. And the one on the right is actually a, a mining storehouse and mining office. So they would have lived in the house, ran, ran the general store and ran the mining office for the little shaft you see there. So you can see the very in, almost informal nature of the city. We're going to look at a whole lot of maps. I love maps. This is a plan of Johannesburg and its suburbs. And what's really important about this map is this little red line over here. And that little red line is donating, is showing the main reef. So the main reef daylights east-west. And the re reef dips south. In this map, if we zoom in further, it also shows the, the southern suburbs very much. And you can see, even in this map, the northern northern part of the main reef is very much well developed. Now, the original Johannesburg, and again, I'll show this in a different map. Originally, Johannesburg suburbs were these ones over here, Dornfontein. And they were hoping people would move south. So here we have another map of the southern suburbs. And you can see this one is 1896. And you can see the planning of the, of the southern suburbs. And this was, like I said, a very early plan. And they're planning the southern suburbs to be sort of upmarket Dornfontein style housing so another one of my absolute favorite maps this map is a pocket map of Johannesburg, and this is from 1903 and it shows the center of Joburg and how far how you how far you are outside of the center i'm going to have a look at the center of Joburg here and this map is really interesting as well because it shows you the names so i'm using my mouse as a pointer again of all of the mines that you can see on the reef, and these are quite important because nowadays we don't realize where these mines are, and they've all just been built over, and they've become part of the, the general cityscape. But the other really big point, point about this map is this red triangle, and this was the original footprint of Johannesburg, and there again you can see Dornfontein, and you can see everything south of Dornfontein is all, all mines, it's all these sort of marked out mining areas. We're moving further south, we can now, now see the southern suburbs again. You can see Turfentine Racecourse. It was a very important landmark in the early Johannesburg, and, and we'll talk more about it later, but it was it was very much the start of the, the big build-up in the south. But additionally important on this map is this little road here, and this is the coach road to Potchefstroom. Nowadays, of course, you get, you get onto the highway, but this is the, the pre-highway. And this coach road was fairly important because it was the best way to get into Johannesburg. And there were a few other ways in, but this one, this one had the Boer encampments on it. It was it also led to some of the more important townships in the south of Joburg. And this is a collage photograph of one of those townships. This is Boysons, the Boysons area. 
which we saw in the previous slide. And these the, the top left-hand slide is the Boysons in very early Boysons in 1897, looking north. And you can see just how quickly the area developed. The one on the right is, is 1908. The one on the bottom left is 1930. And the one on the bottom right is 1960. And that hotel is still there. The hotel was owned by SAB, the South African breweries, which were developed in the south near Ofenton. But the hotel was owned until 1977 when it was sold, and it's still run. Unfortunately, there was a fire there a couple of years ago, but it has been rebuilt and it has a very nice lunch. The other part, important geological history, we have to add geological history into this, was the five stamp mills. So when I say five stamp mills, I'm talking about the five stamps on the top of the mill over there. And the five stamp mills were incredibly important because without them, they wouldn't have been able to access and mine the gold as efficiently. There's always a, a slight discussion as to who brought the first stamp mill into, into the RAND. And this particular stamp mill is a photograph of the stamp mill that now stands in Cliffendale. But this particular one was brought into the country by a gentleman called Sam Wemmer in 1887. And his wife, Martha Helena Wemmer, was believed to be the first white female resident of the ranch, was the first European resident. So the stamp mill was, was quite important historically. You can go see it at Cliffenton Bale and has been restored. Of course, Mr. Wemmer is the person who named Wemmer Pan, which is a fairly large and looming landmark in the south of Joburg. And this is a very old photograph of La Rochelle, which is one of the suburbs around Wimmerpan, looking over the Wimmerpan. Wimmerpan is still accessible and you can go there, though I wouldn't suggest you swim because it has been close due to health issues. These are a few older photographs of Wimmerpan, the one on the top with the, the young ladies rowing. The girls are from St. Andrews. This is one of the SA rowing championships, and this was about... 2004. And the one at the bottom right is about 1998. Wimapan used to be incredibly busy. It was one of the biggest focal points of the southern suburbs. Big another big photo focal point of the southern suburbs was the old Wembley Stadium. Now, when I say Wembley Stadium, quite often people from the UK giggle because they think you know, Wembley Stadium in London. But there was a Wembley Stadium in the south of Joburg. It was incredibly famous for its hot rod racing and its speedway racing, speedway bike racing. And this is these are a couple of photographs shared by somebody I've interviewed for this talk of the hot rod racing. And they used to do the hot rod racing on, on these tar tracks. And when they did the speedway bike racing, they'd pull up the tar and cover it with gravel, which really annoyed the locals because then they'd get gravel in their cool drinks. Wembley Stadium was closed in 1997 but it was eventually sold in 2015 and is now currently being used as a homeless shelter. Turfentine is one of the oldest suburbs in Johannesburg. This is a photograph of Turfentine in 1910. Now, Turfentine was originally founded as an upmarket up suburb. And the idea that was it, that it would rival Dornfontein as the suburb where the mining magnets would want to live. I told you this had heritage importance. And this is just a little street map of the original design of Turfentine. And you can see the roads are wide. There are lots of public gardens. It's very much based on a European design where it's meant for wide open spaces where ladies can promenade down Tramway Street. And it was meant for upmarket. Unfortunately, due to the mining and the mine dumps, the south of Joburg became very dirty. And there was a lot of dust and it became quite uncomfortable to stay. So the richer folk moved north. They moved into the Orange Grove and they moved into, the, into where we know as the fancy parts of Joburg, so Parktown. And Turfentine in the southern suburbs became an artisanal area. And this is part of the heritage of the area and part of the reason why we haven't spoken about the city of Joburg as heritage. In Joburg history, the southern suburb tends to be ignored. But we ignore it because it's where the artisans live. It's where the plumbers and the, the horse race owners and the people who built cars, that's where these guys lived. 
So what they did with turpentine is they took the stand size and halved it. And you can see that in this map. You can see the stand sizes are very small. Then they began selling it for not very much to artisans, and it became a thriving suburb. This was in the early 1900s. And you can see these are some of the early photographs of turpentine. Today, it's still a slight a very much a thriving suburb. And as, as with now and, and with then, it's very much a place for immigrants. So there are a lot of immigrants in, in the area. Now it's Nigerian immigrants, whereas before it was the Portuguese and the English. So some of these houses are still standing, but you can very much see the style of housing we're talking about. This is, I've been doing interviews for all of, all of this because there's no written history of the south of Joburg. All of the history is retained in the memories of the people who live there. And this is becoming a huge issue because a lot of these people are um, leaving us. It's a polite way to put it. This is one, likely one of the ladies who was born in Turfentine around 1936. And she shared her family photographs with me. And you can very much see in these photographs that the houses hadn't changed by 1936 and then by, 19, by 1956, 1958, the houses, is, again, had still stayed the same. Now, of course, they were building flats, and these flats still stand. This is Sheffield Street in Turpentine, and these photographs have a family connection because the young man you see over there is my father, and these are my great-grandparents. But the housing hasn't really changed. Turpentine has remained very much the same. It has the same the same streets, the same houses, the same roadways. But the heritage is being lost because we haven't retained the information about these houses. And now they're being demolished to build fancier flats, flats like not, uh, not like these ones where you, you fit four flats onto a stand, but flats where you're fitting six to eight. I did say we'd talk about Turfentine Racecourse. Turfentine Racecourse was created <laughs> very much in 1898 by the Turfentine, well, Johannesburg Turf Club. And they leased the land in Turfentine and held the December handicap there. Before that, the races were held on a flat track in Ferreira's camp. The Turf Club then bought the land in 1892 and built a large grandstand there in 1891, which were, were revamped in 1917. You can see the grandstand, you can see the crowd there. And this has a quite important part of history because it links internationally. The land that Turfentine Racecourse was on, in fact, the Turfentine Racecourse that we see here, was used as a concentration camp by the English during the Boer War. And it was also, <laughs> thankfully, the site of the failure of the Jameson Raid. And the reason why was because there was a race that day. So instead of going on the raid, a lot of the punters went to the racecourse instead. Another, another photograph of Turpentine Racecourse showing the, the original stand, also showing the fashions of the day, and how everyone would, of course, dress up to go to the races. Mm -hmm. Other interesting areas in Turpentine, and these are all heritage buildings, is the Turpentine Fire Station. The top photograph is showing when it was originally built in about 1910. The, <laughs> the picture on the right with the, the gentleman standing in the trees now, this photograph we got out of, off of a Facebook post, but I originally saw it in the Heritage Portal. And what these gentlemen would do is they'd climb up these gum trees to spot the fires, but they'd also be able to see over onto the race course and they'd see who won, who'd won the races and then wave flags and send telegrams into the centre of town. And then the people in the centre of town would place their bets and win. The bottom photograph is a photograph that was taken recently by myself. That's what the race, the fire station looks like today. And of course, a lot of churches in the area. This is the Turpentine Presbyterian Church. The top one is the original painting. The bottom was is the Presbyterian Church as it stands today. Because of the influx of migrants, a lot of the churches are no longer functioning quite as well as they used to. And many of the church's congregations are now mixed congregations where they're not necessarily Presbyterian, but they don't have another church to go to, so they all flock to one church. The south of Joburg also manages to very famously have housed Daisy Demelka. She was born in 1886 and trained as a nurse, and then she married a gentleman called William Alfred Cole. William Alfred Cole bought a house at 22 Tully Street in Turfentine, which is the house on the right-hand side, and they moved out of that house in 1922. 
he she did murder Mr. Cole, and she mur murdered her second husband as well with strychnine. However, they weren't living in this house anymore. They had moved out of the area, but she was caught due to the fact that she came back to Turfentine and used a local pharmacy to buy the strychnine and arsenic, the arsenic she used to murder her son. She was hung on December 30th, 1932. More maps, yay! So talking about Johannesburg South, we have to talk about, once again, the development of the area and just how quickly areas develop and don't develop. And earlier, one of the speakers was talking about geoheritage and how geoheritage affects the landscape. And this is very much part of that geoheritage landscape. This is a Johannesburg City Council map from May of 1946. You can again see it, just how well developed the north is compared to the south. This is a zoomed in area of the south. And here you can see some of the suburbs in the south. So we were talking about Turfentine. This is Turfentine over here. We've also mentioned there's Wimapan, but some of these other areas weren't built in the previous maps. So Regent's Park over here was built as mine manager's housing for one of the, the gold mines, which was just over here. I think it was city and suburban. And now it's fairly run down, but it was a fantastic area. It was called Regent's Park after Regent's Park in London. And it was very much tabled as a high class area. And you can see a lot of the stands are fairly large, but you can also see the lack of development in the rest of the South and just how empty it is. We move on to the next map and the next map is 1955. And this one begins to show just how quickly some of the South started developing. Once the artisans started not being able to afford some of the houses in the north. And also, as the south became more desirable as a place for people who wanted to go to be in touch with nature. And this is the 19 close up of the 1955 map. And you can see within 10 years, there's a whole other area being developed over here. And this borderline, this red borderline over here, marks the boundary between the city main and the peri-urban areas and some of the areas i'm going to talk about after this are part of the peri-urban areas which are further down so one of the claims to frame of the, the new areas that i've just pointed out was that one of the older schools the turfentine government school which is the photograph on the left hand side at the top was built in turfentine the school was built in the early 1900s but it had too many pupils so they moved it into another building called Sir John Adamson, which is the photograph on the right. But Sir John Adamson also got too big. So they bought a plot just off of Rifle Range in the previous photograph, and they built Sir John Adamson. And Sir John Adamson became one of the largest English-speaking schools in the South until Mondial High School and Glen Vista High were built in the late 60s and the early 70s. The photograph on the left is a photograph of one of the matric groups from Sir John Adamson, it was the matric group of 1970. This is a photograph showing the peri-urban area of Mondial. And this photograph was taken in the 1920s. So it's not, it's 100 years old, but it, you'd think it was older because there's just no houses, there's nothing. This is a photo a painting of the area done by W. Kutzer in 1948. And this area is overlooking the Mondial Valley. So I'm going to use my mouse pointer. They're standing on, on the ridge from Robertsham with the area where Sir John is, and they're looking across the Mondial Valley towards the Clipperfiz Back Nature Reserve, this area here. Now, this valley is all conglomerates, and the nature reserve over there is fenced to stop lavas. This is important shortly. Now, Mondial was developed in 1946 as part of a, a peri urban, amazing you know, township. And this was one of the adverts for it, it was highly advertised, and all of the advertised. All the advertisements very much suggested that it was a wonderfully lovely suburb. And if you wanted to live comfortably for very cheap, you could live here. It was in the country. You can see the wording on this advertisement is very much geared towards people who aren't necessarily incredibly wealthy, but are very much interested in owning their own stand in their own house with a large garden. Mondial, the suburb itself, had no town hall and no any facilities. So the people living in Mondial built a wooden clubhouse to hold all of their meetings, and it was the original church. The clubhouse, unfortunately, was destroyed, but these tennis court ablution blocks were built over the clubhouse. Next to the clubhouse was another very important building. And that building, and this one is quite important, merely for interest, 
was the Scout House. Now, this Scout Hall was built in 1975, and it was built from local donations. And the next picture shows some of the, the paperwork dealing with those donations. The Scouts at the time, and people may remember this, used to do Bob Hop. They also did for Bob a job. And the, bo the bottom advertisement here is for, for the Cubs. Scouts and Cubs have been an integral part of Johannesburg for an incredibly long time. In fact, there's an argument as to which, which scouting hall and which scouting pack is the oldest in South Africa. And the competition is between the one in Belleville and Cape Town and the first southern, southern suburbs scouts, which no longer exist, that were started in the Turfentine area. This is a collection of photographs just showing some of those scouts. And you can see we have a lot of natural space in there and they were used very much to the scouts. The photographs on the left-hand side, the, the red ones are quite old. Those were taken in an area called Quilliam's Farm, which I'll talk about in the next slide. This, uh, we're talking about the age of the scouts. This photograph here is a cub pack that was taken in about 1958. They were obviously visiting central Johannesburg, but the photograph belonged to my grandparents. This photo, these two photographs here are taken in an area called Binney's Farm, which people may now know as Ridley Zoo Farm. It's also quite an important area in the south of Joburg. And as you can see, it was empty. There was nothing. There was, and this, these were taken probably in that 19, early 1970s. The bottom photograph is a photograph that was taken probably about 1990 to 2000. And that's, that was the Glen Vista Cub Pack. Unfortunately, all of the scouting groups have begun to fail and fall apart. There are now only three scouting groups left in the whole of the southern suburbs. And one of them is actually in Henley and Clip. It's no longer in the south of Johannesburg. Part of this is because of the lack of interest by parents to be part of the Akalas and part of the, the senior scouts. I mentioned the Quilliams Farm. This is a couple of photographs and a painting, well, a photograph and a painting of the Quilliams Farm. The Quilliams Farm is in an area called the Klipperfiersbach Nature Reserve. It stands at the bottom end of the Fentestorp Lavas. This photograph just shows the remains of the Quillian Farm. The painting on the right shows what the Quilliams Farm would have looked like probably around, I've got to find the date, 1940-ish. This farm was originally built as the Marais Farmsteads, and on some of the older maps, you can see it marked as Marais. This is the Cliff Refuse Bag Nature Reserve. The Cliff Refuse Bag Nature Reserve is quite important for the south of Joburg, as it is a historical site, but it is also a geoheritage site. The reason why is this. This particular site is the site of the Fairfontein Dam, and these are the remains you can see of the Fairfontein Dam. Now, these particular blocks are actually made of the quartzite, and the quartzites were quarried across the valley on the Robertsham Hills and carted across into the Fentersdorp lavas of Mondio. This is a photograph of them excavating the Fairfontein Dam, and there's a blonde crane sitting on the top of here, and it comes across here. And the reason the Fairfontein Dam failed was because they managed to excavate it on a fault site. And the fault site is roughly where the court sites and the Fentestorp lavas join. The, the, where the fault is now, there's an area called Silent Pool, which you can visit. Unfortunately, the dam failed mostly due to the fact that it was owned and funded by Barney Bonato, who died just before it funded. <laughs> And I had to include this sketch in because I was asked about a blonde and crane before. This is sort of a vaguely made sketch by me that this is how a blonde and crane works. Basically, you pick up the, the quartzite blocks over here using your team of oxen. They're not mutated ants. You move it across and you move them across with the blonde and crane using it as a winch and you put it onto the, the dam over here. The area has also developed quite slowly and some of the other, other areas in that general southern suburbs area have only developed after the 1970s. So these are a couple of photographs of, Glavis, of Glenanda. And you can see the hills in the background of these are fairly undeveloped. Now that they're, now they're more developed, there's now a shopping center just about where my mouse pointer is. But some of these areas didn't develop until well after the 70s. In fact, the photograph on the top left is Glen, Glenanda Primary School, which was only built in 1976. This is a photograph just showing the Glen Vista Hills, and you can see it's become very much an upmarket house. And you can see the, the geology here. You can see these are the Fentas de Blavas looking. This is looking south, and this is just looking east, and you can see the deep valleys formed by those lavas. The houses now, however, are really huge and actually not quite affordable if you're an artisan. 
I don't know if anyone else remembers this, but I don't. In 1981, there was a snowstorm in Johannesburg, and these are a couple of photographs just showing the snow. But I was interested in these because these show, again, those same hills, the ones that we were looking at the previous slides, are very undeveloped. There are no houses on them. But now they've got these houses. Are not, they're now full of houses. There's no houses on them in this, this slide. Some of the other areas, including the area I grew up in, which is in Mulbarton, some of these areas weren't paved until the 80s. This is a photograph taken in 1985, and you can see the streets weren't paved yet. They were just being paved in 1985, and Glenanda and Glavista were only paved in the 1970s. In fact, Glavista only had telephones in, after 1975. Again, you can see just how the area has developed. This is the same street. In fact, this area here is this wall on the bottom photograph, and you can see just how much the area has developed and changed the, the growth and the, the plants. And it shows just how much of a young city Johannesburg really is and how much we have to remember that our cultural heritage is very much based on our ideas of age and what's important. And we've got to remember that just because it's not particularly old doesn't mean it's not particularly important. Mm. So I have to thank people for, for contributing before I finish. So a lot of the photographs were given to me by Brian Dawson and Eileen. Brian was born and was lived in Turfentine from 1962, and Eileen was born in Turfentine. In fact, you saw her earlier as a child. Also got a lot of the information from Mondio, from Joan and Noel Thornton. And Rue Allen Lindsay spoke to me extensively about the gardeners in the south of Joburg and just how quickly they were built, and how, how very many trees that were planted in the south of Joburg, but also in the north of Joburg by people wanting to create a forest environment in what was really just, you know, felt. Also, I have to say a big thank you to my husband, Peter. He also lived in Turfentine most of his life. He moved there in 1991, but he also took a lot of the modern photographs for me. Other mentions I have to say is thank you to Dennis and Lillian Southey and Maureen Rankin for talking to me about the, the Scouts and also living in the south of Joburg from the 70s. Kay Dudgeon, who's Eileen's daughter, who spoke to me rather a lot about not only Speedway and the hot rods, but also about growing up and living in the, the Regions Park Hill areas. Other mentions have include my mom, Linda James, for giving me a whole lot of photographs. Henny Cliff and the OGG for encouraging me in the first place. The people I work for from Museum Africa for letting me do this. Letitia's Dance Ladies, Mornay Brett, Natalie and Elizabeth Wildman, Calvin James Montgomery, Flo Bird and the Heritage Foundation. And the name that's not on this list is the GMA, which is the Geological Museum Association, who very much encouraged me to look into history. Thank you very much for attending. I hope I didn't talk too fast and I hope this was interesting, especially considering that we have to look at your heritage in more than one way. We can't just look at the rocks. We have to also look at the way that the people living on those rocks are affected and how their lives change. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Kate? Um, we can maybe do one or two. The, the other thing I do have to say, I've seen, I, I saw in the, the chat somebody was born in... Um, there it was. Uh, Sherrod was said she was born in the southwest corner of that red triangle. Sherrod, I would love to talk to you about your history, especially the history of your family and how you came to be born in the corner of that south, that, 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 that red triangle. A, a lot of this, all of this research actually has been done through talking to people and actually going to the houses and having sit down conversations with them. And part of what I've been saying is I actually want to hear the stories that you've told your mom, that your mom and dad have told you a million times and you no longer want to listen to because it's part of our cultural history and it places us as a person in the environment. And once you have those stories, you can put those stories into, into the fabric of the history of the area. And that, that's what begins to make an area interesting historically. Uh, I want to start a little bit where Kate left off. So Kate said, you know, we have to look at geoheritage a little bit differently. Um, and we have to not just consider the rocks, but actually consider the, the people um, who, actually, um, who actually share, um, uh, whose lives are shaped by the rocks. What I'm presenting to you is a different perspective on, on, on how we might be able to gather more enthusiasts uh, for um, uh, geology uh, and for geoheritage. And, and that really is by sharing the stories that we have 
uh, with uh, with another set of people who are in fact tourists. Um, so my presentation really is going to take you through a very quick sweep of the um, of the tourism landscape uh, in, in the country. Um, I'm not going to present some of the issues you would have already heard from Gillian this morning, uh, where she's presented to you with the demand and the supply and some of the stats for tourism. But I'm rather going to talk to you a little bit about the work that we do in the Department of Tourism. Um, I am the Deputy Director General responsible for destination development in the Department of Tourism. And I want to take you through some of my thoughts, which are really cursory. And if it's all right uh, with the conference organizers, Instead of questions at the end, which you're welcome to also ask, it would be very useful if you can think um, upfront now about what would be the kinds of support the Department of Tourism could provide to the, the geoheritage community to actually um, expand the, the geoheritage tourism offering. So that at the end of my, my, my uh, talk, which I'm going to try to keep quite brief, we can have a discussion on what could be the next steps and how we might be able to take forward some of this work practically. And see if it moves. There we go. So very simply, Tourism 101. Um, tourism is actually comprised of planning, destination development, and the elements, there are two elements to destination development. The one element is people, and the other element is places. You have tourism regulation and you have destination marketing. And together, all of those things make up what is called destination management. If you look then at how government is structured, um, you then have the Department of Tourism, who actually is responsible for all of the policy planning, destination development, both people and places, and tourism regulation elements. And then you have South African Tourism, that is responsible for the marketing aspects. At a provincial level, you have a replication of that with um, provincial departments then taking on the responsibility for policy planning, uh, development and regulation, and tourism agencies in each of those provinces taking on the marketing function. But in the world of geotourism, there are two other critical players in the space. The one is the Department of Science and Innovation, and they're responsible for what is called areas of geographic advantage. Geotourism uh, would fall within that category, or geology I, I would fall within that category, as does paleontology. Um, and the Department of Forestry, Fisheries, and Environmental Affairs, who is responsible for our national parks, but also responsible for any work related to protected areas which would include uh, national parks, which would include geoparks, and would include world heritage sites. Why is tourism an important sector? It's an important sector, actually, because tourism is not just about leisure, as Julian uh, adequately painted a picture earlier on. It's a really key economic sector, and it has a very wide value chain. Um, because it has such a wide value chain, um, as, as uh, you know, illustrated in this picture, it therefore has very significant multiplier effects. And so the economic impacts of tourism are quite critical. In any uh, government space, there are two things that govern the work that we do. The one is actually overarching policy, and then the second one is the strategies. So very simply in the tourism space, we have a white paper. Uh, critically important about the white paper is that it says tourism should be government-led, private sector-driven, but community-based. And I think that it has been a common narrative in the inputs that have come up today um, that the community-based element is critically important if we want any tourism activity to succeed. But in fact, it is the lands and cents which make it a value proposition for the private sector. And from a government perspective, our job is to, in fact, support both these uh, elements, which are both the private sector as well as the community sector, and to actually bring the resources of the state to support the growth of tourism. We have in our space a national tourism sector strategy and I, I like to put this very simply because I've been in government for a long time. 
There are two things that actually occupy anyone who sits in government, and it doesn't matter which department you're in. Those two things are inclusive economic growth um, and job creation. Government doesn't necessarily create jobs themselves, uh, although they might do some support of that through an expanded public works program. But we are responsible for creating the enabling environment that allows our economy to grow and jobs to actually be created. Within that space uh, of our national tourism sector strategy, there are five key pillars. Marketing, which is an obvious one. Facilitating ease of access, because if tourists can't get here and can't travel easily within our space, then it makes tourism a very difficult sector to grow. The visit experience, which is made up of uh, elements of how people experience places, but also is made up of elements of service excellence, so how people experience people. Uh, and both the elements of places and people are then covered in the work that we do in the visitor experience. Destination management then is, of course, about the systems and relationships that actually make tourism happen and link all of these various elements in our national tourism sector strategy. And then we, of course, importantly in the South African context, is how we ensure inclusive economic growth. Um, and our broad-based benefits are both from the perspective of people and how you grow small enterprises and how you bring in new uh, entrepreneurs into the space, but it's also within the space of spatial transformation. So how you actually create new tourism product offerings in different spaces. We all know that our sector was in fact one of the hardest hit by the COVID pandemic. So to support the work that we're doing with the National Tourism Sector Strategy, in the government space, we have what is called Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Plan. And because of the significance, economic significance of the tourism sector, we're covered as one of the eight priorities within the space. We have then developed our own tourism sector recovery plan, and it's very easy to understand if you understand the business of tourism. Firstly, we have a supply base, and we know that many of our products were closed uh, for a period of about two years. So what we really have to do with those products, with those hotels, with those museums, et cetera, is that we actually have to project and rejuvenate that supply. Uh, we have to make sure that when visitors arrive in mass, both domestic and international, that those spaces are ready for them. We also are now competing with uh, destinations across the world who are all trying to reignite the demand for their destinations. And so in line with that work, we are actually then, you know, um, stepping up our global marketing campaign and also our domestic marketing campaign. And then, of course, again, the systems that support both supply and demand in the tourism space actually are, um, are need to be strengthened. So there's a set of work around the enabling environment and enabling capability. So very simply, to understand what our plan is, it's really about making sure that our supply base is ready uh, to actually meet the increasing demand of visitors, both domestic and international. And again, the key focus, because we are in a government space, is about how we actually grow the economy, help the tourism sector to recover, and importantly, how we actually keep jobs. What has this got to do with how we think about destination development? So in our space in destination development, and I think that many of you who are part of this conference are in, in, in academia, um, we like to think about how you start with very broad ideas and then how you narrow them down. Um, and in our space, what we've done is that we've created broad master plans for areas across the country. So the Wild Coast is a case in point. We've created a master plan that looks at um, Carnarvon to Sutherland, which is where the SKA is located. And we've created some master plans that are looking at work in, in the Northern Cape. Um, we then take those master plans and we narrow them down. So we look at the ideas coming out of the master plans. We take them into conceptual thinking. We look at those concepts. We test those concepts through pre-feasibilities and feasibility studies. Um, and 
In some instances, we might fund some of those projects, depending on whether they have substantial public good uh, or they might have huge economic impact on a particular area. And in other instances, what we would then do is to actually find funding for those things to happen. Um, and we would then take all of that and make sure that in the long term they're sustainable so that we hand them over. So this is the work that we're doing in destination development, which deals with tourism places, spaces, infrastructure development, route development, and experience development. If we take this down to an understanding then of how we work, our work actually starts with broad master plans focusing on a region, um, then taking it down uh, to a destination node, so a specific geographic location within that, and then taking it down to a precinct level. So if you look at a region, you might look at Gauteng as a region. If you were thinking about a destination node, you might actually look at Soweto as a destination node. And within that, you might then be considering, for example, the Budakazi precinct. So that's how we logically work in, in our space. The logic and rationale for why we invest in certain spaces, because we are investing public funds, is that tourism must be a key economic driver in that space. It must actually not be about isolated product development, but it must actually support broader tourism development. If we can work at a regional level and have a broader economic impact at a regional level, that would make much better sense than us working at a precinct level that doesn't necessarily link into a broader regional or destination node perspective. And importantly, the work that we do must serve public good uh, benefits uh, and must actually try to bring a partnership between the public, private sector and our communities that we serve. Where does GeoHeritage then fit into this? So, in the department, we have developed a niche uh, tourism experiences guide, which helps practitioners to actually develop niche tourism experiences. Now, niche tourism actually comes, uh, the word niche comes from a marketing concept, which really looks at tailored experiences. Um, and, and in our space, we, where niche actually means special interest. Niche, interestingly, doesn't mean small, uh, because as Jillian actually provided some stats for you earlier on, geoheritage as an area of niche tourism can in fact be quite lucrative, both from the perspective of creating jobs and growing an economy. But very importantly for niche tourism, it is about appealing to people's emotions. So niche tourism involves all the senses. It is about how you experience a place. Uh, at a sensory level. And what it is about is really taking away experiences rather than just actually visiting a site. So tourism has moved from just actually visiting places to what are the memorable stories that you can tell from a visit to a space. This is really following the trend. Our, our tourists are becoming a little bit more savvy than they were 20 years ago. Um, they're thinking differently about how they want to travel. They actually are looking to be engaged at an emotional level. Um, they are making choices from a lifestyle perspective. So they're wanting to care about their environment. They want to have experiences that transform them as human beings. Um, and they want to be able to share those experiences uh, beyond themselves. Uh, they're looking for new and exciting and interesting things to do. So many people have visited Cape Town. They have visited Kruger National Park. Now they want to actually know what are the actual deeper things you can dive into in those spaces to actually um, experience the destination in a different way and have a different story to tell their, their visitors. So some thoughts on where we might be able to work collectively Use the sector that is passionate and enthusiastic about geology, um, and us as the sector that is passionate and enthusiastic about sharing uh, the stories of South Africa uh, with the rest of the world and with South Africans. So I was privileged in my life to work at the Cradle of Humankind World Heritage Site, uh, and in that work, of course, encountered some amazing scientists, amongst them Prof. Booth Rubich. 
Um, and I have been captured that by the idea that South Africa has a unique geographic advantage in that our position uh, on the continent actually tells the story of earth and life. Um, and, you know, um, Prof. Rubich in his explanation about it says that we, we are able to, because of our unique geology actually, um, have fossil records of single cell organisms all the way through uh, to dinosaurs and all the way on to, to hominids and, and, and human evolution. It's a very unique story, and I don't think that anyone in this audience would argue that we have that very special story to tell the world. But there is a way that we need to tell the story, and scientists are always worried that the way the story is told um, you know, is not always necessarily scientifically accurate. And storytellers um, are, are often concerned that a scientific story can be boring. I'm happy to tell you that actually, if there is a very good interface between scientists and storytellers, as there has been in the cradle of humankind, that story can be both scientifically accurate and interesting to tell. So from a people perspective, I think there is that need to have a greater interface between science and storytelling. Um, and there have been, as Roger was saying, amazing field guides that have been developed but there is also work as has been done by the Field Guide Association of South Africa that helps to translate the scientific story into a story that can be shared with an ordinary visitor. Then there is also interesting work that we can do. And as I've heard today, uh, you know, that starts with the enhancement of established spaces. So we're lucky that there are World Heritage Sites that already speak to the story of geology. Uh, there's the Barberton Maconjwa, Fredeford Dome, Robin Island, and Cradle of Humankind sites. These are all World Heritage sites that already have footprint and footfall into them. Um, and there is a way, of course, to enhance the storytelling that can include the story of geoheritage. Um, that also goes then for our national parks. Um, and, you know, Table Mountain being a case in point, as I heard many times today, and the Kruger National Park but many of our other sites that actually help us to tell that story. Into the future, I think that there is an opportunity to build our experience and route development into spaces that have cross-border potential. So, for example, the Kalkval Craton, which, uh, you know, uh, impacts the, the, the kind of um, barberton Maconjwa site, but also, you know, the, the, the Johannesburg Dome um, and is located centrally in Limpopo, also actually uh, extends into uh, Zimbabwe. Um, and so there are opportunities abound for us to actually take the um, geo heritage tourism as an area of niche tourism or special interest tourism to the next level. I think that, Nolene, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to then invite the a discussion on how we might be best able to work together uh, as the Department of Tourism. And, you know, uh, I am a representative, of course, of that department and the broader uh, geological um, uh, society and team uh, and people who are fans of geoheritage to actually take the story uh, to the next generation of, of both domestic and international tourists. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Shamila. I'm going to open the floor for any questions or comments or any discussion. Um, when I was doing my PhD, I had an opportunity to interview some of your colleagues, uh, Dr. Maneti and so forth. Yeah. So it was interesting to interact with your colleagues. But my question is just to understand in terms of what sort of support would you provide uh, to researchers who are in this field of geotourism, looking at in the terms of funding and access to some of these uh, sites and, and so forth. So in, in general, I'm asking you, uh, what support will you provide uh, in terms of researchers to conduct their research and identifying some of these uh, world-class heritage sites? Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Kadani. I see a, a comment on the on the chat from John. 
who says geological stories need to be simple but not simplistic. The science needs to be accurate and accessible to non-geologists. 100% agree with you, uh, John. Um, I think that it is critically important to get the science right. And I think that, um, you know, my, my previous work at the Cradle of Humankind was really working very closely with the scientists to make sure that what actually went into the museum uh, and the exhibition itself and the materials that were developed then for schools uh, going forward was in fact scientifically accurate, um, but accessible. And I think that that is a very good example of how tertiary institutions can work together uh, with, with state, uh, you know, with, with, with organs of state uh, to make science accessible uh, to ordinary lay people. Um, you know, in, in, in the partnership between the, the Gauteng province and the University of the Dwarters, right? The university focused on their academic research. Um, and what they did was to help uh, the, the, the province and the private sector partner to translate that academic research into accessible stories um, that are now told and shared with the world. Um, and, and I think that that's a model that we um, value in, in the, in the uh, public sector and a model certainly we want to replicate. Could I get to your question about what support do we provide? The department doesn't uh, necessarily provide a financial support uh, to researchers, although we do have a bursary scheme for ordinary South Africans to apply for. But we certainly um, always help students um, to actually, um, um, with their research. So anyone who approaches the department and wants to interview participants or wants access to our sites, we certainly do help them with that. We also do have a partnership uh, at the moment with uh, various universities across the country. It's a research partnership. Um, and there are five institutions that we're currently working with. Through that work, we actually fund research on specific topics um, that are selected. Um, and so if one of those institutions or the department decides to do a study on geoheritage, uh, through that partnership with, with universities, we, we would fund it. So I hope that actually answers uh, the question. Uh, it's Richard for you. And thanks very much for, for that, Shamila. An interesting overview. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at is the whole concept of geoparks. And, and we know that in countries such as China and Europe, geoparks have been incredible uh, um, destinations for tourism. And I, I think there are one or two geoparks in the whole of Africa. So maybe we need to start looking at the concept of geoparks and perhaps getting a few going. And uh, that might well be a, the impetus that is needed to get to geotourism going. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you've done any research or investigations uh, along those lines, but I think it could be quite fruitful uh, to look at. Um, thank you very much, John. I think that there was a team uh, who did contact me about, about geoparks. Um, I have put them in contact with our colleagues at Environmental Affairs. But as Gillian indicated very briefly in her presentation, when you want to list um, as a geopark or a World Heritage Site or even a National Heritage Site, the hoops that you have to jump through are quite onerous. Um, and the, uh, the UNESCO listing um, is useful to have, but I would say not always necessary. I think that we do already have World Heritage Sites that actually uh, we, can, we can work on, um, you know, a, a geopark model. Those World Heritage Sites would be, um, for example, the Maconjwa um, Barberton World Heritage Site, uh, as well as the Fair de Fort Dome. Um, and I think that there are possibilities of actually getting things up and running much quicker at those sites that already have World Heritage status, wouldn't necessarily need to get any geopark kind of status. I think it's worth pursuing the idea of geoparks, uh, but having been involved in uh, World Heritage listing and work with UNESCO, 
I can say that that process can be very long-winded. Uh, it can be very onerous, uh, and it does take a lot of time. So I think that while the, the idea of geoparks um, are being pursued, it is worth looking at how we might work to enhance the sites that we already have in place. I, I hope that that helps. Yes, it does. And, and I know we've had this discussion often about uh, geoparks versus world heritage sites versus doing nothing. And um, the regulations, as you mentioned, are, are quite onerous about getting a geopark set up. But as we heard earlier on, one of the speakers, and I'm not sure who it was, mentioned that that's not all that crucial. And in fact, you can do a lot and get going as a geopark without being a UNESCO recognized. So maybe we should uh, investigate these things and um, discuss it further, because clearly it is a, a, a draw card. Uh, I agree 100%, I agree. Richard. I agree 100%. I think and this is why I'm saying we have so many amazing sites already um, that already have UNESCO listing and have that recognition that it would be a good idea to work on those. And, and I'm not sure which site has been recommended as a geopark site, uh, but I think we already have World Heritage sites that we can leverage on a UNESCO listing to actually sell uh, the, the geo heritage of those particular sites. Yeah, I think that one of them would be the Fear of Fort Dome uh, geosite, clearly. And um, I think that um, there is a small group who are looking at this at the moment uh, in, in Fear of Fort, and they've got, gone quite a long way. They've had discussions with the UNESCO people. And, um, yeah, I think it's worth uh, pushing, and perhaps the tourism department could get involved to get, get a bit more uh, impetus uh, of getting these things going. Mm. I, I would say if it's the Fred of Fort site that you're looking at, I, I'm not necessarily sure you need to now list that as a geopark. It already has a World Heritage Site status. Um, the tourism department, I think just for everyone on the call, is in fact working on uh, finalizing the interpretation center, um, the Fred of Fort Dome interpretation center. Uh, I'm sure you would have all seen the building that was built some time ago, but what we're currently looking at is completing the exhibition within that space and operationalizing it. So certainly we would be happy to work with the team that's working on a geopark concept for that area um, and look at what the synergies are uh, with that work and, and, and how we can support the initiatives that are being taken uh, by, by the, the enthusiasts of geoparks. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. There's a lot of conversation that can carry on with this. And at least now people have made contact. They've seen who is, is where. So I'm sure we're going to take this offline for many interesting discussions. Hello, everyone. I'm Rory Sang Malevia. And the whole intention of this competition was to rather get everybody to be involved in the competition and rather expose the society to to everyone to participate in and for this competition i hope it will run with the other conferences that will come in the later future and for this year's um competition we've got 70 entries and from these seven 70 entries um, Tanya? Okay, what we have got, as Rory has said, there have been 70 entries for the, the competition. They are very varied, and we've put together a slideshow. If you'll just sit back for a couple of minutes and you can enjoy them with us. At the end of that, we will um, pronounce the winners to it.
just want to give people a bit of background to the the whole idea of the um, the competition. Rory Song Malabir is one of the uh, one of our mentees as part of the GSSA SACNAS candidate mentoring program, and Rory came to us with the idea of the the photographic competition as a way to promote his interests in geology as well as in geoheritage. And so it is because of Rory that we got the, the idea to, to do this, put it out, and we got 70 um, entries. Those entries were then uh, sent to the GSSA Manco, and each one on Manco chose their um, selection. Those were then sent to uh, Rory Sung and also Chris Hatton, the chair of the um, GSSA Geoheritage uh, Committee. And they then selected the, the, the three uh, places of slides. And as, as we, we've mentioned, the, 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 what people will win is Firstly, the photograph will be used as a cover photo for one of the issues of GeoBulletin coming up the rest of this year. They will also get a copy of the book Africa's Top Geological Sites. And the, the first three place winners will also be getting a cash prize uh, courtesy of the, the GSSA. Okay, so over to you then, Rory. Um, thank you, um, Tanya. And on the third place, we've got um, we've got Shailen's Chetty's picture of the waterfall in Rustenburg. And on the second place, we've got Celia's Marais um, Falkberg in Limpopo, and a special mention. of Johann Smith of uh, Sunset Silhouette. And lastly, on the final position, which is the first place, we've got Billy Mills, um, Swartberg Pass in Prince Albert, which took our first place. And thank you to everyone. Thank you, Rory. And so, folks, that brings us to the end of day one of our Geoheritage Conference. Thank you all very much for your, your time and patience today. And um, we look forward to seeing you all back again tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm.